Here we are, day two of AOL International 23.001 New Hire. Right. Welcome, everybody, and how are we doing this morning? Doing great. How are you? Awesome. Doing, doing good. good morning. Doing good. Good morning. Here we go. Good morning. Good morning. Nice, nice. <laughs> Let me ask, uh, Zuri Reed, do I sound better? Yes, you do. Okay. Yeah, in the middle of all that, uh, my client for Zoom required me to update. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. I apologize, everybody. Okay, so we're going to watch that video. And of course, I got to get my computer all set up in order to do that. Let me reclaim the host. And let me get the video going for each one of you. And let's mark it. So veteran market mod. Okay, so there. Fingers crossed. Let's hope this works for everyone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The veteran market module is intended to give you a clear picture of the clients that you'll be servicing and the organizations that they belong to. So here's what you need to take away. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear that okay. All right, thank you very much. From this module, number one, what defines a veteran and what are they covered for and entitled to through the VA? Number two, what a veteran service organization is. And number three, how do we market to veterans? A veteran by statute is defined as a person who served in the active Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, or Coast Guard, and was discharged as other than dishonorable. Now, there's currently over 20.4 million veterans across the country, making the veteran market almost one and a half times the size of the entire union market that the company began marketing to in the 50s. Our target senior demographic of veterans between the ages of 60 to 75 alone boasts more than 10 million or a little under half of the veteran population. What's more exciting than just the number of veterans that exist is the opportunity to protect each one of those veterans' families and close relations through the sponsorship program provided through AIL. Every veteran, not only in most cases, always knows another veteran, but also may have a brother or sister or a parent or a friend that they're able to extend their benefits to through AIL as well. You may be asking yourself with that many veterans, well, where are they all located at? Well, in Washington state, there's over 560,000 veterans. In Oregon, there's over 300,000. In California, has over 1.6 million. Arizona, over 500,000. In Texas, over 1.5 million. In Minnesota, over 320,000. In Wisconsin, over 360,000. Virginia, over 720,000. North Carolina, over 730,000. Tennessee, over 470,000. And that's not even all the territories. <laughs> An incredible opportunity that you have to work in this special market. Now, to put this in perspective for how big your opportunity is, let's take a state like Washington. It has over 560,000 veterans, with 397 of those being between the ages of 20 to 69 or 71%. It would take 25 agents averaging 12 presentations per week or 300 presentations in total. It would take those 25 agents almost 39 years to see every veteran and their family in Washington. Now, that's just one state with 25 agents, and you have access and the exclusive NAO to the whole country. Now, if that's not Opportunity Unlimited, I don't know what is. Now, let's talk about what they're covered for. Burial in a VA National Cemetery includes an assigned grave site, if space is available, opening and closing of the grave, grave liner for casket remains, headstone or marker, and finally, care at no cost to the family. Now, the easiest way to understand that is everything before the cemetery gates, the veteran and their family is responsible to take care of. If they're buried in a state or national cemetery, the VA will take care of everything past the cemetery gate. Now, the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs benefits does not cover 
all of the funeral or cremation arrangements of honorably discharged veterans. They get up to $300 for a burial allowance if at the time of death, they were entitled to receive a pension. They receive up to $762 for a burial allowance if the death occurs in a VA facility, up to $762 for a burial allowance if their burial in a cemetery is not under U.S. governmental jurisdiction, discharged from active duty because of a disability incurred in the line of duty, or they die in a VA facility, up to $2,000 for service-related deaths, and veterans' caskets are not free unless the death occurs while on active duty. Now, I know if you're like me, you feel the same way that I do. That's just not enough to take care of their funeral or final expenses for them, let alone their families. But that is where you come in. And your ability to complete this training effectively will be crucial to helping and educate and protect our nation's veterans. If you happen to encounter an active duty veteran member or spouse, it's important to know what life insurance they are covered for. It's called SGLI, or Service Members Group Life Insurance. Every active duty member is covered for $400,000 of term life insurance for the period of active duty and for an additional 120 days after separation or release from duty. Now, SGLI can be converted to VGLI, or Veterans Group Life Insurance, for up to the full 400,000 of renewable term life insurance if full-time SGLI was in place when they separated. If the veteran applies for VGLI within 240 days of separating, they don't have to qualify medically. Outside of that, they have a year and 120 days to apply and qualify medically. Otherwise, VGLI is not available to the veteran. Now, please review the module materials to see the details and the rates and coverages for VGLI and so that you can get the facts and utilize them throughout the presentation, which you'll see in later modules. Now that you know what defines a veteran and how many they are and what they're covered for, let's talk about the organizations that support them. The groups that we work with and also service veterans are called VSOs or Veteran Service Organizations. The three major VSOs are the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and finally, the AMVETS, totaling over 3.85 million members across the U.S. Now, once you know the structure of one of them, you know the structure for all of them. So we're going to focus on the VFW, which is the second largest of the big three VSOs, with 1.6 million members. Now, the VFW represents combat veterans that had boots on the ground overseas for more than 30 days. Along with the VFW, there's an auxiliary to that organization. Now, these auxiliary members are not actual veterans themselves. And in many cases, they are the wives or husbands, sons or daughters of a veteran. The auxiliary's purpose is to help support and transition veterans back into civilian life once they've separated from service. Spouses, dependents, and survivors are eligible for a presidential memorial certificate, a burial flag, and surviving spouses and children, they may be eligible for burial in a national cemetery, even if they pre-deceased the veteran. For the most up-to-date figures and numbers, be sure to visit www.cem.va.gov. To give you a better picture of VSOs and their impact, let's check out a video that shows what happened in the VFW organization in recent years. The VFW's 121st year was marked by challenges like none we have seen before, yet we did not falter. The call for help was unrelenting, and our members remained determined to serve during a time of great need. On July 24, 2020, Hal Roche II was installed as National Commander-in-Chief during a change of command ceremony at VFW National Headquarters. A U.S. Air Force veteran who served in operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, Commander Roche understood the value of resolve, resilience, and adapting to the situation at hand. All things he commended BFW members for as they stepped up to help during the COVID-19 crisis. In casting his 2020 vision for veterans, 
Commander Roche called on each of us to stay committed to the VFW's mission and continue growing membership in the nation's largest combat veterans organization. As the pandemic created or heightened hardships, the VFW found new ways to accomplish that mission. Limited in-person interaction moved more opportunities online through events such as the Facebook Live discussion with U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs officials on resources for veterans facing homelessness and a live virtual chat with Medal of Honor recipient Thomas Payne. We even launched Still Serving, the VFW podcast, as one more way to connect with our community and highlight critical issues and legislation affecting veterans, service members, and military families worldwide. And we've stayed on top of threats to veterans' benefits, such as the rise of VA claim sharks. These unaccredited companies make unrealistic promises regarding help with VA claims, and they keep a portion of a veteran's disability compensation as payment for assistance that accredited VFW service officers provide at absolutely no charge to the veteran. VFW posts and members also adapted to life in the pandemic by holding virtual events, along with safely serving fellow veterans and their communities. At every level of the organization, service and camaraderie have illustrated that the VFW is a lifeline for veterans, their families, and communities. Primarily through virtual meetings, the VFW persevered on the front lines of vital legislative battles on Capitol Hill. Nothing stopped us from fighting for education, jobs, health care, and better quality of life for veterans as we made the voices of our members heard. The VFW proposed the Digital GI Bill upgrade to bring VA education services into the 21st century. This would improve veterans' access to timely and accurate processing as they complete an education. We also pushed for more assistance for service-disabled veterans and those facing housing issues, reflecting our desire to see all veterans secure employment and economic opportunities. The VFW advocated for more progress in healthcare for women veterans, including continued needs to eliminate harassment and assault and address a lack of facilities and providers for gender-specific services. The VFW expressed support for H.R. 344, the Women Veterans Transitional Residents Utilizing Support and Treatment Trust Act, which would identify the need for women-specific drug and alcohol dependency treatment and rehabilitation programs through VA. VFW service officers remain steadfast in their efforts to secure the benefits and compensation America's veterans earned and deserve. Our accredited VFW service officers and VFW National Veterans Service set another fiscal year record, recovering more than $9.7 billion in VA disability compensation benefits for nearly 550,000 veterans. One of the most urgent concerns for the VFW was toxic exposures. Men and women who've worn our nation's uniform and served in dangerous environments need the care and benefits America promised. They've sacrificed, but too many have been left to suffer as they waited years or decades for benefits, or worse yet, were denied care. Commander Roche demanded Congress take action during the first ever all virtual testimony before the House and Senate Committees on Veterans Affairs. He provided a plan that would establish an independent commission to identify toxic exposures and environmental hazards, evaluate scientific evidence on health conditions and toxic exposures, and obligate the VA to accept toxic exposure claims for the sake of veteran care, regardless of the cost. Toxic exposure for our troops has been synonymous with service for more than a hundred years. But every time we're faced with it, we act as, it's never, as if it's never happened before. A comprehensive system for taking care of our troops exposed to hazards is long past due. The VFW demands that Congress works in a bipartisan manner with the veteran service organizations to develop a comprehensive solution for toxic exposure. We must create a framework that will take care of all past, present, and future generations of veterans. Again, that is long overdue. Right now, the burden of proof falls too heavily on veterans. 
a new framework to determine presumptive service connection is necessary. The VFW continues to urge Congress to pass reforms. We emphatically support the Comprehensive and Overdue Support for Troops Cost of War Act and the Honoring Our Pact Act currently under consideration. The lives of veterans are at stake. These advocacy efforts reflected the VFW's 2021 priority goals and the legislative battles that must be won for veterans and their families. The VFW provided several artifacts and personal effects to the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency as part of its promise to help advance POW MIA missions. B.J. Lawrence, Executive Director, VFW Washington Office, met with DPAA Director Kelly McKay to hand over items from VFW members. Shortly after, Secretary of Defense Mark Esper delivered several of these items to the Vietnamese government as a show of goodwill from the U.S. The VFW Foundation proudly celebrated its 25th anniversary. To mark the occasion, the city of Kansas City, Missouri presented Resolution 25, the Veterans of Foreign Wars Foundation Day Resolution. VFW Foundation Board Secretary Treasurer and VFW Quartermaster General Deborah Anderson and other representatives attended the virtual meeting to accept the resolution. With the generous support of our wonderful and loyal corporate partners, the VFW made a positive difference for Americans of every generation. Patriotic middle and high school students received more than $208,000 in scholarships and awards as the VFW named the national winners of its 2021 Voice of Democracy and Patriots Pen competitions. The VFW hosted its first ever virtual parade of winners live on Facebook. The event, sponsored by Twisted X, recognized all state winners of the Voice of Democracy competition, as well as the national Voice of Democracy and Patriots Pen winners. VFW National Commander Hal Roche, VFW Auxiliary President Sandy Onstwetter and Twisted X President Prasad Reddy traveled to Rochester, Minnesota to present 2021 National Voice of Democracy winner Erin Grace Stokig with the first place $30,000 T.C. Selman Memorial Scholarship Award. Sponsored by VFW Post 1215 in Rochester and its auxiliary, her winning essay on this year's theme, Is This the Country the Founders Envisioned? inspired us to share in a vision of progress that is passed on to future generations. Today, almost 80% of the U.S. population is eligible to vote, and our union is far more perfect for it. But what about that last 20%? Who is left? The children. Your children. Because you, just as the founding fathers and ships full of immigrants before you, are tasked with protecting the future. In addition to a college scholarship, the VFW surprised all of the Voice of Democracy state winners when it announced they would also receive a new laptop, courtesy of Dell. Also featured during the virtual award ceremony was the 2021 Patriots Pen first place winner, Wyatt Perkins. Sponsored by VFW Post 4221 in Lake Portland, North Dakota, Perkins was awarded $5,000. He delivered his winning essay on the theme, What is Patriotism to Me?, and discussed how he raised donations for a local food pantry to help during the pandemic. 158 student veterans from around the country were named recipients of the VFW's Sport Clips Help a Hero Scholarship for the fall 2020 semester. Another 160 student veterans were awarded scholarships for the spring 2021 semester. Together, these groups received nearly $1.4 million in assistance. In addition, the VFW and Sport Clips Haircuts teamed up for the first ever virtual VFW Sport Clips Help a Hero Walk, offering supporters a new way to engage with the Help a Hero campaign. It was a huge success and raised just over the $1 million goal. To date, $8 million in scholarships have been awarded through this program. The VFW is grateful for Sport Clips' ongoing support for veterans' higher education needs. The pandemic couldn't stop 300 Burger King franchisees from raising critical funds for the VFW's Unmet Needs program. In the 14th year for the campaign, 
Participating restaurants asked customers to donate to the program with their purchase and help prevent circumstances such as hunger and homelessness. Since 2007, Burger King franchisees have raised more than $6 million for this vital program. To date, Unmet Needs has awarded more than $12 million to nearly 11,000 service members, veterans, and their families since 2004. Ace Hardware collaborated with the VFW again to give away 1 million American flags to honor men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Customers who visited a participating Ace store received a free American flag. A second flag was then donated to a local VFW post to be used for decorating veterans' graves on Memorial Day. The VFW joined forces with Team Red, White, and Blue. This opened the door for organizing more virtual and local opportunities aimed at connecting veterans through physical wellness and social activities. Mm -hmm. Some things changed due to COVID-19, but the VFW's enduring spirit of service did not. It was on display as members helped fellow veterans and their communities. The Still Serving campaign, which began right before the pandemic, took on deeper significance as it became a vehicle to share the ways veterans rose to the challenges at hand. VFW posts and members conducted buddy checks, food and blood drives, PPE distributions, and much more in the face of this invisible enemy. After a year filled with difficulties, the VFW and its membership emerged stronger than ever. Just as we have for more than a century, we stayed true to our mission, relentlessly fought for veterans to get the benefits they earned and deserved, and brought hope to people across the country. We demonstrated that we never give up and that veterans represent the best of America. We are still serving. We are resilient. And we are proud to say we are the veterans of foreign wars and no one does more for veterans. Wow, what an amazing organization to partner with on the state level to educate and protect our nation's veterans. Now that you have the understanding of what a veteran is covered for and entitled to, as well as what a veteran service organization's role is, now let's explore the marketing and mailing process. Let's start with AIL's process. The marketing process to a veteran service organization is the same as how unions and other associations are marketed to. An AIL public relations representative will reach out to a VSO's leadership, such as a quartermaster, a state adjutant, or a commander. Once a virtual or in-person meeting is scheduled, an initial explanation of what AIL can offer the group's leadership is presented. Once the decision maker is on board, they are presented it to their board and get final approval. Once approved, a contract between the group or what's called a TG is signed, and a coverage amount is put in place on all members. A letter and a beneficiary reply card is created, and the decision maker's signature is put on the final artwork and letter. Once everything is finalized, the entire membership is mailed. The response cards are received by home office, and they are data entered. They are then routed to AO and loaded into our system for you to call on. Now, that marketing process I just described built the company since 1951 and has continued to provide resources to associates to this day. But innovation is what drives AO. And AO partnered with a company called Lead Lab to bolster and support growth. This marketing process takes the best practices of what the company has been doing since 1951 and then applies it to current technology and goes straight to the veterans through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, allowing veterans that don't belong to veteran service organizations to get access to the same benefits. Once a veteran responds uh, to one of the social media platforms for a no-cost burial and will kit for veterans and their families, they are sent two emails. One, a confirmation email, and the other, an email informing them of an agent of American Income Life will be reaching out to them. The amazing part of this marketing process is that all veterans are covered for the same benefits. So whether you see them through a VSO like the VFW or you see them through an online response through the lead lab, our products and services will always make sense 
for every veteran family you see. You know, this market is special and unique, and you should want to hold yourself to the highest level of professionalism to give the veterans and the families you service the best possible experience. Your knowledge of veteran issues as well as coverages is so important to connecting with veterans virtually. Now, be sure to watch this video as many times as you need to solidify what you've learned and get the most out of your training. Okay, so that's the uh, veteran market for everybody. And I saw through the chat, you guys sharing the video. That's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with it. And I know you can't see me right now. I apologize for that. Uh, the issue is that I need, uh, there's a requirement that I show this video during the training five times. There's, so there's no way around it. If you have the link, you want to look at it on your own time, that's perfectly fine. We will also record this and it's up every single day on YouTube and you can watch it there as well. But I think the philosophy is that we know there's a bunch of information in there and it takes at least five times for people to gather out of it kind of what they will. So that is why it is there. All right, so now I'm going to do the credit union overview video as well. And I will actually put that link in the chat because I actually have that one. So if you're having problems or whatever, you can look at it in the chat and see it there, okay? So here is the video for credit union. There we go. So let's do this. Let's put this up here. And, uh, come back there and share my screen. The credit union market module is intended to give you a clear picture of the clients that you're going to be servicing. So here's what you need to take away uh, from this video. Number one, what is a credit union and how are they different from a bank? Number two, you know, what is the marketing approach with credit unions and how will resources work within the market? And number three, how is your virtual presentation tailored to the credit union market? Now, before we get into the marketing approach and the specifics of the virtual credit union presentation, let's check out a video that's going to walk you through what a credit union is, inform you about the credit union movement, educate you on the history of credit unions, and finally, review the philosophy of credit unions. Go ahead and take a look. Hello, and thank you for joining us today for a look into the credit union movement and philosophy. Today, we will look into four key areas of credit unions. What is a credit union, the credit union movement, credit union history, and the credit union philosophy. First, let's talk about the age old question. What is a credit union? A credit union is a cooperative financial institution owned and controlled by the people who use its services. These people are their members. Credit unions serve groups that share something in common, such as where they work, live, or worship. Credit unions are not for profit and exist to provide a safe, convenient place for their members to save money and to get loans at reasonable rates. Credit unions, like other financial institutions, are closely regulated. The National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund, administered by an agency of the federal government called the National Credit Union Administration, or NCUA, ensures deposits of credit union members at federal and state chartered credit unions nationwide. Deposits are insured up to $250,000. What makes a credit union different from a bank? These financial institutions accept deposits and make loans, but unlike credit unions, banks are in business to make a profit. Banks are owned by groups of stockholders whose interests include earning a healthy return on their investments. Credit union membership varies based on what the credit union stated field of membership is. Many employers sponsor their own credit unions and employees of these companies, as well as their family members can join. Others can be based on your location. If you live, work, go to school, or worship in a certain geographic location, you may meet the requirements of that credit union. Others are group-based. For example, it would be a credit union based on a specific place of worship. Anyone affiliated with that group, regardless of where they work or live, could join. 
Now we turn our attention to the credit union movement. The first credit union sprang up in Germany in the 1850s and 1860s and were designed to meet the savings and loans needs of small agricultural communities. As the 20th century began, Alphonse Desjardins created the first credit union in Canada to meet the financial needs of poorer and more vulnerable sectors of his community that were often taken advantage of by unethical lenders. Canada's successful efforts profoundly influenced two Americans, Pierre Jay, the Massachusetts Banking Commissioner, and Edward Feline, a Boston merchant. The two men helped organize public hearings on credit union legislation in Massachusetts, leading to passage of the first state credit union act in 1909. Growth in the industry was slow. Fewer than 10 states passed credit union laws. Alphonse Desjardins was instrumental in forming the Canadian and US credit union movements. Besides helping to found the first credit unions in Canada and the US, he pioneered youth savings clubs and school banks to introduce the concept to the youth of the day. Roy Bergengren was an American attorney and pioneer of the United States credit union movement. Hired by Edward Feline in July 1921 to head the Credit Union National Extension Bureau, Bergengren carried out an ambitious legislative agenda that resulted in the enactment of the Federal Credit Union Act, the creation of the Credit Union National Association, or CUNA, and the foundation of thousands of credit unions across the United States. The key principles of the credit union movement were volunteerism, self-help, one member, one vote, and the consideration of a person's character as well as net worth. As you can tell, the credit union idea is a simple one. People should be able to pull their money and make loans to each other. It's an idea that evolved from cooperative activities in 19th century Europe. Since that time, guiding principles have remained the same. In 1934, President Roosevelt signed into law the Federal Credit Union Act, which promoted savings and made credit available to a nationwide network of nonprofit credit unions. The New Deal initiative was based on the Massachusetts Credit Union Act of 1909. The legislation allowed credit unions to be chartered either under federal or state law, a policy that remains in place today. The first official Credit Union Day was celebrated on the third Thursday in October, 1948. That celebration is now known as International Credit Union Day. In 1970, the Credit Union National Administration became an independent federal agency. Congress also created the National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund to protect deposits at credit unions. The 1970s also brought major changes in the products offered by financial institutions, and credit unions too found they needed to expand their services. In 1977, federal legislation allowed U.S. credit unions to offer new services to their members, including share certificates and mortgages. Credit unions grew tremendously during the 1970s. The number of credit union members more than doubled during the decade, and credit union assets tripled to more than $65 billion throughout the 1990s and into the start of the 21st century. In 1934, when credit unions were helping Americans through the Great Depression, the treasurer of a Midwestern credit union said that credit unions were not for profit, not for charity, but for service. That philosophy holds true today. Earlier, we discussed several different examples between a credit union and a bank. They are all equally important and are worth repeating, such as credit unions are not-for-profit financial cooperatives. They are financial institutions that must generate enough profit to provide dividends to members, to continually improve services and build institutional reserves for the safety and soundness of the future of the credit union. But their mission is social, and credit unions exist to serve their members, not make a profit. Earnings are returned to members in the form of lower rates, higher interest on deposits, and lower fees on services. Federal credit unions are tax exempt, which was established in 1937, affirmed by the statute in 1951, and reaffirmed in 1998 in H.R. 1151, 
the Credit Union Membership Access Act. This act states credit unions, unlike many other participants in the financial services market, are exempt from federal and most state taxes because credit unions are member-owned, democratically operated, not-for-profit organizations. They are also generally managed by volunteer boards of directors, and because they have the specific mission of meeting the credit and saving needs of members, especially persons of modest means. Mm -hmm. Credit unions, like all other cooperatives, operate under the seven cooperative principles. These include voluntary membership. Credit unions are voluntary, cooperative organizations offering services to people willing to accept the responsibilities and benefits of membership without gender, social, racial, political, or religious discrimination. Many cooperatives, such as credit unions, operate as not-for-profit institutions with volunteer boards of directors. In the case of credit unions, members are drawn from defined fields of membership. Democratic member control. Cooperatives are democratic organizations owned and controlled by their members. One member, one vote, with equal opportunity for participation in setting policies and making decisions. Members' economic participation. Members are owners. They contribute to and democratically control the capital of the cooperative. This benefits members in proportion to the transactions with the cooperative rather than on the capital invested. For credit unions, which typically offer better rates, fees, and services than for-profit financial institutions, members recognize benefits in proportion to the extent of their financial transactions and general usage. Autonomy and independence. Cooperatives are autonomous, self-help organizations controlled by their members. If the cooperative enters into agreements with other organizations, or raises capital from external sources, it is done so based on terms that ensure democratic control by the member and maintains the cooperative autonomy. Education, training, and information. Cooperatives provide education and training for members, elected representatives, managers, and employees so they can contribute effectively to the development of the cooperative. Credit unions place particular importance on educational opportunities for their volunteer directors and financial education for their members and the public, especially the nation's youth. Credit unions also recognize the importance of ensuring the general public and policymakers are informed about the nature, structure, and benefits of cooperatives. Cooperation among cooperatives. Cooperatives serve their members most effectively and strengthen the cooperative movement by working together through local, state, regional, national, and international structures. Concern for community. While focusing on member needs, cooperatives work for the sustainable development of communities, including people of modest means, through policies developed and accepted by the members. Credit unions continue to look out for their members' interests with empathy and understanding and provide a level of service that is not generally available at other financial institutions. Whether it's providing a loan to help a member cover unexpected medical bills, giving financial counseling to a member, or simply offering a better deal on a used car loan, credit unions make a difference for their members and the communities they serve. Now that you've been educated on what a credit union is, how they work, and the market's history, you know, let me ask you, are you a credit union member? Uh, if you are, great. If you aren't, be sure to research a local credit union in your community and see how you can become a member. You know, just like you being a union member gives you credibility, working in the market as a member of a credit union will do the same. Now, let's look at how credit unions are marketed to. First being the traditional AIL process of direct contact and a meeting with a credit union's leadership, an initiation of a contract and a mailing, which creates response cards for the credit union's membership. This response card is identical to the ones that you may have encountered in other markets, such as unions or associations or even veteran response cards. 
This includes a notification of benefits letter and a read-off letter from the group and a handwritten response card. Within that same working through the group credit union marketing approach, you will also encounter outside exclusive vendor response cards that will generate the same credit union member response, but will do it through a digital campaign that includes all of the features of a traditional mailing with the amazing advancements that come with a digital response campaign. You will also encounter online response cards that come direct from the membership of credit unions. Recognizing that there are over 100 million credit union members across North America, exclusive vendors directly advertise to credit union members seeking information on how to maximize their benefits through credit unions that they belong to. This marketing process is done utilizing social media platforms such as Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, even TikTok. Finally, there are all of the plus leads that you generate from within the market. The credit union presentation is specifically designed to generate a minimum of eight plus leads per presentation. This will allow you to take your initial company credit union market lead pack and allow you to expand your insurance business week after week, month after month, and year after year. Once you have completed your credit union market training and have met all of the requirements to work the market, the resources department will issue you your first credit union market lead pack. You will automatically be put on instant lead distribution, which means depending on how many reciprocal licenses that you may have, you will receive up to one instant credit union market lead per day. Now, you can also qualify for more daily instant credit union leads through your month to date production which can increase your instant leads all the way up to five per day based on hitting certain production tiers. In addition to all of that, you will qualify for bi-weekly top-ups that are based on your plus lead collection. For every two plus leads you generate, the company will top you up with another credit union market lead. Now, the number of company leads that you can have in your account at one time will have a limit. However, keep in mind there is no limit to how many plus leads you can generate and have in your account. This system allows you to not only generate AOP, but allows you to access all that Opportunity Unlimited has to offer working solely in the credit union market. Now that you understand how the market work, let's talk about the virtual credit union presentation. The introduction of the presentation is identical to the majority of markets beginning with displaying the copy of the letter or email that the member received to establish credibility and to outline what the member can expect. There is the normal letter that you would encounter from an AIL credit union, which will have the notification letter, the read off. Okay, I'm gonna skip that because we're actually gonna go through that. And we'll also- Pardon me, we're gonna go through that today. So let me get rid of that. All right, good stuff. So we're back. We now had uh, education again from Andrew Haskins, both on the veteran and the credit union market. Some house cleaning uh, things I need to do or housekeeping I need to do. Uh, this today is, I will be here for six hours, potentially longer. The class is slated to go from 9 a.m. Pacific time to 1 p.m. Pacific time. It has been my experience though that when I go through HP Pro, a lot of people want to get more comfortable with it. They have to do the scenarios today. I stick around because you have to do it as homework tonight. And more often than not, you have questions, okay? So I'm here. If you want to stick around, I will be here with you. If your upline wants you to go and work with them, then you need to do what the upline wants you to do, okay? So I've told all the uplines that I'm here, that I will be here for you and I will go through everything with you until the last one of you is completely done. Uh, however, if the upline wants you, then they can definitely take you because maybe they want you to watch a presentation or they want you to practice the scripts, whatever the case may be. All right, that's exactly what I want you to do. How do you contact your spline? I don't know how to contact your spline. Who is that? <laughs> your upline, who your upline is going to be your trainer, whoever you told me your trainer is that you uh, talk to once you leave the uh, classroom portion of the training. That's what I call your upline. 
Okay, it's your first person. Usually it's gonna be an SA. It could potentially be somebody hired depending upon who you report to. All right, are there any questions about what my expectation is in terms of what we're doing today? I'm not sure who my upline is. Okay, you feel lost. All right, hold on a second. Let's see who is talking to me. Heather Michaels. Heather, who told you to uh, join the class today? Heather, can you hear me? Yeah, it was uh, Jonathan King told me. All right, so John King is your upline, okay? Okay. That's who I, what is your trainer. So what that tells me is that you haven't filled out the DRB report yet. Is that correct, Heather? Correct. Okay, so now you can fill that out. And if you don't know who your uh, RGA is, just put unknown, which now brings us to... How many people have actually filled out the DRB report? So we have over 100 people in this class today. I'm assuming I should have over 100 submittals. Let's see how many submittals I actually do have. For January 10th, I have 83 submittals. So that means we're missing a number of submittals. I, I don't understand the difficulty. Can you guys click on the link and fill that in for me? Yes, Zuri. Zuri Reed. I apologize. My hand was up with who, how many people filled it out. Okay. So I need everybody to fill it out. Again, I only have 83 and I need well over 100. Okay. And your name pops up. So when I finally get to looking at it, I'll know who has not filled it out. Rosalia, what can I do for you? Hi. Um, I apologize. I got here late because I came from school. Um, I'm not sure if you... I'm not sure if I filled that out yet. Did you send it in today? Uh, I sent it in the chat. So my guess is that you... Uh, I must have not seen it. I got here late. Yeah, because you don't get any of the chats beforehand. So sure, I will give you the link okay. again in Thank the you. chat. So that way we can get as many in as possible. And it's really important for us to track kind of the uh, activity of the class. Because if we don't have enough activity, that would tell me that we're not going to have enough uh, time to get the number, uh, what is it, 300 dials and 10 observed sales. Okay. Thank you, Andrew, for sending that out to everybody. Okay. If I don't have any more questions, we're going to get into HB Pro. So there's three things I need you to have up on your computer and ready to go. The first one is going to be the veteran presentation script. The second thing is going to be the credit union script. The third thing is going to be the uh, new agent packet, a handout that was attached to your uh, day one email. And then all of you should be at HP Pro in your browser. So I'm sure I'm gonna start getting a lot of questions. However, I just want you to bear with me as I go through this process. So the first thing we need to do, and I'll start sharing my screen here so everybody can see what I'm doing. The first thing that we need to do is go to HP Pro. So there's my screen. There's HP Pro. I want you to type in that email address, hppro.planetaltig.com. When you type that in, you should get to this screen. This is going to be the login screen for HP Pro and all the things associated with it. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to show you the bits and pieces of HP Pro. Then I'm going to walk through each one of the scripts. And instead of doing a role play and taking the full hour it takes to get through the script, I'm going to show the differences between the veteran script and the credit union script. So that those of you will know what to do. After we take our break, what we will then do for everybody is we will learn how to build options for our clients that we're going to present to them okay so uh now any questions because once i get started i just want us to go through the process rosalia your hand is still up do you have another question now your hand is down bridget corgel what can i do for you 
Yeah, are all the scripts, sorry, I had to take my state test yesterday, so I had missed the parts about the scripts. Are they all on this HP Pro? No, they're in emails that I sent out, and my guess is that you didn't get any of that, correct? Correct, because I left for the last probably. Yeah, years. no worries. Here's what I want you to do to help me out. I want you to direct message Ruth Malloy with your email. And Ruth, can you send her the day one email as well as the email with the credit union script I sent? Thank you so much. I appreciate yes. that. Okay. If anybody you. else is missing that information, DM Ruth Malloy and she will send it to you. Okay. Do I have any other questions before I get going? Okay. Here we go. So on this screen here, what you're going to do is you're going to log in. You're going to log in with your first and last name because that's how it's set up. And then you're going to use your password. All of you as homework last night should have got your passwords, should have verified you were able to log in here. In this case, let me see if I'm still working for American Income. And I am. Outstanding. So on the left-hand side, you have Planet Home. You have Profile, Achievements, My Dashboard, Game Plans, and Launch HB Pro. I'm going to work backwards and I'm not going to go through the rest of this stuff. I'm going to launch HP Pro and walk into that one first. Okay, when I clock, click on launch HP Pro, this screen comes up right here. And what this screen is, is the beginning of the process when you're going to actually do a presentation for a client. All right. Yeah. I'm sorry, Javis, do you have a question? Yes, yes sir. I don't got my my password did you get with your upline last night like i instructed everybody to ensure you had access to hp pro i, I spoke to him last night for the presentation and everything right we, like he showed me but he was mm -hmm. on with another person on the phone so i didn't get my username no password for HP okay so you need to go ahead and call him and get that information okay so ask for my username and password right yes Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so as we go through the process here, actually, let me do this for you. Let me turn on my little uh, yellow cursor so that way I can see what the heck I'm supposed to be showing you. All right, here we go. So right here, this is going to be your name and your picture. It's going to have your license and then your union representation. Down at the bottom, you have the dashboard. You have the pre-plan, you have rate book, and you have sponsorship program, materials, underwriting manuals, and medical questions. So I'm going to walk through each one of those. I'm going to show you all the pieces, and then I'm going to show you how they all come together, okay? So the first one, the dashboard, if I click on the dashboard, what this shows me is, you don't see any data up here, but this would be the number of presentations that you've done what the disposition of those presentations were, and the presentation type. That is going to be a pie chart. So basically, I have the percentage for each one. So if I did 10 presentations, four were sales, and six were I can't afford it, it would have a pie chart right here with 40% sales and 60% can't afford it. Presentation type, if I sold credit union, veteran, veteran referrals, veteran response card, present. Uh, union, POS, it would all break it out over here on the left-hand side, okay? So we don't see anything yet because I haven't done any presentations to an actual client. Down at the bottom, total presentations. That means of everything for the month that I'm in, how many presentations have I actually conducted? The total ALP, ALP stands for Annualized Life Premium. That's the amount of revenue that I've generated for selling life insurance. Total number of sales is the total number of dispositions that I classified as I actually sold something to a client. The close ratio is going to be the total number of sales divided by the total number of presentations. The ALP per sale is the total amount of ALP divided by the total number of sales. And the AHP, which is accident and health premium, is the same thing, but it's AHP. So here, when we sell a policy, we may sell a life insurance policy, let's say it's whole life. In addition to that, I may sell what's called an A71, which is a accident health policy. That is separate, nowhere near as expensive, but that is a separate policy that's sold. We get paid differently for an uh, accidental health policy. 
than we do for a life insurance policy. And again, when we get to it, I'm going to break down all these policies for you so you understand what the heck it is that we're selling. Down here, plus leads collected. If any of you had a chance to look at the script, you'll see that we talk about plus leads. As I go through the script and show you HP Pro, you'll see where we generate plus leads through the process of talking about additional people that the client wants to sponsor or people that can be contacted either in the family information guide and in the credit union for the financial information guide. <clears throat> the plus leads collected are the total collected for the month. The plus leads per presentation is going to be the total collected for the month divided by the total number of presentations that you did for the month. We also track how much time it takes you on your presentation. And I will show you how that breaks down. We don't do that to micromanagement. We do that in order to coach you because if we see you're spending too much time in one area, we want to see if we can't fix that for you. Because the worst thing in the world to do is have a huge amount of time for the entire presentation. What that then means is you can only see so many people in a day, right? The more people you can see in a day, the more money you can make. So that's time for presentation. I'm going to go down, down at the bottom in just a minute. But over here on the right-hand side, this shows you the number of days that you will work in a month. You are the one that sets that. Not me, not your upline, no one else. So on these days here, you can see that I've got 31 days scheduled for the field. If I decide that, uh, what day is it today? Today is the 10th. If I'm not going to work tomorrow, I can uh, change that field day to a different day if I wanted to. Yeah, I don't do that here, but this will show you all the days I'm in the field. It will show you all the days I'm on vacation, and will show you all the days that you're not working. Because we use HP Pro to calculate how many calls I need to make, how many presentations I need to make, and how many sales I need to make and, I, and the ALP I need per sale in order to achieve the ALP goal I have for the month, okay? So the month of January, I got 31 days, expect to do 60 presentations, and my goal was $20,000 of ALP. Down here at the bottom right-hand corner, this will list every single presentation that you do and that you provide a disposition for. So you can see I did one the other day, credit union incomplete. That was a training because it didn't matter. But anything you do as a presentational client will be listed here. So you can go back and look at all of these. All right. Down here, you have home. That'll take us back to the previous screen. You have the dashboard, which is what we're looking at right now. You have the game plans, which I'm going to show you in just a second. You got presentation history, which is really this. You've got your profile. You do not have access to training yet, nor do you have access to achievements. When we get there, HP Pro is constantly being updated. When we get there, we will provide a place that you can get training within HP Pro on HP Pro. Right now, the training you get on HP Pro is through me or it's through Planet Altic, where there's a place you can get additional training on HP Pro. Achievements are going to be things like $10,000 in a day, a certain number of plus leads collected, $25,000 a month, $50,000 a month. Anytime you hit a certain achievement, at some point, the functionality will be here so you can see what you've done. And if those achievements are reached, then everybody in your upline will know about it as well. Yes, Kaylee Hobbs, what can I do for you? So I was wondering on the calendar, how you marked um, the little check mark to say that you have a vacation, day off, whatever. Do you just click the check mark or do you categorize no, it somehow? It's a different location. I'm gonna show you that in just a second. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. So those two aren't available. Working our way backwards. That's your profile. If I click on profile, this screen will come up. The ones that are in gray are coming over from your home office. They're the ones that are entering that information. So that's my name, my user ID, rather, my agent number, and my office. The rest of it, I'm entering. So I have my first name, my last name, my license number in California. You can click on, you have to enter all this, by the way. You can click on plus, and if you want to, you can enter in all the licenses that you have for the states that you're licensed in. That's not your resident state. So if I'm in California, I'm good. It says primary. If I move to Texas, then here I'm going to put the license number for Texas. I'm going to select Texas in the dropdown list, and then I'm going to say make that the primary. Yes, Tom, what can I do for you? Yes, yeah, Sam, on this sheet that I, I'm seeing, um, it, it lists our uh, email address. 
Should we want to change that email address? It says that you'll automatically be booted out of this thing until you can verify your new email address. Who do you verify it with? Well, where are you trying to change it within HP Pro? Well, this is, yeah, no, just within your basic, within your basic profile. I guess Altic. I guess, I guess. Would so, be Tom, are, are you on HP Pro with us right now, or are yes. you somewhere? Yes, I am, but it's the same screen. That's why I'm asking the question while I've got it in my head. So. Yeah, if you want to change your email address, you wouldn't change it here. You would change it right. to Paltig. Yes. And then Paltig will flow it into this. Okay. All right. And then, yes, it will I, ask you to verify it. I know how to answer his question because he was asking it last night with Eric as well, our trainer. So, Tom, what you need to do is you go into the planet, you update your email, and when it gives you that little pop-up window that says, like, oh, you have to verify this, just enter it, hit OK, and then it'll send you an email from Planet that you just go into the, that email and click verify. And now your Thank email's you. updated. Appreciate it. No problem. So you can put your phone number, your state, uh, your country, your union that you're with. Most of you, most of you are going to be the OPIU. And then when you save it, you're going to click this little floppy disk. A lot of what we do in HP Pro, we save a lot of information. You're going to click a lot of floppy disks. Yes, Rosalia. Um, do I contact my upline for my license number? I don't no, have the license to... number comes from the state. So once the state issues you your license number, that's the number you're going to put in there. Okay, because I purchased it. I haven't got anything back from it yet. I don't know what you mean you purchased it. You took your test and you passed it for the state that you're a resident in? Mm -hmm, yeah. Has the state given you your uh, license then? I haven't got an email about it. I'm sorry. I haven't got an email. Okay. So if you haven't got an email, your license has not been issued yet. When your license is issued, you get an email from the state. The number that they give you and the physical uh, certificate that is your license will have your number on there. That's the one you're going to enter in here. We okay. don't give you your license number. That comes from the state. Yes, Sylvia, how can I help you? So um, when it, where it says union and it gives you that code, is that the same for us as well? Yeah, because of what you guys do, you should all be part of the Office of Professional Employee Local 277. If you're in a different local, which could be the case, your upline will tell you which one you select. Okay. okay? Thank you. All right, so that's on this screen here. Then you hit the floppy disk and save it. Down here, you've got the dashboard. You've got the game plans, which we're about to go through. you got the presentation history, and then you've got our profile again. Uh, Sandra Taylor, what can I do for you? Hi, um, I'm assuming when you enter your license information, it takes a while to load. I just entered it and I clicked save and everything and it's still not populating. You're talking about where you put it right here? Correct. And then you clicked on the save button and it's not populating? Correct. Yeah, I clicked the plus sign next to the field. I entered the information. I clicked save uh, and then it didn't even populate before I clicked the, the floppy disk. But when I click the plus again, it's it's listed there. So I'm okay, so it may, it may take a while to update then. Do you have okay. an agent number right here in this field? I do, yes. Okay. Bridget Corgo, how can I help you? Um, Is your license number, is that the one that the state gives you? Yes, well, we don't give you the license number. The state issues you your license number. You will get an email and typically you can go and print out a certificate. It'll say like the state of California, state of Texas, and it'll tell you what you're licensed for. Okay. So I can't enter in this information until I have that state license number. Well, you can't enter in this field right here until you have a, I mean, you could enter something, but it's not the actual license because whenever you enter here, once it updates, it'll show up right there. You see that? Okay. And that the client will see this right here every time you do a presentation. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's go to game plans because this is an important part of what you will do. This is for you. This is designed for you. This is designed to help you in the process of understanding how you're trying to achieve everything. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself and I'm leaving the presentation and showing you game plans simply because we have that calendar that talked about the number of days and all that good stuff, right? So here, the month of January, I'm going to click on this little pen or pencil, and then the finances come up. Now, it, we list all kinds of stuff here. This is what you spend your money on, okay? 
for me, I don't necessarily need to tell everybody that I spend a thousand dollars on my internet access, right? I don't know. Maybe I can. It's up to you guys how you want to do it. Again, this is for you. What I typically do is I say, okay, I want to spend, you know, my budget for the month is three thousand dollars. Let's just say. And what it will do is tell us that your income commitment is three thousand dollars. And it will start this process here. You could add stuff in here. And if you did, let's say another thousand dollars here, then it's going to be updated right here, right? So now I'm at 4,000. So that's what's going on. For those of you that want to pay for uh, call setters or you want to invest in the business, et cetera, et cetera, you can put a budget number there as well if you wish. So we break that down for all of you. However, it's not necessary. Okay, you can put any number you want. So I'm going to make this easy. I'm going to say I'm going to do $4,000 here. And I'm going to do nothing there. All right. Now I'm going to click this little right arrow here. And then I put in my why. Why do I want to do well this month? Or why do I want to achieve whatever I want to achieve? Again, these are yours. These are not mine. We're not telling you what to put in here. But when you have your one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with your trainers or your upline, um, they may look at this and ask you, okay, what is your why? Well, maybe I want to be promoted. So down here, I say I want to become an SA in January. I give myself a month to do that. And maybe I want to make, you know, $25,000 or whatever the case is, you can put that in here. Down here, if there are certain milestones that you want to achieve, you can highlight those as well. So 10K in a week, that's good. We like that. 25K for the month in ALP. Gold Club is 50. Platinum is 100,000. And Diamond is $150,000 in a month or more. Those are not unreasonable. Those can be done. Okay. So you can select anything you want here. When you sit down with your upline, they're going to coach to that. The next thing over here is your field days. I forget who asked me the question, but this is where you would update that. So field days, I can click on that and I can change it to vacation or off. So there is a difference. So let's say today's the 10th, we're looking at tomorrow, which is the 11th, right? So field day means I'm going to be making calls. I'm going to be meeting with clients. Either I'm going to do on the spot presentations or I have scheduled presentations. I expect to work tomorrow. If I'm on vacation, <clears throat> that means I'm not available for the business at all. I'm not going to sit in meetings. <clears throat> I'm not going to make outbound calls. I'm not going to do presentations with clients, even if they want to. I'm on vacation. If I'm off, what that means is I'm not in the field. I'm not planning to make any phone calls or I'm not planning to meet with somebody. <clears throat> but if something comes up, I am available. Okay, that's kind of what the difference is there. Vacation means I'm not available. Off means I am available. So in this case, I'm working all 31 days. I would advise you if you're not in a push month that you don't work all 31 days or all 30 days or all 28 days of a month. You can find some time for yourself and your family to do that, all right? You can put notes down here that talk about, hey, this is what I'm going to do with this plan, et cetera, et cetera. So let's say that I am not, oh, I'm going to take every Saturday off, right? So I'm not going to work that Saturday. I'm not going to work that Saturday. And I'm not going to work that Saturday. Now, what it does is it tells me that the number of field days are 28 out of a total of 31. The 31 isn't what matters. <clears throat> the 28 is what matters. So now I've got 28 days. I go to the next item, and now this helps me figure out what do I need to do to accomplish the goals that I'm setting for myself. <clears throat> so first, I said I want my income to be $30,000. <clears> my contract, let's just say, is 50% because that's where all of you are at. Show percentage is the number of people who attend <clears throat> the presentations that I have scheduled. So if I have 10 presentations and seven people show up, and then my show ratio is 70%. So I'm going to put 70% in there, okay? And a quick quick point here. If you is anybody sending me messages? I hope not. Okay, good. No one's sending me messages. All right. Uh, the close ratio is what you expect your close ratio to be. So if I meet with 10 people and five of them close, my close rate is 50%. <clears throat> I don't expect new hires to do 50%. It'd be great if you did, but let's just say you did 30%, okay? The ALP per sale is how much life insurance do I sell for every single person that I sit with? If I sit with one family and I sell $5,000, then my ALP so far is $5,000 per sale. If I sit with two families and my next sale is only 1,000, then my ALP 
is 6,000 in total divided by the two sales. Now my ALP per sale has gone down to 3,000. Does that make sense to everybody? All I want is a thumbs up if you understand what I'm saying. All right, so in that case, the average is 1,500 for new hires. We typically see 1,500. We see people approach 1,800, the more senior that they get. Your goal should never be less than 1,200, but 1,500 is where new hires typically uh, arrive. Your bonus is going to be the world's greatest bonus. We'll get into that later. But let's say your bonus is going to be 20%, okay? So that's calculating additional money that you're going to make based on hitting certain amounts of ALP within a month. Your net to gross is basically your quality. So if you sell 5,000 of ALP, but only 4,000 gets taken out for whatever reason, then your net to gross would be 80%. Does that make sense? Gross is how much I actually sold. Net was how much that I actually get credit for. And the reason that your net could be less would be people may not take out the insurance that you sold them from a previous uh, month or a previous week. Maybe somebody canceled on you. So you're always going to have your net to gross. Our goal is always over 90. For new hires, I'm just going to put 80, even though you will typically get higher than that. The moment I put in the net to gross, what you will find is the system that will tell you exactly how many appointments a day that you need, how many presentations you need to make based on the show ratios, how many sales per day, and what your ALP needs to be on average per sale. That thing gets multiplied times the number of field days that you say you're going to work, and that will tell us exactly what your gross ALP needs to be, what your net ALP needs to be, how much you'll get in your advance, how much you'll get in your bonus to arrive at the $30,000 that I said I wanted to make for the month of January. Yes, Kaylee Hobb, how can I help you? Should we be entering all this information right now, or is this something we'll figure out after we start doing presentations you could, and... you, you're not doing it uh, other than the practice and just get familiar with it there's no i'm just showing you how this tool works okay this is purely for people to understand hey if i want to make thirty thousand dollars in a month in my bank account and i know that i'm on a 50 percent contract my lp is 1500 show ratio 70 all the rest of this information is in there I know how many appointments per day I need. I need five appointments per day. I need to sell two of them at $2,200 per day in order to achieve $30,000 of income. Got it. Okay. Okay. So I want you all to play with this, get familiar with it, because when you sit down with your uplines, not now, but once you're released at the end of every month, you'll fill this out for the next month because all of this rolls up, right? So when I have all the agents fill this up, now your SA who has agents underneath them, the GA, the MGA, and the SGA can all figure out based on the information you put in what they should be expecting in terms of revenue generation for that particular month. That's great for all the leadership, but who cares? For you, what you care about is, hey, I want to make X amount of money. Whatever that is, you're the one that's going to put it in there and then you can figure all this out for yourselves. Okay. The only thing you have to know is what my contract, and for the first 30 days, you're on a 50% contract. What is my ALP per sale? Typically, it's 1500 It may go a little bit lower, may go a little higher. Let's say it's going to be 1200 right? That's going to change what happens over here. Your show ratio, you can move that up or down. Your bonus, you can put that up or down. Close rate and net gross. Okay. Down at the bottom, you say, I want to get better at what? Because the leadership needs to know what do you want to get better at? Because they do a lot of uh, brown bags. What do we call them? I forget. We, they're seminars where, you know, we have you start at 12 o'clock. Let's say if you're on the West Coast, we have you sit in for half an hour and we go over how to do activity or how to do script memorization or it, how do I get paid or converting sponsors. And we'll work with you on that so you become more and more um, cognizant about how to do those things and, and hopefully get better at them. Okay. Do I have any questions on this screen here? Okay. You can play with this. You can do that. You can do it for every single month that you want. Most uplines will have you do it at the end of the previous months that were set up. So somewhere in the last week of January, you'll be setting up for February. 
Last week of February, you'll be putting everything together for March. And then as you do this, all the years will be listed here. So you stay with us for a while. You can go back and see all the game plans that you've ever done. And then if you go into leadership, you can see the game plans of all the people that um, are underneath you in your team. Okay. All right. Next. Th yes, Joe, how can I help you? So none of this works on a Mac, right? For some well, reason... I mean, I've been way behind by it. It won't let me log in. You can't log into HP, HP Pro? No, when it's asking me for the client's name. I've been just watching you do it. I haven't logged into a client name at all yet. Copy. I have not done anything with a client. This is purely for you and understanding how you can keep track of your game plan so you can determine how much work you need to do to get to the revenue goal that you have for yourself. Hey, sorry to cut in. Uh, Joe, I'm using a Mac as well. Um, try using Safari instead of Google Chrome because it kept logging me out of Google Chrome when I was logging in to HP Pro. And then I logged in on Safari and it kept me in. So that might be your issue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so this has been the uh, game plans. If I go back to home, which I'm now here, you down at the bottom, you have pre-plan, which we're going to skip for now. You have rate book, sponsorship program materials, underwriting, and medical questions. So the pre-plan, I so said we're going to skip the rate book. If I click on that, I can put in any information that's basic about an individual and know what the rates are as of today. So if I talk to somebody who's 50 years old, who's a female, who's a tobacco user, and they live in the state of California, I want to sell them a whole life product, and I want to give her $25,000 in coverage. It's going to cost her $107.53 a month. So if I would had any friends or anybody that I want to know or are looking for insurance for myself or whatever, you can use the rate book to just, without having to go through all the presentation materials, to understand what the associated cost is, right? If I take that same person who's 50 years old, right, and tobacco user in the state of California, and what I want to do is give them the A7-1 product was the health and uh, accident health product, and I can change that to $500 a day. Well, it's going to do it $100 a day. And I change it here to quintuple. That's going to cost her $11.92. So in total, to get $25,000 in whole life plus the A71 product, it's going to cost her, what, $119.45, give or take? So the rate book is designed to give you access to the actual rates. Now, the beauty is, when I was young and did this way back in the day, uh, you had to calculate this yourself based on a physical rate book, looking at everything, and then put a quote together. We don't have to do that at all because HP Pro will take this rate book information behind the scenes and do all the work for us. However, if you don't wanna go through a presentation with somebody, they're just curious, how much would it cost for me to get X, Y, and Z? You can go to the rate book and look it up and at least it'll be close, okay? So that's what the rate book is designed to do. The next thing is the sponsorship program. We're gonna see this when we go through the scripts and the actual presentation when we have information here this is the sponsorship tool, the sponsorship program. We can add people into here, put in a bunch of information, and then we save that. All of these leads will then be downloaded into your lead pack. So I'm not going to show you how to do that just yet. I'll show you when we go through the script, but that you can do that here. So if somebody were to call me up and say, hey, Sam, uh, I was talking to so-and-so, and they're interested in getting coverage. I'm not going to put them anywhere else. I'm going to go right here immediately. I'm going to go right there and I'm going to add and I'm going to say the name I got was from Frank. Frank told me about Mary. I'm going to put Mary right here and all her information and I'm going to click the floppy disk and now it'll be right into my lead pack. So there's a way to do it without having to go through the entire presentation. Yes, Dora Stokes, what can I do for you? Gifted. What is that for? The total gifted. Yeah, I'm going to go through all that. Oh. When I get to the clips, okay? <laughs> yeah, no worries. 
Okay, so that was the sponsorship program. The next thing is materials. If I click on materials, every single no cost uh, benefit that we offer, along with the veteran will kit, the labor advisory board, or a video about an AIL career, the family information guide, all of that is here. Now, when you do a presentation, depending on what your market you're in, we will show you what you need to provide to the client. But if for some reason you wanted to show a client something that you didn't want to go through a presentation, you can go right to this screen and maybe you can click on display for the McGruff and we can walk through the McGruff Child Safe Kit. So this is a way for you to get to these no cost benefits if you ever need to show them to somebody and you're not doing an actual presentation. Maybe a family, maybe a friend, maybe somebody calls you up. They're like, hey, I know you told me about this last time. I'm trying to remember what is it about the McGruff kit? You can show it to them by sharing it with them without actually having to launch a presentation. Because remember, when you launch a presentation, you're going to have to send a report card and you're going to have to give us a disposition about that presentation. If I want to close any of the stuff that I listed over here in the upper right hand corner, I have an X. When I click X, it goes away. If I want to download it and have it available to me on my hard drive, I can click this little down arrow and it will save the PDF to my hard drive. And we will have to do that when we do presentations. But if any of you wanted any of this material, maybe HP Pro, you're afraid HP Pro may not work or you can't log in, you can download all these no-cost benefit material and have it available to you on your hard drive. Yes, Zuri Reed. Hey, um, so other than this screen, are there any other client-facing screens that are safe? Um, I just know that usually when it comes to client screen sharing, it's very sensitive, like which programs, websites, bookmarks, you know, things like that. There's all kinds of client-facing screens. This in particular that I'm showing you is the no-cost benefit screens. Okay. okay. There are other screens we're going to see that the client will see as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, and good point, there are screens that you never want the client to see, and I will tell you what those are, okay? All right, so going back uh, going back to the home, we talked about the materials. The next one <clears throat> is the underwriting manuals. Everybody's going to get familiar with the underwriting manuals because when you click on this, the, let me start over. You are going to become an agent. You're going to sell insurance. Part of your responsibilities are what's called a field underwriter, okay? As a field underwriter, you have to assess, you have to take a look at information to see if people fall in a certain category. And if that category says, oh, we're not gonna cover them, then you need to let them know that. If the category is that could possibly be rated, then you need to let them know that. And you'll see as you go through what that is. But if you think about it, <clears throat> If I didn't need you to do field underwriting, then I don't need agents. I can just have phone setters call somebody and then say, hey, we're going to sell you insurance, go to this website, fill it all out. And it cuts out the agent completely. The whole point an agent exists is to help close at the highest level, but also filter out those people with either high risk or they meet some other criteria that's going to make their uh, associated costs higher. The very first thing that affects uh, a rating or the cost of insurance is gonna be your age. The next one is gonna be your health and the third one is gonna be your habits, okay? You can't do anything about age, it is what it is, the rates are associated with that, but your health and habits, you can do something about because you need to ask questions of the client based on their health and their habits. The very first question that we ask when we fill out an application, and you'll see that uh, in the future is, how tall are you and how much do you weigh? If somebody is five foot even and they weigh 350 pounds, Luke Barish, do you think they're going to qualify for insurance with us? I'm sorry, did you say bearish? Well, isn't that your last name? Luke, if somebody weighs five, five, 
They're five feet tall and they weigh 350 pounds. Do you think they're going to qualify with us? No. Yeah. Blair, if somebody's five foot tall and they weigh 240 pounds, do you think they're going to qualify with us? Uh, I want to say probably not. Probably not. So we're not entirely sure, right? We're not experts. We don't know everything on the sun. But the beauty is with the underwriting materials, you can figure that out. So when you click this down arrow, the very first one you get is build chart. If I click on the build chart, it will tell me if someone is five foot tall and they weigh 350 pounds, they're higher than a T12, we are not going to cover them. So you, all of you will get very familiar with this because the very first thing we ask is how tall are you and how much do you weigh? Now you need to go with what they tell you. If somebody tells you I'm five foot tall and I weigh 190 pounds, but you're looking at them and you're thinking they may weigh 350 pounds, <laughs> you're not going to call them out. What you're going to do, and I'll show you later, is you're going to make a note for underwriting to be aware of what you observe. Okay, but for the most part, someone's going to give you their height and the weight, and if you don't know where it falls, you're going to look it up in this table. So if they're six foot fall, six foot tall and they weigh 300 pounds. They're going to be right here in T4. That means they're going to be okay. So this is both male and female, and it's the average weight for the height. So if they fall anywhere in here, they're completely fine. If they fall in here and if they have other conditions, then we may need to worry about it. Yes, Kaylee Hobbs. What if they are taller than the chart allows? Because my husband's 6'10". He's really tall. He wouldn't fit on the chart. How much does he weigh? Uh, probably like 310. So 310, he's going to be fine. Okay. Right? Because the first one is 360. So no problem for him whatsoever. Well, I just mean, yeah. like, say you had a seven foot client. Like, that's yeah. not even on the. You're going to go to the 6'9 and you're going to see how, you're going to the last one and you see how much they weigh. Okay. And if they weigh 320, then you're fine. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. If you do have a question where something's not on there. Then you're going to contact your upline and go, hey, I've got this problem, right? This guy is seven foot four, but he's telling me he weighs 300 pounds. What do I do? And they'll say, yeah, he's probably fine. Yes, okay. Bob. How uh, T4 is okay. Which T, which T is the cutoff where they're not okay? You will get that uh, when we go through the various scenarios because it's usually in conjunction with some other underlying issue, not just the weight by itself. Like if they have diabetes, they have heart problems, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, Timothy Sanders. Uh, what if they fall way below the average, like like below it? I don't care. That's fine. Okay. Right? Below the average, I just does not matter. It's what you worry about is when you get up here into the T sixes and the T eights and above. Uh, yes, sir. Hey, this is going back to um, Kaylee's questions. Um, if I pronounced your name right, sorry. <laughs> um, the is it safe to assume it looks like the um the weight trend kind of goes diagonally so if something's not listed um either above or below on the height list could you just kind of follow that trend at least for a rough estimate i know you, i know everything's precise like for the underwriter but if the client has like a specific question um the client's not seeing this first of all you don't show this to the client all yeah. you're doing when we do the applications you're asking what's your height and weight if okay. the client's um, four foot tall and I weigh 87 pounds, then you're fine, right? Because at 4'8 at 87, we're okay. If you're below the weight, that doesn't matter to us. What matters is if you're above the weight. Okay. So to your point, yeah, there is a pattern that you can follow. But again, if you have a question, check with your upline. It very rarely will ever happen that somebody's going to be outside of the parameters here. Actually, this is the first time in class I've heard a husband who is, what, 6'10". But since he was under 360, he's going to be fine. Okay, moving on. You will get to know this chart really, really well because you don't always know what the weight is. Every single time you take an application, you're going to check this. Client doesn't need to see this. You'll probably have it printed out so you can refer to it or have it on another screen. Once you've done this for a while, you'll pretty much know kind of what the weight uh, kind of parameters are based on height. And then... Every once in a while, you can have somebody give you a weight that's like, oh, I'm not sure. Let me check. All right. So that is the build chart. In addition, you have what's called a flash sheet. That's the very second one. Flash sheet is what we call an auto decline sheet. 
if somebody tells me that they've been arrested with a felony arrest in the last five years, can I write coverage on them based on what this charge is telling me? Mary Frederick, can I write a policy on this person if they've had a felony arrest in the last five years? Mary, 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 I can't hear you. Number one, Mary, you're trying to look at my screen. Number two, number three, you have your own HB Pro. You can look at that. Come on, Mary, you're killing me. And I still can't hear you, Mary. <laughs> I only give Mary her time because this is the third time she's gone through the class. So I Anybody, know. Here you go, Mary. So can I sell somebody who has a felony arrest in the last five years? Um, right here. Nope. No, you cannot. That's correct. I cannot. I didn't say conviction, did I? I said arrest. If you've been arrested for a felony the last five years, I cannot write a policy on you, okay? And the way I know that is up here, if I have an X in any one of my rows and columns that intersect, that's an auto decline. That means I cannot write a policy on that individual. If it's L, that means life. If it's A, that's accident, and H is health. So as you can understand, if I have cancer, I can't write a policy on that if they meet this standard. But I could include them on the A71 product because that's an accident, right? It has nothing to do with your physical well-being. just means I got injured in an accident. So I could write that. However, if I've got diabetes and I am overweight at a T6 or above, I can't write anything on them. One, because they're likely to die sooner. Two, they're more than likely due to get into an accident of some kind. And obviously their health they're all good, and their disability are no longer. Yeah, Bob, what can I do for you? What if it was mistaken or unlawful arrest? If they tell you that you were arrested, or I'm not you, sorry. If they were arrested for a felony arrest within the last five years, uh, actually, this is the right thing right here, starting with probation or parole within the last five years. So even if it was the wrong guy? Well, what would happen is they could, we would then submit it as a trial with an ex, uh, ex, explanation. <laughs> I don't know, hard time going with my words. And you would provide an explanation, but you would submit it as a trial. So we would not collect any money initially. We would see if underwriting would allow us to write that policy. Okay. So you'll get very familiar with this flash sheet because anytime something comes up, you want to check this to make sure whether or not they fill in that category. We ask a lot of health questions. That would be here. And then we ask a lot of habit uh, questions, including miscellaneous drugs, alcohol, and arrests. So you're going to want to get to know this one pretty well. All right. Uh, going back to underwriting manuals, let's say that, give me a medical condition, Elizabeth Poleski. Give me a medical condition. Bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder, I'm going to, if I can learn how to spell right there, I'm going <laughs> to type bipolar, right? I don't want to have to look at the flash sheet. I want to look at this and have an idea. Is it listed in our underwriting materials? The answer is yes. It's considered depression. And then it gives you this, which tells you what you can and can't do. So on a life, the agent should always complete a depression questionnaire, degree of impairment, and the duration of effect and control is the information that is needed. When somebody tells you they're taking medication for bipolar, you will have a form that will automatically pop up because you answered yes to a certain question. I'm going to show you that later. When that pops up, they then have to answer you the questions on that form. You will fill it all out, and then you will submit that. Sherry Young, give me a different medical condition. Hypertension. Hypertension. So I'm going to put in hypertension. That's going to be a blood pressure. I can click on that. Again, it's going to tell me on the life side, the accident health, whether it's going to be this particular product, which is the hospital indemnity or critical illness, and the A71 is the accident. It tells me what I can or can't do. If I know somebody's taking blood pressure medication, I need to fill out a blood pressure questionnaire. And based on that, applicants who are in treatment for hypertension whose blood pressure maintain a normal level generally qualify as standard. You can submit them as standard if their blood pressure is under control and hypertension is under control. If it is not, you would then submit it as a trial. 
So this is telling you what you can and can't do, and you can just type in any type of medical condition that's here. Any questions about the underwriting materials? You can also scroll down. You can see everything that's under the sun that we have, and there's quite a bit, right? We're in the insurance business. That's what we do. If somebody told me they had a weight loss surgery, I can go here and go, oh, okay, what's going on, right? If the weight is not normalized yet, but you had the surgery, I have to wait for three months. If you did a lap band and if you did a bypass, I have to wait six months. But if the weight is not normalized, I will probably end up getting a rating or possibly a decline, depending upon what it is. If you have somebody who had that surgery done, you're going to submit it as a trial. So let's talk about that for a second. You can submit a policy application as either standard or as a trial. If you submit it standard, what you're saying is a field underwriter, you've gathered all the information and you've made the assessment that the standard rate should apply and that this person will not be declined. If when you submit that standard, if you made a mistake and it goes through and underwriting comes back and says it's a decline, then you get penalized for that. One, we take back all the um, commissions and bonuses that you got based on that particular deal, but we also lower your quality level, right? Because you're, you're the one that's determining quality. Quality is making sure you submit good applications. We will teach you how to do that, what to look out for, but that is something that you should be aware of, right? So anytime a medical condition comes up, you think it's risky, submit it as a trial, because as a trial, that will never be held against you, even if it's a decline. Yes, Sheree? Um, technically, if it's not like a medical condition, if someone just is obsessed with elective surgery, is that a factor into how we no, underwrite? because we, we only ask the questions that I'm going to show you in a minute of the client. If that question is not on there, which it's not, we don't ask about elective surgery, that's okay. Because if you think about what we do as insurance industry, we uh, build and maintain actuary tables, and we're looking at all the different things associated with people's lifestyle, health, habits, all the rest of it. Whether they have elective surgery or not is not one of the factors that determines whether the rate should go up or down for life insurance. Okay? It may, if we find out that somebody's getting like... Uh, I don't know, liposuction and a huge percentage of people are dying from liposuction, then maybe we'll do that. Maybe, but we're not in that situation. Okay. Yes, Anthony, what can I do for you? <clears throat> um, yes. Yeah, so two questions. Um, one, um, so why would we put every policy as a trial just to be safe? And also, what if they were being dishonest? Will we be penalized uh, for that? If it comes back and it's not qualified, and they're being dishonest. So let me work my way. Well, let me start with the first one. So we don't submit everything as a trial because you don't get paid on trials because you're not collecting any money, right? The only reason that you get paid in advance is because we've collected cash from that individual. So we have a contract that's in place. That's what the application is, which is why you sign it and why the uh, applicant signs it. So that's a contract. A contract's only valid when consideration is given from both parties. In order for the contract to be valid, in order for us to pay you, consideration had to be received from the applicant, which is the cash that they're paying with. In a trial, when you submit a trial, no cash is collected. Ergo, we don't pay you anything until the trial is complete and the policies are issued. Okay. So this is why we don't want to submit trials if we don't need to. So the majority of the time, and the way that you're taught with me and the way you're going to be taught with your upline is to act as a very good field underwriter to ensure that any of those things that I should have submitted as a trial, I actually do. I would say, I think it's 75, 80% of your applications will not be, will not require to be submitted as a trial. Okay, just so you know. So you're going to get paid a lot. But if a trial gets submitted, then you don't get paid until that trial has been deemed okay. And then you actually get paid all the money you're supposed to get paid. Now, the second thing, if somebody lies to you. So here's what happens. You're an agent and you're taking in as much information as you can from the client, but the veracity of the information is purely up to the client who's given it to you. That's number one. Number two, if you see something like, if somebody says I'm a non-smoker, but they're smoking a cigar, yeah, then they're a smoker, and you're going to have to label it as a smoker because the rate will change, okay? But if somebody tells you, yeah, I'm perfectly fine, I'm healthy, everything's good to go, 
and then you submit it as standard, you get paid for it, and then uh, underwriting says, yeah, we did the medical information board review, and we found out this person just had a heart transplant, right? So they lied to you. One, that happens very, very rarely, but two, you will still get penalized because we're going to pull the money back, obviously, right? Because we paid you in advance on something that turns out it's not going to happen. So we've got to pull that back. Everything else will go into play. But again, the percentage of people who flat out lie that result in a declination from underwriting is, is minimal. As a matter of fact, we probably have more agents fraudulently filling out these applications than we have people lying that are the applicants themselves. Does that answer your question, Anthony? Yes, it does. Okay. Not the answer I wanted, but it, it does. Uh, Harpreet, how can I help you? Uh, so, um, Anthony kind of had the questions I asked, but just to uh, clarify, uh, basically, if you fill out the, what's it called, not the actual application, but the one you said, and you're basically saying we get paid after they uh, do an assessment, and then after they do the assessment and uh, everything follows through, then uh, they would send us the money, correct? That's if you submit it as a trial and the trial, trial yeah. yes. And then uh, the second part, uh, also what Anthony said, let's say they do lie. What I know like we don't get paid or whatever the case may be, but do we also get penalized, let's say, as our quality goes down, like you said? Yes. Uh, okay, so even if it's not our fault, they will still get, okay. But that makes sense, right? Because the company can't be on the hook for something that they got to return the money for. And again, the percentage of time that somebody's going to lie on an applicant is very, very low. Minimum, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah but that, that was, he, you basically answered the question okay. I had before. Great. Thank you. Morgan. How long is that trial period? 90 days. 90 days? Yeah. We're, even if it's simple trial or a complicated trial, the way that it works is they'll, uh, they'll work it so that it finishes up by 90 days. <laughs> okay, so, so that's, that's when it... So it, it would get approved then and you would get paid? Well, I would say a resolution would happen within 90 days and you'll get notified and you will get a mod in your inbox, which will tell you, hey, the trial was successful. We're going to go ahead and issue the policy or there's a rating and you need to either get more money from the client or indicate that they have a reduced uh, payout or, uh, or decline, right? We're not going to do it at all. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, so that is here. All of you are going to get familiar with this. Like I said, you can type in any of the medical conditions or you can do this drop-down list, and that will get you all the information about uh, underwriting manuals. Now, uh, I know i got some questions, so just bear with me a second. The last one on this is medical questions, okay? If I click on medical questions, the super combo is going to be medical questions for anybody below the age of 60. And if I click on senior, then those medical questions are anybody 60 or older. So it's important that you fill out the correct one so that you uh, don't have to do it again, right? You only want to do it once. You can see for a senior in the insurance industry, or at least with us, seniors classified as 60 years or older, there are only eight questions. With a super combo, there are 17 questions. So in fact, there's more of a risk that somebody may not qualify or get rated if they're under the age of 60 than if they're over the age of 60. And the reason for that is we know what the risks are associated with somebody who's 60 or older more than we know the risks for other folks in the sense that we've mitigated our risks two ways. Number one, we only allow up to $34,999 as the total amount of coverage we'll provide to anybody 60 or older. And we sell senior graded whole life. And what that means is if you're 60 or older and we sell you a, a insurance policy, it will be graded. That means we will only pay out 25% in the first year, 50% in the third, second year rather, and 75% in the third year. Anything beyond the third year, when you die, the entire amount will be paid out. So these are the questions that we have to ask and that we have to answer. Based on those answers, when we use EAP, additional forms will come up, like the high blood pressure form, the depression form, the medical information form, anything like that will come up based on these answers. Yes, Ruth, what can I do for you? 
Hi, thank you. Um, I actually don't have a question. I just had a comment based off a few questions. Um, uh, when people want to protect themselves from liars, um, I watched all the AO 10 day training video and it said, um, you know, you keep repeating that you want people to be honest because um, we also have to let them know that there's going to be consumer reports done on them, which also means that we can look back and see that um, we're going to be looking into their medical records as well, which they will be notified about. And if they do lie, that'll just kind of it'll be obvious if they're going to lie and they'll get caught. So that's one way we can prevent liars and or at least like evade them from wanting to lie because they know that we're going to do some background research on them or the company will. So in case anyone uh, read into that, I read that on some of the training. Just wanted to yeah. that. Um, nah, yeah, you're absolutely right. However, I'm not a big fan of that for, and, and we'll get into it later, not today, but yeah, I mean, think about what's happening. They have to actually sign a document attesting to the fact that the information that they provided you is accurate. You're signing the document indicating that the information you receive, as far as you can tell, has been accurate. That by itself simply will prevent a majority of people from trying to be fraudulent or applicants. Right? But there's no way to prevent them if they want to tell us something isn't true. Now, what I do tell folks is that we have up to 16 different avenues that we get information, including the Medical Information Board. And Tom, I'll be right with you. Everyone does understand that if you've ever had any type of medical uh, procedure done in any way, shape, or form, that I can get access to it. You, you all understand that, correct? Anybody did not know that? I can get at, not me personally, when I say, oh, I'm talking about the insurance company, not even the agents, it's going to be the underwriting team. Right? So insurance companies as a consortium have gotten together and they've created the medical information board. And that medical information board is everything you've ever paid, everything, every medical record that you have that the insurance company paid for. It's all there. Everybody can see that who works in underwriting an insurance company. When I say everybody, all the companies can see it. And granted, only select people with authorization could get your records. But the point there is that there's nothing that can be hidden. Now, what you could do is pay out of pocket cash or whatever to a uh, medical facility who could provide a service to you. But even then, since that information is not submitted to the Medical Information Board and the insurance companies, even then there are ways that I can, that underwriting can get that information. So to Ruth's point, if someone's going to give you fraudulent information about themselves, they're going to get found out. Now, the penalty to them is really, no, there's no penalty other than we won't write insurance on you. That's really it, which is why I don't like to talk about that with clients. I just let them know, hey, we're going to get all your medical information, so let's fill this out as accurately as possible. Yes, Tom, I have uh, appreciate you. What, what can I do for you? Yeah, no problem, Sam. I, I just wanted to corroborate a, a few things that have been said. Uh, as, a, as a field underwriter for the last 10 years, um, you are absolutely accurate that most people will, will go out of their way to tell the truth. I mean, not everybody. And I think, you know, the comment regarding do you share about the MIB and, and stuff like that, um, I did that only if I really was suspicious of the person and you know I had a good rapport in the conversation and I was more you know I was more likely to share the fact that there is an MIB and you described it perfectly everything that's ever happened is, is pretty much there if they want it um, especially where that came into play a lot with with me where people that, that had uh, drug uh, drug experiences in the past or they've been arrested or you know a few of those types of things um, so I, I absolutely agree with you. The other point that I, just a point of question, since there's obviously the, the ability to make a huge amount of money uh, in this business, is there an opportunity for taking uh, payments or taking commission as, as earned as opposed to, uh, as opposed to advance? Uh... Not that I'm aware of, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't do it. You'd have to work with your upline to see if you can change the way your commissions are calculated. The, the issue is that everyone's commissions are calculated every single week and then paid out on a Friday. So when mm -hmm. you get an advance that's paid out, when the advance comes, people are earning money based on your advance. The people above you, based on how well you did and how well you got paid, they're right. going to get additional as well. So I'm not sure if you can change that if you wanted to. 
several companies I've been with do allow that, but maybe this company doesn't. That's a good question. I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask no, that, that is a good question. question. I'll, I'll see if I can't find that out for you. Thank now, you. I know there are some people that have questions in the chat. I can't see the chat when I'm doing all this. So you just need to raise your hand. The, the first thing is the senior graded whole life product is uh, the product that we sell to anybody 60 or older. It has nothing to do with their health. It has to do with risk. We've made a decision that one of the ways we're going to mitigate risk is we're only going to pay out a um, graded amount for the first three years of that policy. The second way that we reduce our risk is we're capping how much insurance somebody six year older can purchase from us. And it's $34,999, right? If you have another question, you know, raise your hand because I, I can't go through and look at all the chats. There's way too many of them for me to scroll through that. Uh, all right, so we talked about this here. We talked about this super combo has a lot more questions and we're gonna practice this. We're gonna see what that looks like when we move forward. That is the medical questions through all of this. So we did the dashboard. We looked at, uh, not that one, we looked at rate book. We looked at sponsorship program, materials, underwriting manuals, medical questions, and then our profile. Yes, Anthony. <clears throat> uh, last question. And, and, and real quick about the chat. I was only using the chat just to ask questions amongst the other students. Oh, yeah, so Go ahead. I just I have to stop. Have a question. Okay. Um, also, so um, I know once, you know, it seems like they won't lie, which is very positive. But um, also, do they get deducted as well? So like, are people above us? So if we get deducted, is that why there's such an emphasis on making sure it's done right? Because we're all financially penalized? Or is the agent who wrote up the policy financially penalized for everything? So let me work my way backwards. The reason that we emphasize it has nothing to do with you getting paid, not getting paid. We want to make sure we're writing good quality business that stays on the book. It's not the initial payment that everyone ultimately should be concerned about because that's nice. You're going to get paid, make your money. It's the renewals. It's every year where you're getting additional money, 5% of whatever you sold coming in that comes in for as long as that policy exists, whether you die or not. That money still comes in. That's really what you need to look at because ultimately if you stay with us for 10 years or maybe a little bit less, you're going to make more money in renewals than you'll make in writing new business. Okay. That's why we're so focused on that. And because we want to make sure we're taking care of these folks and that they give us the right information. So that's the second part. The first part that you asked about is affect the upline. Yes. Your upline get affected. Anytime something gets called back, if they were paid a bonus or something on the money that you did and it then ends up getting reversed, or clawed back in sales parlance, then yeah, they'll be affected. But the mo the number one person who gets affected the most is obviously you as the writing agent. Okay, so we went through virtually all the different pieces that are here. The next thing we're gonna go through is actually walking through a demo of how the presentation works in conjunction with HB Pro. Since I've been talking now for a little bit, we're gonna take a uh, 10 minute break. So please come back in about two minutes. Here we go. All right, let's bring everybody back, get those cameras on, get your HB Pro fired up because we are going to be doing a bunch of HB Pro stuff. This is the stuff that matters. All right, we got everybody back. Let's go with, uh, I don't know, Kaylee Hobbs. Kaylee Hobbs, are you ready to go? I'm brushing my kids' teeth, getting them ready for school, but I'm here. <laughs> Blair, are you ready to go? Uh, yes. All right, let's. Get, all right. So what I want you all to do is have your script up. You have the veteran script. Let's do that one first. Then I'm going to and also have your credit union script up, so you can see that as well. Log into your HP Pro and be at this screen here. All right, I'm going to get started. We're going to go through the process. You can follow along with the script. You can fill the information out as you choose. Bridget, you have a question. Yes, what is it? Sorry, is the script on um, Alti Pro or is that on like HP Pro or, Did or you... is that just from the video? No, it's all three. It is an attachment to the email. Did you not get that from Ruth Malloy? Um, I can double check. I might have not 
seen it. I just so, saw that there was a video, so I'm not entirely sure if I got I sent you uh, two emails. The second one should have um, all the attachments from the first day email. Oh, I see it now. Thank you so got much. It. I'm so sorry. Can you send her the credit union script email as well, please? I sent both to everyone that Perfect. requested it. Yeah. All right, so here we go. <clears throat> and I've got two screens here. They look exactly the same, but they're, uh, first of all, you guys can see my screen, right? Okay, so I've got two screens. So I'm gonna log in two different ways. On this one, this is gonna be the veteran login. I'm gonna click on other. I'm gonna type other in. When I type other in, other is gonna be displayed. I'm gonna click on other. <clears throat> when I do that, it's gonna ask me what language, what state, what presentation type, what subtype, the group number and the group name, okay? So <clears throat> we know I'm gonna put the state of California for the presentation type, I'm gonna put veteran. And for the subtype, I'm going to put return card. And for the SG number, I'm gonna type in SGMAD, okay? When I type it in, I wait for a second, it will then display SGMAD. And then I will click on it and the group name will automatically be filled with the VFW Department of California. So that's on the veteran side. If I do it for the credit union side, I'm gonna click on other <clears throat> or type in other. I will then click on other. All of this stuff will come up. I'm gonna pick California again. The presentation type now is going to be credit union. The subtype is going to be return card for what we're doing today. What should the SG number be? Can somebody tell me what that should be? Should be in the script for the credit union. What is the SG number? Anybody? SG3EU. SG3EU. When I type that in, it shows up there. I click on that and it then tells me it's the Spokane City Credit Union. Yes, Chardet, what's your question? What does the SG number like represent? It's the, uh, it's the code assigned for the group letter that we, uh, if you remember with Andrew Haskins talking about sitting down with them, he did the VFW, right? That, so we sit down with the VFW, a post, we then draft a letter that they say, yes, we want to use. They then sign it as the adjutant. That's the letter that gets sent to every member, whether it's the veterans, whether it's the credit union, doesn't matter. That letter is the same letter as this one here that I just put in here. So when I'm talking to a client based on the lead, when I put the client's name in here, if I had put in John Smith and they were in my lead pack, all that information would already be presented. Okay lead packs, I'm giving you uh, samples to use, okay? okay? So the credit union looks like this, the veteran looks like that. Everyone tracking with me, any questions about where we're at so far? Okay, so then I'm gonna click on presentations for the veteran and then it shows up like this and it shows me that I have the SGMAD, it gives me the group uh, AD&D, the Veterans Burial and Wicket and the sponsorship program. There's more if I wanted to click on more and I see everything that I would have seen in the no cost benefits list. However, we only show you what you need to do for this type of presentation. If I went to the credit union and I said, start that type of presentation, it would then show me specifically for the credit union what I need to do. That has more. You got the member survey, financial information guide, the AD&D, AIL, family information guide. Sorry, Financial Information Guide, finan Family Information Guide, Child Safe Kids and Sponsorship Program. Okay, so let's go back to the majority of you and the veterans. Now, here is where you would start with somebody in a presentation. You would have this screen up, your camera would be on, you would not be sharing this screen at this point. So in our veteran script, if I can see that right here, Sorry, let me put it over there so you guys can see it. Okay, so there's the veteran script, right? And the opening. Hey, you're gonna talk about what they're doing, what they've done, how their data is going. Basically, you're gonna build rapport. You must learn in the veteran script A1 and you must memorize it. That's the only thing I want you to memorize. Now, when Troy talked to us yesterday, he said, hey, you should practice the whole script. 
the better you know the script, the more you memorize it, the better you're going to do. He's absolutely right. However, you're going to turn your camera off once you finish your introduction with the client and you're going to share your screen. Once your camera's off, now you could read the script. And I have people that are agents that have been around for a long time. They still do that. Even though they know the script by heart, they're still uh, putting the script up so they can refer back to it in case they get distracted. Yes, Harpreet. Uh uh, I never got the email for this one. I got the one for the credit union, but I haven't got the one for the veterans. And I'm a veteran, so that's kind of the one that I need. So did you get the day one email for me? Yes. So it's attached to that day one email. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now, and it's just showing me uh, the the other one, the, the credit union one. I didn't get Someone that. just sent it in the chat. Oh, yeah, look at the chat. I sent a day one email on the very first day of class and I had all the attachments except for the credit union script. I sent an email last night talking about the fact that the video for day one was up on YouTube. To that email, I attached the credit union script. And the reason I'm saying this is because there's a lot of information on that day one email that we're going to go through. So you need to have that available to you, okay? Yes, cross. I also only got the credit union one too. I never got the veteran one. Did you get my day one email? Yes, I got your day one email, but it only gives you the credit union um, attachment and never gave me the veteran option. So the day yes. one email, the first email I sent everybody did not have the credit union script attached. It had 11 other attachments. Oh. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you need to make sure you have that because there's a lot of information we're going to go through there, okay? Okay. But if you are missing a script, please check with Ruth Malloy and she will send it to you, okay? All right, so that's the script in the beginning and the opening, the veteran script that looks like that. If you're in the credit union script, very similar, you're building rapport, you're doing whatever, your camera is on, you turn your camera off when you're about to share your HB Pro letter. So for the credit union, you're going to share the SG3E1, and for the veteran, you're going to share the SGMAD. Okay? Here, uh, sorry, no, let me go here. This is what it looks like when you actually do it. So this is SGMAD. You're going to display that. Hey, I've done the introduction. I introduced myself, tell you what I'm about. Now I'm going to ask you if you can see my screen. And if you can see my screen, I'm now showing you this letter. At this point, you're only showing page one of this letter. Okay, you're not reading this letter to them. You're not, you know, looking at it and you're not doing any of that. You're going to follow exactly what the script says. Yes, Kelly. 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 Kelly, I feel like I should be saying Bueller. Sorry, Sorry about that. Uh, I'm lost. I'm trying to follow along with you and do it up on my HP Pro. And under SG number and group name, what do I put for a vet? Did you, were you at the beginning when I started this, Kelly? Yes. And then I clicked over to my screen. I wasn't watching. I was trying to oh. just listen. Okay. So yeah, it's kind of important if you watch as we go through this, because this is what you wanted to do, right? Right. So if you're in the veteran market and you're at that very first screen when you put in other and you go all the way down, the SG number is SGMAD. SGMAD. Once you type I, it in, wait a second, it'll then drop down and then you click on that SGMAD. Under and then under vet is return card, correct? Yes, you can use return card. Okay, and I am seeing. They're all C's. I am not seeing no S's. So I told you That's to type in know. the letters S G M A D. Type in the entire thing. Wait a second. It will then display that and then you click on it. Okay. I got that now. Awesome. Okay. So the very first thing we're showing is this, which is the actual letter. If I come back to the script, this is what I'm going to do is share on my screen and boom, this is the letter that you received. 
The veteran service organizations got together and noticed there were some common concerns shared by all veterans. You're going to actually read this entire thing with your camera off. If it is a response card, once you get done, you're going to use your mouse and you're going to click on X and you're going to go to the group A, D, and D certificate, which will then show up like this. If you're on the credit union side, you're going to click on display. It'll show you that particular uh, SG, which obviously looks a lot different. And when you're done with that, you're going to click off that. And where's the next place that you should go to? You're going to talk about, hey, why are we meeting on Zoom? You're going to say, hey, the name of the credit union. So if it's, uh, what, if it's Seattle City, you're going to say the Seattle Credit Union found that members have a serious gap in the personal insurance benefits, and you're going to read all of this. Okay? If you're in the veteran presentation, you've read all of this information here. Hey, this is the amount that you get for the accidental death. Let's say it's $2,000 or $4,000. It's not contributing, not participating, which means it's already been taken care of for you. You listed John as your beneficiary. Is that the way you'd like to keep it? The reason you know it's John is when you got the lead in your inbox, the lead would list the actual response card that was filled out by hand by the member. And they would put the name of the person they wanted to list as their beneficiary. This is how you're going to know that. In this case, you're just going to use an example. Whatever you want is completely fine. Then when you get through all that, you need to go to the burial and will kit for veterans. So coming back to the veteran script, once you're done with that, now you're going to click on the veterans burial and will kit right there. And what I'm going to do now is go through all of this for this one in particular, and then I'll do the credit union one. So just bear with me a second. Okay, so now I'm here. I'm going to click the next arrow here, which will give me to the very next screen. And the script then says, this is very important to fill out. They found a lot of veterans. I'm not going to read everything here because you all are going to practice reading this and you're going to learn this ad infinitum. But we go through all this information here. We start on this screen after we talk about that. Every single time you're going to fill something out on the screen, you're going to click on the little pencil. Once you put that in there, you're going to put in the name of the person. So let's say it's Samuel and the last name is Sweet and my birthday Let's just say it's 0101-1968. Now I'm good in that section. I'm going to put my uh, email address or the email address of the client, rather. So it's gmail.com. You're going to put in a phone number, 555-555-555. The city is in San Jose, California, 95111. When I, oops, when I finish filling this in for this section, the only things I can fill in are in gray, okay? The only things I can fill in are in gray. When I'm done with the section, I need to click on that little floppy disk. And the reason why is it will then save this information. If HP Pro crashes or something like that happens and you have to bring it up, if you didn't click on that floppy disk, none of this information would be saved and you would have to do it all over again. Okay, so I'm gonna click save. It then will save it. Data has been successfully saved. I'm going to click on this. The only thing I fill out here is if I have a spouse or a significant other, I'm going to put their first name, last name, and their date of birth. We need to know the dates of birth because that's going to help us when we get to the uh, building a plan or the needs analysis screen. Once I fill that in, I'm going to click on that. I'm going to go to veterans information. The only thing I fill in in veteran information is their branch of service, Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, Marine Corps, or Space Force. Then I'm going to go to the people to be notified. Yes, Shade, how can I help you? Sorry to stop you. Now, are you you're not filling out all of this information with them, or you are? Yes, you are. That's why you click on the little thing and you act just like I did up here. You fill it out. If you're doing a response card, you will have their name up here, and you will have their birthday. If you're doing a Pavit lead in the veteran market, you will not have their birthday, but you will have their email address. Everything that's blank, that's in gray, okay, you need to fill out with them. You're doing this on their behalf because according to the script, this guide eliminates all three. So keep it in a safe place to make this easier for you. They have us fill out some of the information together. That way, when it gets emailed to you, it's already pre-filled. So we're doing this as a favor to the client. Okay. Shannon, you have a question. Yes. Um, 
I am lost. How did you get to that screen where you're entering their info? What did you click on? I'm yeah, yeah how did you get to that? Okay, so we're at the, we're on the script. We're here. We've okay. turned our camera off and we talked to letters to be received that they should have received. We click on this and then we walk through the script. This is the actual letter, the SMAD letter. I click I X that. and then I'm going to click on. I'm going to skip the AD&D because that's pretty self-sufficient. I'm going to click on Veterans, Burial, and Will Clear. When I click on that, this document comes up. It's 17 pages. The first page is information. You read what's in the script that talks about uh, phone numbers and website. The very next page is where I start filling out the family information guide. Okay. Is so... It's at the end of that 17 pages. No, I, Shannon, are you on your computer or are you on your iPhone? Yes. No, I'm on my, I'm watching you on my okay. iPhone. So I'm on doing computer. it on my, I'm doing it on my computer. Like I have you, you pulled up. I'm just okay. trying to stay and it keeps giving me those little dots where it's loading. So I'm up, I got you now. Like I'm on page five. Yes, I've caught up now. I got All you. Right. It's just delayed or like it's thinking. I don't know what it's doing, but okay. Thank you. Yep. No worries. So now we come to the persons to be notified. So let's go back to the script on the veteran. And for the credit union folks, I'm going to get to that in just a second. But here we said the AD and D is only if it's a response card. We do that. Then we start on the burial and will kit. We do that. Then we go to the family information guide. We talk about this information. We're saying all these words, by the way, we have to read all of this. Okay. People to be notified, quote, this is where we are going to list the eight people that should be contacted when something happens to you. As you can see, they have us fill in three spots for your family, three spots for emergency contacts, and two spots for veterans to assist the family. So when something happens to you, who's going to be taking care of all your arrangements? We're right here when they say that, and we're filling all of this out on their behalf. So if there is a spouse over here, I'll just type in the word spouse, okay? If there is, they said I'm married or I have a significant other, so I'll say sig other, right? We filled that out right here, and then I saved it, and then I went over here. Should that significant other be the very first person that's listed here? Yes. No. The reason why is because what we're doing, in effect, is we're getting referrals right here. So I already got the referral, if I'm going to do that, over here. So the question I want to ask is, hey, if something happens to you, uh, Sade, and your husband, like you get in an accident, who's the very first person that should be contacted? So I already have her. I already have her husband. I'm now moving on to other people. Does that make sense? Okay. So in the script, I'm saying, boom, who's next family member? So I start to fill that out. Who's the main contact? I put in their name, last name, what the relationship is. I personally will put the phone number in the state. I don't care about the city and the zip personally. The reason that I don't put that in there for me is because I'll let them fill it out when they get it. But most importantly, to you as an agent, you don't care what city that that referral's in, but you do care about what state that that referral's in. Mary Frederick, why do I care about the state? And I'm testing your muting capability. <laughs> Because you know, the laws are all different in each state, taxation and everything else. The taxation, that, you said that with confidence. I like that. Well, everything's different in each state. So if they're another state, you can't sell it to them if you don't have a license in that state. Oh, okay, so that's the key. I want to know what state they're in because if I'm licensed in that state, I can call and sell. And if I'm not licensed in that state, I either get licensed or... Maybe I have someone else call and sell them insurance. And then we work a deal out where I can get some of that because I created the lead. Does that make sense to everybody? So yes. you want to know what state they're in so you know if you are the one that can call them. So I fill out significant other. I want to know if they have one, if the last name is the same, their phone number, the state. Again, you can fill out the city zip if you want to do that. Perfectly fine. I don't because I don't really care about it. But if you're filling this out on their behalf, they may want to know. So what I do is I say, okay, who's next? Who's next? When I'm starting to fill out this last one down here, I'm going to just use the word sample. When I'm starting to fill that out, I'm going to click this little plus button. And the reason I'm going to click that is because then the next one will show up. 
you don't, or rather, you are not limited to only three people in the family notification list. You can click as many as you want. The record is 128. <laughs> okay? And I wasn't me, by the way. <laughs> I'm not going to do 128, but you can see the power in that. If you get somebody who's a little bit older and they're like, yeah, I want to make sure everyone gets it, you can give all that information in there. Yes, Bridget, how can I help you? How many people do you need? Is it just supposed to be the three or do they, are they only able to have one or does it, does it really particularly matter on that part? So uh, that's actually a really good question, right? You want to get as many as you can get because each one of these become a plus lead for you that you can call on and potentially sell to, right? But we start off with three families, three emergency contacts and two veterans because that's what fits on the page, quite honestly. That's why we do it the way that we do it because that's how it fits. Does that make sense? So Yes, I just have one more question. So is that part only for like veterans that they know? Or is that just like a combination of people that they want on the contract, basically? So this has nothing to do with the contract or nothing to do with applications. And the first part is family notification list. So let's say I'm working with Tom and I'm saying, hey, Tom, if something happens to you and your wife, God forbid, in an accident, who do you want to, you know, what family member do you want to have contacted? And Tom is going to list his son, his daughter, maybe some other family members. I'm going to fill them all out. And then according to the script, I'm going to go down here to emergency contacts. And I'm going to say, Tom, outside of the family members that typically recommend, sorry, outside of the above family members, they typically recommend having additional emergency contacts, whether that's a close friend, neighbor, or coworker. So who's the closest person to you that is outside of your family? And then we start listing all the emergency contacts. Okay, and then we go down to service members. This has nothing to do with an application. We're not even even close to that. All we're doing is gathering information that's going to be in their family information guide that we will then download and give to them in an email. But more importantly, it's for us to gather all the potential plus leads. Does that answer your question, Bridget? Awesome. Zuri Reed, what can I do for you? Hey, it's related to um, Bridget's question, kind of. Um... So for all the people that are being listed and you're calling them leads, like if we're working on the veteran side of life insurance and, and everything else, um, can we sell to non-veterans? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm going to show you in the script and I'm going to tell you exactly why. We're just not there yet. Okay. Okay. Good question. Anthony, what can I do for you? Uh, yes. Um, so I my question. Um, oh, that's embarrassing. I'm sorry. That's all right. I'll keep moving on. All right. So we're going to fill all this stuff out. Every single time you get to the next to the last one, or, you know, you put, click the plus symbol because people, when they're watching, are more likely to give you more information to put in there if you're saying who's next. Don't ask, well, do you have any more? Or do you want to add anybody else? Because most people then say what? No. This is to your benefit. This is for you. This is going to help you. Okay, so you want to be assumptive in this process. So the same concept that we did up here, we're going to do down here. When I get down to this one and I'm going to put in a name, whatever it happens to be, before I finish all that, I'm going to click on the plus symbol so that the next one shows up. So when I'm done filling this out, I say who's next. And then I just keep going. When I'm done with all those, I go to the service members. Same concept. When they give me this one here, I add, you know, the name, whatever it happens to be. And then I'm going to click the plus symbol and I'm going to get another one. There's no limit to the number of uh, folks that you can put in this family information guide. And when this is saved as a PDF and sent to the client, all that information will be in there. Yes, Stephanie. Stephanie. Sorry, my mouse didn't want to go to the mute button. Um, so do we ask them if it's okay for us to reach out to those people or do we just end up reaching out to those people? I read the script. You read the script. So there's a place in the script that we talk about that, okay? Okay, I must have missed it. I apologize. I'll show you when we get there. No, there's no no worries. We'll get there. Anthony, do you remember your question or your hand's still up? No, I do. Um, so what if like their referral, well, I guess they're like technically referrals, right? Because maybe yes. talking about it. So what if they're referrals, because we're getting a lead batch from the same source, uh, how does that correlate with like 
their referral is also, uh, let's say Luke Barish's referral, because we have the we have the same, or are all of our, our leads exclusive and where I don't have, well, that's not even a lead. So where the referral, what if their referral is someone else's lead because they work for the same, they were on the same base or if they already have insurance. So we get that information, but they already have a policy with something else. That's my question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So if you're selling to a veteran, that is a lead that came from American income, only you have that veteran's lead. That's number one, right? So that lead is yours. No one else has a copy of that. When they give you the information in this page for additional leads, no one else has that but you. And when you save this, it gets downloaded into your lead pack. No one else has that. Okay. Now, when you call and set up the information with them, they're still your lead. And if it turns out they have a policy, they're not interested, or someone else already talked to them, then you just resolve the lead out of your lead pack. Okay. So there's no harm, no foul by getting all this stuff and putting it into your lead pack. All right. Perfect. So we've done this now. Let's look at the script on the veterans. We've gone through that. We have finished up to here. And now we're going to turn the page and talk about financial institution. So I'm going to turn the page. How do I do that? Up here at the top, I use the right arrow. That gets me here. I'm going to walk through the script that talks about financial institution, less will and testament, insurance policy, digital accounts, funeral instructions. All right. So there it all is in blue. If it's in yellow and red, that's directions to you. Okay, telling you exactly what to do if it's in yellow and red. The rest of it, you're reading. Okay, so you're reading all of this. Then you get to insurance policies. Did you convert your SGLI to VGLI? Do you have your insur private insurance? If you if they have private insurance, you say, how much do you have in place? And you are assumptive in asking if it's 5, 10, or 20 year term. Social media, funeral service requests. When you get to funeral service request, which is right here, right? You're going to say, the final page here is all about your funeral service request. Let me ask you, were you planning or being, uh, sorry, planning on being buried in one of the state or national cemeteries where you're leaning towards cremation? The answer that they're going to give you when you click right here is what you're going to fill out, either burial, cremation, or mausoleum. Let's say it's going to be cremation. And that's the only thing. There's no other gray areas, so you don't have to fill anything else out. You're going to um, hit the floppy disk. Now, as you can see, there's a spot for the National Cemetery of Private. They set up a permanent benefit for you that have me covered. Sorry, they set up a permanent benefit for you that they have me covered called the freedom of choice. And then you display the freedom of choice. The way you do that is you click right there. That is the freedom of choice. When I click on that, this little screen pops up. And what I want you to do is just scroll down so that your name is right there. Okay, so I can see it's personal. Hey, you're doing it. It's your name on this freedom of choice certificate. And then you're going to read the script. The VSL set this up so you can leave a legacy behind for your family instead of a liability. It takes care of. And then as you can see, there's all that makes sense so far. Okay. And then the next thing is you close that by clicking anywhere. And you're going to go up here and you're going to click to the right to get to page eight, which is the last will and testament. So let's take a pause for just a second and understand what we're doing here. We went all the way from A1 through A5. We are right here at the no cost legal will kit. One of the things that all of you in the veteran market are required to do is send me a video of yourself doing this entire presentation from A1 through A5. And you're required to send it to me by Saturday night. Okay, you're going to record yourself. You can do a role play with somebody, which is totally fine, whether it's a classmate, family, friend, whatever, or maybe your upline, or you can just do it yourself, but you need to do it as a role play and you need to follow the script exactly all the way through. If you're in the credit union, you're going to do exactly the same thing, except I'll show you where I want you to end on the credit union side when I go through that with you. So the homework that's going to be due by Saturday night is a recording of you doing this presentation from A1 through A5 as if it's a role play, as if you're talking to an actual client. What I'm expecting you to do is you're going to go through the entire presentation and you're going to fill in this page with at least three family notifications, three emergency contacts, and two service members. Okay. When you do that, 
and you go through and you fill all this stuff out, the next thing that you have to do when you're at this part of the presentation is you're going to click on that little button right there with the down arrow. When I click on that, you get these rotating symbols because what the system is now doing is taking all that information that you put into the family information guide and making or compiling or creating as you were a PDF file. When you were doing this with an actual client, this PDF file is what you, one of the things you need to email the client upon completion of your presentation. Okay. So here it is, it looks like this. And let's make sure it's what I actually did. So it shows you all this good stuff. It's what you're emailing, same thing you see. And you see where I type spouse or significant other. I typed in John, there's my name. And I think that I, there I did samples. So you can see this is the one I just actually did with you and it's now on my hard drive. You, and it's called Veterans Barrel and Will Kit Samuel. It says two, because I've done this twice. You would probably rename that to the client's name because you will be required to send it to them upon completion. Yes, Kaylee Hobbs, how can I help you? Okay, so I use um, a program through my internet browser to record. Should I also record my screen? So it, it shows um, like you what I would record. actually do? Absolutely, I gotta be able to see what you did and when you did it. Okay, and then at the end, am I, we're sending you the whole final thing as an email, like you're the client? Yes, well, no, you're sent, yes. But you, I will tell you what to do, but ahead of time, yeah, you have to send me the recording of yourself doing the presentation, and you need to send me the fully populated uh, Burial and Will Kit PDF. The one Got I just it. downloaded, you need to send that to me as well. By Saturday, I don't care what time you send it to me on Saturday, I start looking at them Sunday morning. Yes, Perfect. Ruth, what can I do for you? Hi, thank you. Um, so I just... Um... Specifically pertaining to me, my uh, Ari, my trainer, had me um, review a different script, and he told me not to worry about the veteran one. I just don't want to go against what you're instructing. What script Can... did he give you? He gave me his own personal script, so I've been studying this one and is memorizing this one. Is it for the veteran, or is it for POS? or Just for a union, I believe. Okay, it's union. for um, <laughs> contacting people that are already signed on with us. Yeah, so that's a POS script. So that's completely different, which is fine. But you're still, what I want you to do is you need to do this so that you're qualified for veteran leads. Okay. Okay, so yes. What you're going to do with Ari is fine because he's, you know, that's great. But I want to make sure you're qualified. So at any point in time, if you need to do veteran leads in the future, you don't have to wait. Does that make sense? You mm -hmm. will always, already be qualified. Thank Humphrey you. Singh, what can I do for you? Uh, can you go back real quick and just show me where uh, you made the PDF file real quick? Um, yes. Yeah. So up here in the upper right-hand corner, when I'm showing the, uh, what is this? The, uh, the veteran uh, okay. roll kit, 17 uh -huh. page, right there is what oh, you would. Give me one second. Okay. Yeah. I'll download it basically. Okay. And then uh, second question was, uh, would we be able to do this with you today? Like you said, we have two hours with you after class. Yeah, yeah of course. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Are you asking me if you can do the homework that's due by Saturday night today? Yeah. No. Oh, no. Okay. That's what I is You need to practice the script because none of you are ready to do this live real time. Okay. You, would, okay? you have to practice the script. I like the fact that you want to get it done. Yeah, I just want to get out of the way. But okay. You got to you gotta spend time practicing either on your own or with your upline or with your classmates. Yes, Nick, how can I help you? Uh, what is the best way to uh, record this um, and uh, the format and everything that you'll need it in? Yeah, the easiest way is just to do it through Zoom. Okay. Just record yourself in Zoom. And then sometimes because it's so large, what I usually advise people to do is save the file to your Google Drive, because most of you have a Gmail, so you have a Google Drive. You could do that, or you could actually leave it on Zoom and give me access to it, and it will tell me what the link is, and it will give me a password, so that way I can get into it. Either way is fine with me. I just got to be able to see it Sunday morning at 8 a.m., my time. So just uh, say, if I save it to the Google Drive, then uh, just uh, share, share it with yep. you. Yeah. Share it with me. Gotcha. Okay. 
Uh, Nick, okay, so we're good. All right, so we've gone through that. Now, this is the last will and testament. You're going to go through these pages here. So we're looking now at here in the terms of the veteran script. And for the credit union people, I will get to you in just a second, okay? So we're walking through all of this. We're saying all these words. We're turning all these pages. In the credit union script, I believe I put this to be exactly the same way. You're walking through all this information. Now, where it starts to deviate is that the credit, well, it's deviated in the beginning, but uh, we talk about three facts about your VA burial benefits. You don't do that in the credit union script. So after I get through all of this, on the very last page of this document, I love how computers are sometimes a little slow. This is where we talk about the three important facts. All right, so this is really important in terms of following the script. The next thing you want to do is update you on the three important facts. Now, if you don't know if you know this, but over 1,700 veterans pass away every single day. And generally, there's little to no veteran benefits for funerals or cremations. And then we go through all of this. So we're reading all of this. Our camera's off. We can just have a conversation with them. You can use your words. You don't have to read it exact. I don't want you to sound wooden. But you're going through this information that's on this page. Okay. I get through all of this, and then it says download burial and will kit. So if you're with a client, that's at this point where you're going to click on this and save it. You can even tell them, hey, I'm going to save this for you because I'm going to email it to you at the end. Okay. For your homework, you can do it anytime you want, but you only need to do the script up until A5, right? I don't need to see the rest of it because you're basically reading and all of you, I'm pretty confident, can read. But I need to make sure that you're following the script and that you can fill out the family information guide appropriately. Now, I forget who it was that was asking me about what we do with the referrals and how we let them know, et cetera, et cetera. Let me make this a little bit bigger. In the veteran script, we say... The veteran service group found only one in 200 veterans are aware of the program. They're trying to educate them all. So we're stating the problem, right? The problem is not everybody knows about this program. And then we say, especially with 1,700 veterans dying every single day, that's over 50,000 families looking for these benefits each month. Now, the VSOs know they can't reach every single veteran. So what they ask us to do is sponsor any veteran you know so we can go over these things with them. The VSOs have found that the veterans can provide 10 others. You've already given me two so who's next? And then it's telling you to pull up the sponsorships and enter all the veterans. So what happens is you're done with this. You're going to go down here to the sponsorship program. Remember, I showed you what that looked like. And now that's going to pop up. And what it will do is it will show whoever I put in the family information guide will show up here, except they'll be grayed out. Okay. Very important. So right here at the script, it says everyone you mentioned in the family information guide will automatically receive access to the veteran legacy benefits we just covered. And they also have access to the permanent benefits that we'll discuss in a minute. At that point, I'm being assumptive. As I'm saying that paragraph, everyone you mentioned in the family information guide, I'm clicking on the word activate. Because when I do that, or rather until I do that, the total gifted amount is zero. They're watching you do that. So when I say everyone that you put in the family information guide, and then I start clicking this, they're going to see that that number starts to go up. Now, if you were trying to sell to me, and you said that, hey, based on the fact that you added these people from the family guide, each one of them is going to get a $2,000 accidental death and dismemberment certificate, I'm probably going to feel pretty good about that. I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. You're giving stuff away. You're gifting stuff. I'm giving stuff away. And, I'm being, and as an agent, I'm being assumptive and letting you know that you're gifting that. I'm feeling better about the fact that the information I provided to you is actually going to result in somebody getting something of tangible benefit. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so right at this paragraph here, everyone you mentioned, yada, yada, that's when you're going to click on each one of these. And then it says, aside from the veterans you provided, the VSOs have authorized you to extend your benefits to those closest to you, even if they didn't serve. So if I'm talking to Bob Johnson, I say, even if they didn't serve, I'm going to click on this plus button and I'm going to say, okay, Bob, who do you got? And Bob's going to say, you know what? Uh, let me get my neighbor, John Smith. And I'm going to say, okay, John Smith, I'm going to type that. And he still lives in the same city you do, right, Bob? Perfect. In California. What's his phone number? I'm going to get that. Five, 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 five. Okay. And the relationship is he's a neighbor. I can type in neighbor. 
and it will pop up. I click on neighbor, then it's going to go to occupation. You can put that in if you want, and you can put in the significant other if you want. Here's the key, though. When you're here, this information up here has to be filled in. If you were adding another service member, you're going to click on whatever branch that they were in. To the left, this is the type of lead that it is. So in this case, it was a neighbor. He will not be a sponsored veteran referral. He will be a veteran family referral. So there's only two different types when you're adding in referrals for the veteran market. They're either going to be sponsored veterans or family referrals. In this case, he's a neighbor, so I'm going to pick family referral. This other one down here is for training purposes only. You wouldn't use that. Okay, so I'm going to put that in there. He's not a branch of service. I'm going to give him everything. If I wanted to, I can add a note. I can say, uh, what's this guy named? John uh, will be very, well, I can't type, but you can type in whatever you want, but very interested in, you know, 50K coverage. Let's just say based on what I was selling to Tom, right? Say John's going to do that. And I saved that. That note's going to be available for me when it gets downloaded into my lead pack, okay? So then uh, I'm not going to add occupation. He doesn't have a wife, but if he did or a spouse or another, I would type it in right there, okay? So the script is saying, okay, cool. I can start adding that. Lastly, because we don't solicit veterans and their families, the VSOs require your permission to contact them so they can receive access to the same benefits. Did I ask them if it's okay for me to contact them? Anybody? No, I did not ask them if it's okay for me to contact. What am I doing? I'm assuming that I can contact. By saying those words, if they say, hey, I don't want you to contact somebody, then when I'm here, I can delete them or I can no longer activate them. Hey, I don't want you to call Sam. Okay, boom, I can do that. He gets grayed out. He's not gonna be contacted because he won't be added to my lead pack because he's not active. But all of these people will be because they're, the client is giving them to me and I'm letting them know with that paragraph that I'm gonna contact them. So other than the people listening to your family information guide, who do you wanna extend these to next? And I'm gonna fill all that stuff in. And when you're doing this live with an actual client, you can say now, hey, uh, Tom, out of those people, who are the two most important that we need to get the benefits out to first? And then you're going to do a little thing like that. That means that those are the priority. They're the top two. And when you have these leads drop into your lead pack, you'll see that they will be starred, which means that you wanted them to be at the top of the list. So just prioritize. If you get 12 people, who are the top two people I want to talk to? It just helps you prioritize. Yes, Martin, how can I help you? So for the sponsorship program, for the referrals, when we go to call them, do we go through the script with them if they're not a veteran? Or how do we start our... Yeah, I'll show you how to do that when we talk about veterans. Okay. Yeah, we'll definitely get there. Harpreet, did you have another question or is your hand still up? Okay, hand down. Awesome. So we're here. We've added the additional sponsors. We've favorited those referrals, and we can now send a referral text. You can't do that from here because it's in the training mode. But if this was an actual client, you could send a text directly to them. Or you can send it from your phone, however you want to do it. Okay? Now we're down to the transition to the read-off letter. Okay? So let me... Go, so we've done all that. Sorry, we're here. Let's say we're completely done. I'm finished. I'm not, I've added 6,000 that I'm gifting. That means there's three people. Let's go ahead and add this person back in. That's 8,000. It means I have four people here because when you provide this to the referrals, they automatically will get a $2,000 accidental death and dismemberment certificate. For each one, they get 2,000. That's how you end up with 8,000 total gifted. Okay. Up here will be the name of the client that you're talking to. First name, last name their uh, affiliation, their phone number, their email, and the date that you're actually doing this. If it's blank because you're starting with somebody brand new, you can just fill the information out directly. Like if you went into this tool without doing a presentation and you had some people that you wanted to contact that were interested in insurance, you could put all that information in here and then uh, save it and it will be added into your lead pack so that you can work it later. 
when you are done with all of this, you're going to click that little floppy disk down here. When you click on that floppy disk, all of this information that is for those folks on the family information guide that are activate and for everybody else on there, those leads will drop right into your lead pack automatically. It's done within seconds. Abram Mo, did you have a question? Uh, I did. I was, it was just, uh, I was wondering how the, I didn't know what the gifted things were. You said that it's $2,000 in accidental and dismember, accidental death and dismemberment certificate. Yes. So let me show you exactly what it is. Again, remember, once you fill all this stuff out, you're going to click the floppy disk and it'll be downloaded directly in your lead pack. If you want to know what they're going to get, you can click on this and this tells you and it tells the client what they're going to receive. A burial will kit for veterans and their families. Now, granted, some of these folks are not going to be veterans. So they wouldn't necessarily care about this, but or at least they won't care about the three important facts, but the family information guide will be in there and they all get that. Does that make sense? So they're gonna get that as the first document. They're gonna get this gift certificate for the $2,000 accidental death and dismemberment policy, and they all will get the no cost last will and testament. Okay, gotcha. Thank so you. that's where the $2,000 comes from every single time you add somebody. Martin, do you have a question for me? No, sorry, I just forgot to raise my hand from the last one. Okay, no worries. So we're here in the credit union. Credit union is going to be a little bit different for folks, right? So let's go to the credit union script. And in here, the first thing we do is, hey, why are we meeting on Zoom? We'll make this a little bit bigger. Why are we meeting on Zoom? Then it's going to say, well, let's go through the survey, right? And move on to the question. So you did the letter here. You walk through page one only that regardless of what market you're in, you're only showing page one because we will show page two at a later date or a later time in the presentation. Now I go to the member survey. When I click on the member survey, you got to read the text as it's in there and you're going to fill all this information out. Okay. All this information is going to get filled out and then you're going to save it and then you're going to submit the survey once you're completely done. So all of this has to be filled out. We don't have to do this in the veteran market, right? So that was the credit union member survey, the very first one. The next one is going to be the financial information guide as opposed to the family information guide. So, um, so actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. If you follow the script, you do the ad and certificate, very similar to the way you did it with the veteran. You also are going to do the AIL Plus card. So let me close this real quick. The AIL Plus card is the AIL Plus program. You're going to click on that, and then that will be displayed for the client, and you're going to walk through the text on the credit union script that talks about the AIL Plus card. Then when you're done with the AIL Plus card, you're going to go here to the family information guide. Sorry, the financial information guide. I wish they had changed that name, but it is what it is. When you click on that, <clears throat> concept is still the same. There's 18 pages, but it looks different than what the family information guide was for the veteran market. You're going to click on this, and then you're going to walk through this information according to the script. And then here, this looks very similar. The difference is there's no veteran information over here on the right-hand side. If they're a veteran, you can add that over here for which branch they're in, but we're not requiring you to obtain veteran referrals, right? Because the problem is different. The VSOs want to get all their information out to many veterans possible. That's why we ask for veteran referrals, okay? So here you've got four and you've got five. So we're expecting to get nine. And again, if you click on this pen right here, you can add more into each one. There's no limit on the, many, on the amount that you get. So you go through the family information guide, you walk through and read through all that stuff. You get to the no cost illegal will kit, which is exactly the same as it is on the uh, veterans script. Here, the sponsorship is a little bit different, obviously, because there's no veterans to add. So it's similar. It just doesn't include any veteran. And it tells you how to text the plus leads. And now we're here to the transition read off letter. For those of you in the credit union market, I want you to record yourself right up until the family, I'm sorry, the financial information guide is filled out in entirety. And then I want you to send it to me. So same concept as a veteran, except you're going up through A8, not beyond AA for the recording. All right. So now we are at the transition to the read-off letter, which is where we're at. 
uh, sorry, where we're at right here, a transition to the readoff letter. The language is going to be a little bit different, but conceptually it's the same. What's happening is we need to actually transition from the no cost benefits that we're providing into the pitch for the paid benefits. Okay. Because there's that point, I need to have the readoff letter. The readoff letter is going to be right here. Do I display on the group letter? And it's on page two, okay? I do not want you to read this letter. We used to do that. We'd read every letter. But what we found is that every single uh, association, whether it was a credit union, whether it was a VSO, exactly. modifies the letter slightly. So what we did is we said, okay, regardless of what... I'm sorry? Uh participants let's mute everybody okay unless you have a question for me mute everybody okay so here we want to read this letter if it's a response card in the veteran you're going to show the group letter and do page two if it's a pavet which is an internet lead you're going to type in what i showed you which is the sgmad and share only page two and then you're going to read this exactly the way that it's written if you read it exactly the way it's written, it doesn't matter what uh, is here because we're going to be okay. Our lawyers have told us that the language is going to be fine. So you don't need to read this. You need to read, uh, why is this thing go faster? You need to read that paragraph I highlighted right there. If you're in the credit union, same concept, except you're reading what this says. Okay. So we read that to people. And it's a bunch of mumbo jumbo, right? The insurance program you offer today are made possible through the voluntary cooperation of the Seattle Credit Union and American Income Life. These coverages are supplemental and that blah, 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 blah. So then we go, okay, that's great. Now we say, now what all this is saying. <laughs> so we cover ourselves and you cover the client with the legalese. And now you're going to back up and go, okay, what this is saying is this. And then you summarize it, right? So that's the credit union on the veteran Ah, I keep, let me close that. So I don't need that anymore. On the veteran presentation, it looks like this. Now, what all this saying is that for show you the benefits, explain how they work, and answer questions that you have, blah, 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 right? Sade, what can I do for you? So I'm so sorry, but how did you get to the read off letter? Yeah, so in the uh, presentation here, after I'm done, when I'm in the credit union, so if I go back to the veteran, if I'm here and I finish the veteran burial and will kit and I'm in the read off letter, I'm going to click on display for the group letter right here. And when it comes up, I'm going to go and show them page two. Remember, in the beginning, I did not show them page two. Here, I will show them page two. Gotcha. OK, thank you. Absolutely. All right. So. Transition to the need off letter, transition to the needs analysis. So I did that for the veteran and I do that for the credit union. Okay. So credit union, the transition is a little bit longer than the veteran because the veteran is pretty straightforward. Now we're into the qualification, which is very similar. Hey, just because you're a veteran does not mean you automatically qualify or you can enroll the benefits, you still have to qualify. So it does not automatically mean you can enroll you need to qualify. If you're too high a risk, they can't let you in. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions first. Why do we do that, Kaylee Hobbs? I don't know. I was checking a text. I'm sorry. Elizabeth Pileski, why do we do that? Why do I say just because you're a veteran does not mean you automatically can enroll in the benefits? Uh, well, we have to qualify them based on their age, health, and habits. Right, so, but why? Why am I saying that to them? So they don't build one for legal reasons. So they not for legal not reasons. Not for legal. But could it possibly be because they weren't honorably discharged? No. Okay. No. No one wants to join a club that they can automatically get in. Bingo. Who said that? Bob Johnson. Way to go, Bob. That's exactly right. We are giving and we are taking away. Psychologically, even if I'm not inclined to buy, sorry, I'm not inclined to buy, 
and Bob is talking to me, if he says, hey, just because you're a member of the Seattle Credit Union doesn't mean you're automatically allowed to enroll, the first thing psychologically, maybe not in my front of my brain, but in my emotional part of my brain, I'm going to think, well, why wouldn't I qualify? Right? We know psychologically that if you can get people to think that way, whether they realize it or not, they're more inclined to buy. That's what the statistics tell us. No one wants to be excluded from a group. I mean, a group you want to be part of, right? There are some groups I don't want to be part of. But for the most part, we do that because we want to give it to you, and then we're going to take it away. If you notice through this script, we do that a lot. If you notice through this class, I do that to all of you a lot. I will give it, and I will take it away. Because then that makes you want it more, whether you realize it or not. So then I say, okay, it doesn't mean you're automatically to You have to qualify for two high risk. They can't let you in. So they have me ask a couple of questions to make sure. Hey, you still have to qualify for two high risk. They can't let you in. So I just have a couple of questions first. So that's the veteran. That's the credit union. Exactly the same thing. Then you're going to click on the needs analysis and you're going to ask the health questions. So down here at the bottom, needs analysis is right there. Is everybody tracking with me so far? Um, you know, I shouldn't do that. Sandra Taylor, are you tracking with me so far? Sorry, shortcut didn't work. Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. So now we've done that. We know where we're at in the script, whether it's the uh, credit union script or whether it's the veteran script, we know we're right here. I'm going to click on that little thing right there. That is the needs analysis screen. So on the credit union, I'm sorry, on the veteran, it looks like that. And on the credit union, it looks like that. So let me see. Wow, that looks really similar, doesn't it? So it doesn't really matter what market you're in. Almost kind of. Is it exactly the same? Looks like the same to me. Yep. All right. So when you're on this screen, let's go back to the veterans. I fill this out. When you're on this screen, the very first thing are the four questions. If you're under the age of 60, then you're going to do the super combo. If I have a spouse, which I'm going to say I do not, I don't need to fill in the spouse, but I need to fill in for me. Do you take any prescription medications? Yes or no. Have you had any health issues in your lifetime? Yes or no. Do you smoke uh, or do you use tobacco or marijuana in any form? Yes or no. And have you had any arrests, including DUI? Yes or no. For the sake of argument, I'm going to put no's in here. This is nothing to do with actually qualifying a client in terms of what you're going to sell them. All this is doing is letting you know as soon as possible in the process if somebody may not qualify. So if somebody says, I take prescription medications, oh, what do you take it for? Well, I have congestive heart failure, so I take nitroglycerin. Okay, so that person's probably not gonna qualify. And then you're gonna pivot and do something different. Later, you're still gonna do and fill in all this information, but we wanna know ahead of time, right? And then you can add a note. So in this case, it says uh, takes nitroglycerin for congestive heart failure, right? And I can save that. That doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go to them. It doesn't go to, to you. That's just a note for you to refer back to. That's all it's for. This is a preliminary screening to see if anything needs to be brought to my attention in terms of this person not qualifying, okay? Now I need to fill all this stuff out. If your lead had a birthday associated with it, or you filled out the financial information guide or the family information guide, depending upon what market you're in, you're going to have the birthday. Then you're going to have the occupation. Let's say that I'm in sales. Let's say that I'm a male and I don't have a spouse. There's my uh, email address my phone number, and my zip code. Do I have any dependent children on the age of 18? By the way, you have to answer all these questions with them, okay? I'm going to say, no, don't have any children. Do you have any life insurance through work? Whatever they tell you is what you're going to put in here. Remember, it, it doesn't hurt us if somebody already has life insurance. Because if they do, then I'm going to spend it. And you're going to hear me say that a few more times. If they have life insurance already, I'm going to figure out a way to spend it. But in this case, for example purposes, I'm going to say they don't have any. So I'm going to say no, no for everybody, okay? Then do you have any life insurance outside of work? Oh, well, I have a $10,000 uh, policy with, I don't know, Gerber. I got it when I was, you know, 10 years old, it's a term life policy. But I have nothing here, nothing here, nothing here, okay? Doesn't hurt us. We want to know what it is. Okay, we got a coverage here. Yes, 
Dalabor. Dalabor, your hand is raised. Dalabor, I cannot hear you. And now your hand's not raised. Okay, do you rent or own your home? You're going to put own, rent, and how much? So let's say I don't own my home. I rent, and I'm paying $2,500 a month for it. Oh, $2,500. <laughs> if I own, what's the mortgage balance? Because I didn't click own, that's grayed out. But if I had said own, and my thing is $2,500, we want to know what the mortgage balance is. Let's say it's $180,000. Hey, did you get an interest rate low? Did your just refis below five? Whatever number you put in here is fine. It This isn't going to be a detractor other, it, sorry, this is informative for you to understand your client's kind of financial situation. It has no bearing on the amount of insurance or the type of coverage that they're going to get. Okay. Purely for you. So I'm going to say interest rate was 2.5% and they've got, uh, I've got 24 years remaining. Do you have insurance to pay off your home in case of death? So right now we know the answer is no, because I only had 10,000. I certainly don't have 180,000 of insurance anywhere, but maybe it's in the mortgage. So you need to ask that. Hey, do you pay something besides your mortgage to your mortgage lender that covers you in the event of your death to pay off your home? Oh, you do not? Okay, no problem. So we put no. If I had put yes, then we want to know how much it covers. If I don't own a home, then you put in A. So in this case, I'm going to put no. Have you provided for your children through college education? I already know I don't have any children, right? So I said no, so that becomes no or not applicable. Are you retired? Should ask that. I'm in sales, but are you retired? No, I'm not retired. We capture this data for our purposes only, okay? Now, here <clears throat> is the income. So how much do you make on an hourly basis, Sam? They ask us that. Remember, you're showing the client this, so it's nothing that you're just asking out of the ordinary. You're asking because uh, that's what they want you to ask. Nothing for the spouse. Now you can add expenses per month or not. It's up to you. But remember, I used my first one. I said $3,000, okay? So I've added all this. Now I'm at the analysis approach. If I did exact, sorry, if I did exact same thing in the credit union, my analysis approach would be the hour power philosophy. And in the veteran market, it's the dollar a day. Everybody tracking with me so far. So I filled all this information out on the veteran. I don't have a spouse. All that is in there. According to the script, I'm going to fill all that out. And then I'm going to say, after completing the needs analysis, I'm going to hit the share button on my Zoom toolbar while completing a program in HB Pro. And then it tells you if they're single, you're going to build a program like this. If it's... Uh, a family or a couple, then you're going to do seven, five, and three. The key thing is to know the middle number. That's where you're going to start. Okay. So this gets really tricky here. Everybody needs to pay attention. Okay. Because you all are going to have to do this, regardless of who you are. So you're right here. You've done this. We're using the vet first. There's the dollar a day approach. You're going to pause your screen. What you will probably do is ask Sam, hey, can you go through each line and confirm all this information for me to make sure I got it correct? The reason you're going to do that is you need to buy yourself a little bit of time because this is what you now have to do that they can't see. You're going to pause your screen. You're going to come down here to the plan generator. The plan generator is going to come up and it's going to look like this. The first thing you're going to do, because it's only Sam, you're going to say triple individual you're going to go and allocate remaining. You're going to allocate that. You're going to click finish. That all looks good. You're going to go to, a, uh, sorry, not additional products. You're going to go to plan options. You're going to change the name of the first plan to bronze. You're going to change the second plan to, uh, sorry, I'm doing this incorrect. You're going to change the first one to silver. You're going to change the second one to gold. And you're going to change the third one to bronze. And you're going to click those little check marks and then it shows up over here. So then you're going to make sure the silver's still okay. Silver shows up all in green, triple, everything looks good. The gold, same thing, because all it did is copy this from over here. The first thing you do is you're going to change this to a higher number. Okay, so the gold we're going to put at $8 a day. And we'll just say that's what the, sorry, hold on. 
I'll say it. The silver, when we started, the first thing I should have done was change this to what? According to the script, a single person should start at what number, Elizabeth Bolesky? According to the script in the veteran, what's the number I should start at in the middle? According to the script. Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button. Uh, $6. $6 a day, right? So the first thing I should have done, and I was going too fast, I started at six. Then the next thing I do is I change that to triple. Then I'm going to allocate the remaining, and it will then adjust everything. So all these numbers that are in red will now be zeros. And now I know I have $182.50. Then I'm going to create the additional plan options at gold and silver. They'll show up. I go to the gold. I want you to move that number on the gold plan to 10. And then I want you to take that and move it to quintuple. So that 871 product, I want it to be a quintuple. Once you do that, you're going to go to allocate remaining. You're going to click on that and you're going to say allocate and then finish. And so that plan should now be $304.17. Then you're going to go to the bronze plan and you're going to change the bronze to a lower number. So we start at six, we'll go to three. That's perfectly fine. And three is at 91.25. You would actually change this down to a double individual. You go to allocate remaining. You click on that thing here, hit allocate, hit finish. And now it's done. You're then going to click on the silver plan so that the green shows up on the silver plan. And the whole time you're doing that, you're reading this section because you're going to get that done in about 30 seconds. Yep. So it literally, I'm telling you, at, once you get used to doing this, you'll get that done in 30 seconds. It is not that difficult because think about what we're doing. We're establishing a budget for the client because we've never asked the client how much money they want to spend or anything like that. As a matter of fact, in the veteran market, even in the credit union market, we make recommendations, not even us. The market's making recommendations, right? The VSOs recommend that you start at X. Anywhere from one to $10, we're going to start at five and we'll go from there for a married couple, right? So that's actually what's happening is you're the one creating it. So you've now created it. Your screen was paused. So the only thing they saw was the needs analysis screen. So then you click on silver, make sure that that's one that's being displayed. If it is, you're good to go. Then you're gonna come down here and you're gonna click on present plan. And this screen will come up and now, according to the script, you've gone through all that. And now you're going to click on present plan, rather. Click on resume share. And then you're going to go through the final expense protection. And you're going to read all of this. The biggest concern they have when you die, traditionally, these three ways. And they're looking at this screen while you're talking. And it's blank, right? You're going through all that. And then you're going to click on the freedom of choice. So you can click on that word right there. It's actually, not on that. You're going to click on the freedom of choice. And remember, we already showed this in the veteran script, right? The freedom of choice is exactly the same thing. We're reiterating it now, right? According to the script, if you qualify this the certificate that you receive, all your family has to do is take this into the funeral home. And now we're going to show the allocated amount, right? And then we're going to go through here. So now once I'm done with that, I'm going to click off of that. The script says now what they've allocated for you is, and you're going to hit the down arrow. In the veteran market, we start with this information. In the credit union market, we start with this information. Okay, so sticking with the veteran market, we're gonna go through what they've allocated for you is for any cause of death, $33,519. If you die in an accident of any kind, we're gonna add an additional $30,000 of payout to your beneficiary. If you happen to die in an auto accident, which is the number one cause of accidents for people in the United States, we'll add an additional 60,000. And if you die on a common carrier, which is any mode of public transportation with a schedule, we will pay out an additional $90,000 to the $33,000 for your beneficiary, right? Accidental protection. Now it's going to say, hey, if you've done any type of, well, actually, sorry, accidental protection, that's going to be the ones I just went through right here. The hospital accidental benefits, they weren't really concerned about your medical bills because veterans really have or have really good health insurance typically go to the VA. They're just concerned about lost income. So number one, if you get hurt, boom, $150, right? If you have to spend the night in the hospital, you get $300. <clears throat> and if you have to go to the intensive care unit, 
we pay double the data hospital benefit for up to 14 days, right? And the script then says emergency room, hospital stay, intensive care. These benefits will cover you for the rest of your life starting today or anywhere in the world. The benefits run out, never run out, no matter how many times you use them. No matter how many times you use them, the benefit does not run out. Then you say, does that make sense? Then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to click on protections and writers. And this thing is going to come up. And then you're going to talk about the text that says there. Everything you see on the screen was, protected, was created to protect you since these benefits are veterans, they're permanent. They build up cash value and paid up benefits. Now, you could click on this and it will give you an example of how cash value accumulates through the years. Most of your uplines do not want you to click on that. And the reason why is if you click on that and you're selling to me, I'm going to say, hey, uh, so you told me that I was going to get, uh, you know, $33,000 if I died. How does that work relative to what you showed me here on this screen? Because that doesn't seem to add up to $33,000. So your upline will not want you to show this. All they want you to do is talk to this screen right here. Cash value paid up benefits. Now they will want you to show the term illness writer. Pays half of the face amount, less half of the loan on the insured when their uh, physician certifies that they're expected to live less than 12 months. You can show them that because that 16,759 is half of 33,519. Yes, Mark, what can I do for you? Well, I have a question uh, about, I didn't understand when you changed, say from a gold plan to a silver or a, or a bronze, um, you were changing like from a triple individual. I'm going to come back to that, Mark, if that's okay, because I'm going to break down what I did. Right now, I'm just okay. showing you flow. Okay. I'm going to explain that because that gets, yeah, you definitely need to understand how that works, but just give me a couple of minutes. Thank you. So we're right here. Yeah, absolutely. So we're right here in the script. We've done all that. We've added the, uh, or we talked about protections and writers. And now, according to the script, we're going to finalize the presentation. And then again, we ask, has anyone ever gone over the VSO benefits with you? If we're in the credit union, we do the same thing. And the words may be different, but we're following the same philosophy. Even though your enrollment started a while ago, when you fill out your car, they can't go back and cover you for younger rates. Now, when you're qualified and enrolled, again, I'm giving and taking away, right? I let you know it's going to come out once a month. It's not like a paycheck deduction that comes out every two weeks. It's going to be once a month. And then I say, hey, let's face it, uh, we're all going to pass away to something uh, we have no control over, so it typically comes down to you. And then we're saying the most important question they have me ask if something happens to both of you, like a car, bad car accident, who's going to be the beneficiary? We click right there, and the beneficiary will come up. And let's say it's going to be Jill, okay? So when that comes to family for funeral fund expenses, who do you want that money to go to? Jill, Okay. Then we say fitting their budget. Now, the next question they ask me is what's going to fit your budget the best? Because it doesn't matter to the VSO, which program you or any veteran try to qualify for. My job is to customize the benefits to fit your needs. Press benefit summary button. So now I'm going to press that right there. When I click on that, remember I built those three plans. Now they're showing up on this screen. So according to this, they just need to know what you want to do. And we're now asking the closing question. They just need to know that, did you want to be like most veterans and go with what they're recommending? Because that's the whole pitch in the veteran market is that it's recommended by the VSOs. That's the plan I showed you, setting aside $6 a day or about $182.50 a month. Some veterans get super excited and ask if they can set aside more. That's going to be our enhanced program, which is the gold program. Okay, then that's contributing $10 a day or just $304.17 a month. And as you can see, you get a lot more coverage for a bit of more contributions. You can show them this. There's the gold plan, 250, 500, 1,000, 64, and so on and so forth, whereas the silver plan was here. Okay, then it says, and that right there is the final closing question. Do you want to do like most of the veterans do and go with the recommended program, or do you want to try to qualify for the enhanced program? 
that is the end of the sales pitch in terms of you providing information to the client. Everything after that is you either down closing, overcoming objections, or processing an application. Okay. So here's where you're at. You're talking about these two. Now I did build a th third one over here. We'll talk about why later, but what I'm trying to do is get the client to see the value in this one, as opposed to the value in this one and picking one of those. If the client tells me, well, we'll talk about that later about which one they'll pick. So let's go back now and figure out how did I build these? Because regardless of what market you're in, building the program remains the same concept. Yes, Anthony, how can I help you? Uh, so I'm just confused. Um, what part do we do the like power of the hour where we show job A and job B, which do job would you choose? Because that's kind of how I was recruited on. When do I do, do that? Not, you do not do that in the veteran market. In the credit union market, we use the hour oh. power. In the union market, we use the hour power. But if you're working in the veteran market, at no point in this script does it ever talk about the hour power. Right, and that's what I was recruited on, was that power of the yeah, hour. Now you're in the veteran, but now you're in the veteran market, so you need to follow this script, okay? okay? It's not a bad thing. It's just a different market you're working in. At some point, you can work in the union market, but I think, I'm sorry, who was it? Was it, who, who told me they were working for Ari and they had a different script? Me. Ruth, that's a much more involved script in a different market completely different. It's called the hard card. And that's for uh, selling to somebody who's a union member, as opposed to the POS market where that's somebody who already has a policy with us. So Anthony, for you, you're learning the veteran market so you can be qualified to receive those veteran leads. It's actually right. easy to sell in this market. Okay. No, I get that. It was just like my uh, RGA who recruited me, Ashley. I mean, she literally presented me the other, I guess the credit union, I was told I was gonna present that to veterans. So I'm just I'm just a little confused because that's kind of what I was prepping for. And then now- So you have the, are you saying the credit union? No, I'm saying when I was recruited, right? Yeah. I was told, they gave me the pitch and they said, it's the power of the hour. You choose all these benefits you get if you dedicate one hour a work week. And okay, I was told, sure. Anthony, you would do well because they're all veterans. But it seems like that's not what yeah, that's not the right one. The veteran market is this script. The credit union market is the one that uses our power along with the union market. So if you work for Ashley Rush, she'll straighten you out and tell you which market you're going to actually work in. Any of these markets, you can make good money at. OK, it's not like one market's worse than the other. That's not the way it works. So you're going to be OK. All right, Anthony. Anthony. <laughs> Okay, thumbs up. All right, so let's go back now. And I forget the gentleman who asked me, but how the heck and why the heck did I do whatever I did? Okay, so let's go back to the plan generator. In the plan generator, uh, actually, let's go even farther back to that. We did the needs analysis, right? So we asked these questions. If you're in the veteran market, you did dollar a day. And if you're in the uh, credit union market, then you did the hour power. So let's just stick with this one for now. Now we froze the screen, we asked them to look at it, and then we're gonna read that paragraph. Then we go into the plan generator. This is where you spend a lot of time making changes, doing whatever. But initially when you're doing your presentation, we tell you exactly where you want to start, which is always gonna be in the middle at $5 a day. And if somebody has making a lot more money, you can start at a higher level, but we don't want you to start with a lower level. So think to yourself, bronze, is at the lowest level, then silver, then gold. The silver or the middle level should be at $5 a day for couples or $6 a day for an individual, right? In the market that has the dollar a day approach. So here then I start and I don't have any additional plan options, right? So I'll click those off. So when I first start, I'm right here and it comes up with a default, I think of 15,000 and no A71. So I want to click the A71 and I want to change this. If it's an individual, I want to change it to triple individual. If there's a husband and wife or a husband and a family or a wife and a family or whatever, I want to change it to 
the family plan. Right now you can't see it because I don't have a family, but if I put Jill up here and I said, Jill was 55 and she's a female and I brought that over from the uh, needs analysis screen, now I will have the family and I'm gonna do triple family. So this is the one I want you to select every single time, the triple family, the one in the middle. And then I want you to make sure that for both of these, in the case I'm doing a family now, they both should be at $5 a day, okay? Once I set that to $5 a day and I set that to triple, now I want you to allocate. So remember, here's what's happening. When I set this, I'm setting the budget for both of them at $5 a day. And then anything I do down there, I want it to reach that budget. I'm setting the silver in the middle at five. I'm going to set uh, the gold at eight and the bronze at three as an example. And all I'm doing is setting a budget because I never asked the client for a budget because what we're really saying is that these are recommendations by the VSO. So that being the case, I look over here to the left. I can see that the budget based on $5 a day should be $304.17 I'm only using $255 of that budget. So rather than try to go in here and manipulate anything, all we want you to do is click on allocate remaining, allocate both, because now it's a family instead of just me. And when you click allocate, all that negative number or whatever will go to zero. And when I click finish, now the budget is 304.17, the used amount is 304.17. So now I know for this plan, I'm good. And this plan is going to be called the silver plan. So I've done that. Now I'm going to go to plan options and I'm going to type in silver, then gold, then bronze in that order. If you wanted to use different words, you can. I personally use essential, recommended, and comprehensive. It just depends on what you want to say and how you want to say it. Everybody understands that bronze is here, silver is worth more, gold's worth even more. So sometimes I'll have students say, okay, I want to use silver, gold, and platinum, or gold, uh, platinum, and diamond, whatever makes sense to you that you want to follow it. However, you want the middle one to be on top, the highest one to be second, and the lowest one to be third. Yes, Doris, how can I help you? For the allocate, when it goes to zero dollars, um, how did you get it to go to the zero? Because when I hit so, allocate, mine stays the same in red. If up here, if that's, let's say that's six dollars, let's say I just change that and mm -hmm. I say the budget is six dollars a day, then what ends up happening, I'm using three hundred and four dollars out of a budget of three hundred and sixty five. So I have $60 left over. I'm starting with triple family, the one in the middle for the A7-1 product, which is your accident and health product. I'm going to go to allocate remaining, and I'm going to allocate both, or I can allocate just me or just Jill. More often than not, I want you to allocate both. So you're going to click on allocate, and then you're going to click on the allocate button. When I do that, these numbers should now go to zero. Got it. It's working and, now. Thank you. Yep. And what is being allocated is we're taking money out of the whole life, the cost of that, and we're putting it so that the budget matches whatever I had set for the budget here. Whenever nice. you out, money comes out of the whole life product only. Yes, Chardonnay, how can I help you? Um, instead of the gold, silver, and the bronze, what did you say? You said it recommended, essential, and something else. Yeah. What I typically, what I like to use because I like language is I'll use essential, recommended, and comprehensive. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Whatever language you want to use, but remember, you're always starting off with the middle one first on the left, then the highest one, then the lowest one. Okay. okay. Thank you. The way, the way that you'll know that you do that correctly is on plan options. You always start with the middle one, then the highest, then the lowest and then it will show up just like that. And we'll see in a second why this is so important, okay? So we did the silver, and that's the first one that we did. And then when we did the gold and the bronze, 
when I first started, all it's going to do is copy the first one into the second and third. Okay. When I now go to the gold, <clears throat> we know the gold, I want to put it at $8 each. So I want to click on gold. The first thing I'm going to do up here is make sure that Samuel and Jill is both at $8. So I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to get to $8 there for Sam. And then I'm going to do $8 for Jill, thereby setting the budget at $486.67 a month, right? And now I need to make sure the plan is built to match that budget. So I'm going to make sure that the A71 option is at the highest available. So right now it says quintuple individual. We know it should be family and the highest for family is quintuple for family. I'm gonna click on that. And now I can allocate remaining equally between both. And now you can see that Samuel's at 82 and Jill is at 31. And it's zero here, which means I am actually build, I have built a plan that matches the budget for the gold. Yes, Mark. Um, yeah, the, it's the similar question. So under the option, when you went from say silver to gold, you uh, changed the, now you have quintuple family. I don't understand that relationship. That was the question I was asking the last time. So right. are you making a judgment that you're trying to, I don't, so quintuple family to me means that there's five members in the family. That's Fair enough. Not, I'm going to show you I, exactly what that does. Okay. And I'm going to show you what the relationship is. Just give me one 30 seconds to finish bronze. Okay? Thank you. So on the bronze, <clears throat> the bronze we said should be at what? $3 a day for each one of them? So at the bronze, we're gonna go to $3 a day for each one. That sets the budget at 182.50. I'm gonna change the A7 option to double family because it's lower than the one in the middle at the silver, which we said was triple. And, and then I'm gonna allocate the remaining amount. And then I'm going to finish. And even though it's a penny off, it's still good. Everything is fine now. Now I have a silver at 365, a gold at 486, and a bronze at 182.49. Now let's address Mark's question. Why that? What the heck does all that mean? When I go down here and I click on benefits summary, the base plan for the A71 is $100 a day. Uh, sorry, right here is $100 a day for the hospital benefit. For every day I stay overnight in the hospital, I get paid 100. That's single. And then double, triple, quadruple, quintuple is multiplying that 100 times two, three, four, and five respectively. Okay. It has nothing to do with the number of people in the family. It has to do with the number of times we're going to multiply the base of $100 a day. Now, why do I have you change that for the silver, gold, and bronze you saw right here in the plan generator, I had you change it right there for the option, right? And the reason for that is on the silver, I want you to start with double. So kind of here in the middle, you can start a double or triple, it doesn't matter. The gold, I want you to put it at the highest level for the A71. And for the bronze, I want you to put it one level lower than what you put the silver at. The reason I have you do that is because when you look at the benefits summary, down here, these numbers are tied to those numbers. So on the silver, 300 gets you 30, 60, 90. On the gold, 500 gets you 50, 100, and 250. And the bronze gives you 200, 20, 40, and 60. So these numbers, these three numbers, three lines down here change pursuant to what you put here, whether it's single, double, triple, quadruple, or quintuple, okay? And the reason I have you change it is because if I'm at the highest level, I want to see the biggest number possible, the most value I can provide. These are tied to these. Whatever you select here for the 100 through 500 is going to affect what shows up here. Mark, does that answer your question on single through quintuple? It does. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, Tamiko, your hand is raised. What can I do for you? Tamiko, is your hand back down? No, I, I was talking with the mute on and I'm on Zoom <laughs> every day. Oh my gosh, embarrassing. Anyway, same question as Mark, was really just trying to understand the theory on whether you're selecting triple individual, double individual. Is there a right one to pick or is it? I want you to always pour the silver. The one in the middle, I want you to pick triple. If you're only doing one person that's individual, it'd be triple individual. It's a family, it would be triple family. That's the one I always want you to start on here. Put it at triple. At gold, I want you to put the highest level that you see. Usually it's gonna be quintuple. And at the bronze, I want you to put that at double. And the reason for that is the value that's shown here is tied to that. So people understand that if I buy the gold, I'm going to get the highest amount of coverage. Wow. So look what happens. This number over here in red is the number that people pay the most attention to. No matter how much you break everything down, that is the number of, of dollars they think they're going to get paid out if they die. Mm -hmm. So on the gold plan, it's 313. On the silver plan, it's 198. And on the bronze plan, it's 116. All of that is driven by one thing, that number is a combination of the auto accident with both people dying, as well as the any cause of death or the freedom of choice. So 18,553 plus 17,469 plus 40 plus 40 adds up to 116,022. So whenever you're having a conversation with a client, and you show them that, that is the number that they're going to remember. It's just a psychological fact. They'll never get into the details. That's not what they're going to remember. They're going to remember, I just purchased $200,000 of coverage. So that being the case, the only way I can drive that number up appropriately is either change the any cause of death or I change the accident, auto accident amount. To change the auto accident amount, out, I change that number there, single, double, triple, quadruple, quintuple, or I try to change the any cause of death amount. But if I did the any cause of death amount, the cost goes through the roof because that's the most expensive product that we sell its whole life, right? It's guaranteed to pay out no matter how you die or when you die. The rates never change and you're building cash value. Ergo, it's very expensive. Lee, uh, Lania, did I say that right? Lania Taylor? Yeah, Lania. Um, so will we ever use the individual or like the single individual or single family? Will that ever be used? Sure, you can use it if you're downselling somebody, right? So one of the reasons I have you start at the triple family and uh, for silver and then the bronze is if somebody tells you, hey, I can't afford $182.50 a month, you could bring that down so instead of costing $182.50, you could bring that down to single family. So there's still some amount of coverage, right? And when I show that, now it's $177.59, but now I'm only giving you 50, 100, and 200, and then 10, 20, and 30. So it still gives you room to provide the A71, which you always want to provide for a client because it drives that red number up as high as possible. And it's giving them a lot more value for their money. Okay. So yeah, you. you could, Linnea, but I would uh, try to avoid it as much as you can because the value they get isn't that much. You got it. Thank you. Okay. So going back and looking at this, and we're going to spend a lot of time in the plan generator, is we saw a single family. It costs $5.17 a month. If I clicked on the quintuple family, that jumps to $24.83 a month. And I'm getting all kinds of value right here, looking at the insurance, right? So in people's minds, they're thinking I'm getting $236,000 for only $197 in coverage. And that's absolutely true. Whereas the silver plan, they're getting 198, right? So 236 versus 198, 
it looks like they're getting a lot more coverage for less money on this plan that I modified over here. But what's really happening is you need to look right there. How much are they getting no matter how they die, no matter when they die? 50 and 27, whereas in the bronze plan, they're only getting 18 and 17. So remember, cash value is predicated on whole life only. Whole life pays out 100% of the time. Cherie, how often do you think an accident, auto accident, or common carrier gets paid out? You said how often? How often? Does it get paid out, an auto mm -hmm. accident? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's what I said. Uh, is it not 100% of the time? Mm, that's correct. Okay. Sorry. Well, let's, do it. <laughs> let's do it differently. How often do people die due to an accident? In your Every mind. No, but <laughs> what, percent, <laughs> what percent of deaths are due to an accident? Um, maybe, I don't know, 60% maybe. Okay, 60%. Sandra Taylor, what percent of deaths are due to an accident? I would say more like 20. 20? Okay. And Tom, I'm going to cheat because you should probably know the answer better than anybody. What percent of deaths are due to an accident? Uh, what percent of deaths? Deaths are due uh, to an accident. No, I, I don't know. That. I would say 5%. Okay. It's less than 1%. Oh, wow. Less than 1%. And as you get older, it goes even lower. Because here's what happens. As you grow older, every day that you grow older, the odds of your death by natural death go up. And the reason for that is the food we eat, the liquid we ingest, the air we breathe, all are contaminated and start to break down our body. Our own DNA breaks down after a period of time. And on top of all that, we're exposed to COVID, diseases, viruses, all this other stuff. Any of that stuff that kills you is a natural death. Heart attack, cancer, it doesn't matter. It's all natural death. Okay? So when you start off, you're already, the majority of the time you're gonna die is due to a natural death. And as you get older, you're getting closer and closer to what? Life expectancy. So we know you're going to die naturally in a short period of time. So an accident starts out at 1% and every year you get older, every day you're getting older, that percentage is getting squeezed till it almost becomes negligible. So knowing that, I pay out the freedom of choice on any cause of death 100% of the time, no matter how you die, no matter when you die. But any one of these, I know I'm only going to pay out at max less than 1% of the time. So what's the risk to me to give you $50,000 of accident coverage? None. The risk is less than 1%, right? That's why the cost for that is so much lower. Whereas the cost for this is so much higher because 100% of the time, as long as the policy is still in force, I'm paying out that amount, correct? No matter what, no matter how I die, I'm going to pay out to Jill that 18,553 if Sam dies. So remember when I talked about this number over here, right? This big 236,000. That's what people remember, even though we as insurance agents know the likelihood is the most the companies are at risk for, 99.8% of the time, is about $36,000 as opposed to $236,000. <laughs> Everyone tracking with me right now where I'm at, why I'm talking through this, okay? So understanding that that's the red number that matters the most, that's why when you build the silver plan, you start with 30, oh, I'm sorry, you start with uh, three times the 100 or 300 right in the middle because you want to drive that number up for both of them to $120,000. If I didn't put that at uh, 300, that number would be a lot lower, which makes that red number look a lot lower. Does that make sense? The lower that red number is, the less value people see for what they have to pay. And again, in the veteran market, this is all recommended right in the middle by the VSOs, $5 a day. Then you can go up to this one, which is 
eight dollars a day for each one and then the bronze that i change would be lower at like three bucks a day so we are the ones that are going into the plan generator and we're building it out so if i'm in hp pro on the veteran side the veteran side is going to be a little bit different because it's the hour power philosophy but once i fill all that out and i get to the same screen i'm right here remember all it's only going to show a blank one and you're the one that creates the plan for the first one which is going to be the silver then you're going to go into plan options you're going to add the gold or the bronze or you can call it recommended comprehensive and essential whatever works for you you're going to end up with three plans over here these two plans will replicate this one then you're going to go into the gold you're going to make the quick changes pursuant to the analysis approach up here and then you're going to do the same thing on the bronze when you have all three the way that you want you're going to click on the silver and make sure that green shows up and then you're going to click on present plan you're going to unfreeze your screen and you're going to walk through the rest of that script okay all right so that's come from a script perspective i'm going to get to the uh, credit folks in just a second but let's go back to the plan generator let's change it just change it based on anything so let's say that this person is going to be um 45 years old right and jill is going to be 38 years old when i do that you'll notice that the rates change down here pursuant to the age because that's the thing that affects insurance right how old you are and your health and your habits we haven't got to the health or habits yet all we're doing is giving them basically what we think the cost is going to be based on their age and their sex and whether or not they smoke if they smoke that tu means tobacco user so for me or for sam to get fifty thousand dollars of coverage it's costing me 134 dollars and 36 a month if i change that tobacco user i go from 134 to 178 38 a month if you use tobacco your cost goes up right so we need to know if they're a tobacco user or not and then the rest changes depending upon what i want to do so if i want to change this to 10 or let's say nine dollars for each one of them again we're going to establish the budget at 18 dollars a month for both of them or nine dollars each i know the budget now is going to be 547 and 50 sorry 547 dollars 50 cents i'm only spending 228.93 the first thing that I want to do is add the A71, probably at the highest level to get the most value. And then I'm going to go into allocate remaining. I'm going to allocate both by clicking on allocate both over here. Click the allocate button. If those numbers turn zero, then I know that the plan as presented matches the budget that I have established. Is, well, that's interesting. Can you guys still hear me? You can still yeah. hear me. Yeah. yeah. Your yeah. screen looks funny. Yeah, I'm sure it does because it just went kooky over sure. here. Well, right, Thomas, you have a question. Yeah, I was just going to say, how does the company define tobacco user? Uh, if you've used tobacco or marijuana in any form within the last year. Okay. Including just snuff and all that. Any Anything? any type of tobacco or marijuana use in the last year okay they're considered a smoker what if they have their marijuana card and they're not smoking but they use like they eat it through like edibles or tea or any other type of fashion any marijuana use is considered a tobacco user within the last year so it doesn't matter to us if you have a marijuana card at all. We know the risk associated with ingesting marijuana in any form or similar to the risk of tobacco, and we will rate you accordingly. So it's not a question if it's illegal or illegal, depending on what state you're in. It doesn't matter to us. If you use it, then we need to increase your rate because you're more likely to die sooner than the average person with everything else being equal about you. Does that make sense? I don't know who asked that. Did I, did I, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can still hear you. Yes. Yes. All right. So it's 118 right now. Uh, obviously, I got to play with my system, figure out what the heck is going on. 
Let's take a 12 minute break for those of you that want to stick around. Oh, there we go. At least my system's back. Uh, let's take a 12 minute break. I'm going to continue to do this, continue to practice. We can go through the homework if you want. I can answer any questions that you want, but let's take a little bit of a break for folks. If your upline wants you to work with them, feel free to go ahead and do that. Again, I'm recording this thing all the way through until we're completely done for the day, and I will be here for the next three hours for anybody that wants to work on this stuff with me, okay? Randy, you have a question? Yeah, I had a question about the tobacco and marijuana use. So what if they're a uh, social smoker instead of like a recreational where they do it every day as opposed to like maybe once a month, once every couple months? So when you say that you're, if you're a marijuana user or a smoker, when you say yes, we will then ask you the question, how often do you use, not the smoker, but how often do you use the marijuana? There's right. another form that comes up that we will then ask you that question. And then depending on how you answer that will depend on whether or not you'll be declined or if you get rated. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Kaylee, do you have a question for me? Yeah, I'm in the uh, benefit builder, and for some reason, my any cause of death keeps hitting like 150K, and I'm not sure what I'm doing, and we don't want it that high, so. Uh, okay, well, give me a, <laughs> after the break, I'll take a look at it with you, okay? Okay. All right, everybody. Okay. Okay, I'm back, and I think I can actually see myself on the screen now, so that's good. How are we doing? Wow, we have 97 people still here. That's impressive. That was great. Ruth, how are you doing? Hi, sorry. I'm good. I was uh, toggling through um, one of the applications. Um, I okay. did have a question, um, if it's okay, if no one else is going first. Um, when you were explaining the game plan, uh, that's when I was sending out all the emails to everyone. I was wondering if you could just go over the, per like, um, just really briefly. Um, not uh, for the game plan, it was the per uh, percentages of, um, or the goals. I was trying to figure it out my on my own, but I'm having oh, trouble getting it. Okay, the game plans. Right, right. Absolutely. So let me, let me bring that up. Share my screen, hopefully it'll work. So I'm here, I wanna go home. I want to proceed without saving. So I click yes, <clears throat> pardon me. So I'm here and I wanna go to, uh, where do I wanna go? I, I know where I wanna Dash go. Dashboard, uh, there it is. Here we go. So the game plans. So when I click right here, <clears throat> the first part, the first thing we want to start, and I don't know where you're at. So you tell me where you're at, but basically you're putting in a certain amount for your expenses. So that tells you what your income commitment is and then how much uh, your income goal is. So there's two different ones. One is how much you need to cover your monthly expenses. And then your goal is how much do you want to get paid? So I just put 30,000 and then I explain how to use the uh, expenses over here to drive that $4,000 number, okay? Then you're gonna hit the bottom lower right-hand number, you're gonna have your why. So they typically ask for three reasons in, month, in the month of January, what is your why? Why are you working? What are you trying to do? And then what is your career goals in the month of July? Do I wanna hit a certain dollar amount? Do I wanna get promoted? Whatever the case is, then you fill that out. And then here at the bottom, you have milestones and clubs. So a milestone, uh, regardless of what market you're in, the milestone could be 10K in a week, 25K for the month. The clubs are 50, 100, and 150. So $50,000 for gold club, $100,000 for platinum, and $150,000 for diamond club. So these are just things that you would put down, here are my goals, and you sit down with your uh, upline and do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Here tells you what your game plan is going to be in terms of how many days you're going to work for that particular month, right? So in this particular month of January, so I'm taking off the 14th, 21st, so every Saturday I'm going to take off. And the way you can change that is you can click on that and you can choose field day, vacation day, or off. A field day means you're in the field, you're talking to clients, calling clients, and presenting to clients. 
A vacation day means you're completely out of the business. You're not available to do any work whatsoever. And an off day could be <clears throat> you're off from the field. <clears throat> so as you move up into leadership, you may have things where you're training and teaching other people and you're not in the field. So you would select off. The reason that this is important is that we calculate then what it takes for you to achieve your $30,000 income goal based on the number of days you say you're going to be in the field. All right. Then you can put in some remarks down here that tells you, you know, whatever remarks you want for the month. Hey, I'm doing this. I got this going on. Whatever notes you have for yourself about the month that you made the game plan for. Then you're going to click the right arrow. And then if $30,000 came from before, then you will put in your contract percentage. For all of you in your first 30 days, it's at 50%. Your show ratio means the number of people that actually showed up for your presentation divided by the number of people that you actually booked an appointment, okay? So if you book 10 appointments and seven people showed up, your show ratio is 70%. Your close ratio is 30. Uh, you can put whatever you want in here, <clears throat> uh, but typically new hires is about 30%. As you get more and more experience, that close rate continues to grow higher. So for every person you give a presentation to, um, the number of sales you have divided by the number of people that you had presentations with tells you what your close rate is. Then your ALP per sales on average, what are you expecting to book? Usually new hires can do about $1,200 on average per sale. The goal is 15 and top performers do anywhere from $1,500 and up. Yes, Mark. Hi, Sam. I got really confused from uh a while back it so what were you um with regard to the veteran script where do i find the veteran script that i would have on my screen and were you just did you have it up in such a way that you would click just right on where, where the script is in order to go to uh some of the attachments I'm not sure I understand the second part of your question, but my presentation script for me, I have four screens. Really, I have five. So I have one over here, one there, one there, one there, and one here. When I first started out, all I had was my uh, laptop. Okay? okay. So starting off in that situation, I would suggest that you print out the presentation script and you have it available to you kind of like over here. So you can pick okay, it up. That's what, that's what I, I, I did. I have the script Perfect. out. So when you do your script, keep in mind that the only time the client's really seen you during the presentation is in A1. As soon as A1 is done, as soon as you've established rapport, introduced yourself, you're turning your camera off. So the fact that you're gonna pick this up and read it, they're never gonna know. As long as you don't sound like you're reading, right? You're having a conversation with them, they'll never know that you're reading it off the page, okay? Okay. All right, awesome. So uh, to answer the lady's question, <clears throat> the average ALP, then the bonus amount, uh, that's going to be predicated on how much you're going to get from the world's greatest bonus, which we're going to talk about later. So you can put in 20% for now. And then your net to gross is of all the deals that you actually create, how many of them stick? So the goal is 90. And I said, for you guys, you can just put in 80. The moment I put a number in there, all of this will then get calculated. And it tells me now <clears throat> that I have to have certain number of appointments per day, certain number of presentations per day, a number of sales per day. And each one of those sales needs to be about $2,200. I'm sorry, the ALP per day needs to be $2,200. So it's about $1,100, which is less, you know, right there. Appointments per week, presentations, it calculates everything for me. So I know exactly what I need to do to achieve the income goal of $30,000. I need to sell about 61,000 of ALP for the month. My net ALP needs to be just under 50. I will get advanced 20,000. I'll get paid a bonus of 10,000. And that gets paid out every single week to add up for the month, 20 and 9,800 9, respectively. My total income will then be 30,000 for the month of January if I execute the plan as it's put together here. Did that answer your question? And I forget who it was. Yes, that it did. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Okay. <clears throat> so there's that. You can then uh, go over here and you can click this down arrow. And if you do it, it's going to save the PDF file. 
Uh, what a lot of um, folks like to do in leadership is they want you to fill it all out and then they want you to send it to them so they can prepare for their one-on-one -on -one and kind of walk with you. Hey, Sam, you said you had these amount of expenses. This is your career goals. This is how much you're going to work in the field for the month of uh, January. And here's a calculator. How are you going to actually accomplish what you said you were going to accomplish? Yes, Hayden, how can I help you? And so I was just uh, wanting to, uh, I had forgotten exactly how far through the presentation our homework is. I wanted to get that reiterated, if you could. Your homework that's due next Saturday? Oh, I thought it was <clears throat> this coming Saturday. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, just Saturday. It's due on Saturday night. <clears throat> you yes. need to get through all the way through A. For the veteran market, you need to get through A5. And the reason I say A5 is because all of the rest of this is reading. I, I don't need you, I don't need to, I don't need to watch you read or listen to you read. Because I figure if I watch the first part, you know how to read. The first part is really about making sure you can follow the script and that you can add all the information in the family information guide. That's for the veterans. For the credit union. You want to get through uh, A7, all of A7, right? I don't care about the no-cost legal kit. You need to get through A7, and both markets need to download the uh, PDF file and send that to me along with their presentation. Does that help, Hayden? It does. Thank you. Okay. So we're right here. Uh, that was a question we had about how to fill out the game plans. Uh, the floor is open. If somebody wants me to go through an example, start at the script, whatever you want to do, we can do that. So I had a question about HP Pro. I was somehow getting a wildly high any death uh, number. So like for any any cause of death, it would it was like 150k, and I don't know why I was getting that huge number. You I sure? Need to know. Phones. You want me to share my screen? Uh -huh. Okay. So we can look at it together and hopefully discover what's going on with. Okay, K let me get that back open and then I'll share. Okay, while well, we're waiting for you, anybody have another question? Or are all of you experts now and you can do this with no problem? Oh, you got to make sure that you um, change the hours. I have the same problem. Sherry Young or Sheree? Yeah, Sheree, thank you. Um, so I know you mentioned about the quick video presentations that don't require the report cards. In what situations would we use those as opposed to going through the full presentation? Uh, I'm sorry, the first part, of your, what did you say, the quick video? Like you had some links on the side in HP Pro where we could just pull up like a quick link for something as opposed to going through the full presentation. Oh, okay. So if I'm right here and I want to build the pre-plan, I can click here and I don't need to go through the entire presentation. I could add the person's name. I can say, you know, you're 50 years old, you're a male and you're in California. I can now build everything that I did before, except I can't show the individual plan. I can only show the benefit summary for what all three plans that I have. So what this does is allows you to like practice as an example, how to manipulate the uh, uh, plan generator to do what you want without having to go through the entire presentation to get there. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you, Chrissy, appreciate you. Uh, Samuel, what do you got for me? And in that plan that showed our contract as being at 50%, um, at what point does that increase? Was that after 10,000 in sales? Uh, well, I'll show you all that next week. But yeah, it's, I think, 15,000 or 60 days. It's going to move up. Okay. Thank you. Either one of those will trigger a higher plan. Thank you, Ruth. Okay. What I'm looking at here is Kaylee. And Kaylee, five dollars a day. Yeah, so I've got the hourly twenty-five, the five dollars a day here, and then somehow it's still got what? Why? One hundred and fifty. So, what is your what? What is your question? Um, isn't that like way too high? Is it? 
Change Joe's age to 45. And change Jane's age to 45. Okay. Because they're young. Exactly. Click on the whole life product for each one of them. Um, so the check mark to the left where it says, yeah, there you go. For both, down, Joe and Jane, go down. No, 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 no. Don't worry oh, about that. Okay. Go down to Jane, do the same thing for her. And now I want you to allocate the remaining. And what will happen is you'll see that the value now drops down to 74 and 73, respectively. So okay. the fact that high coverage amount just meant that they were very young, right? And the logic there is that for that amount of money, we know you're going to live on average uh, longer. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, so Nika. you'll be paying in a lot more. Yeah, over the lifetime. You're, well, no, you're paying in the same amount. You're but just going to get a lot more coverage because you're younger. You're expected to pay longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. That was it. Then. So, I just needed to know why it was like such a huge amount because I was like, I don't want to be writing contracts for like 60 year old people for 150K because you were showing like yours was at like 20K for any yeah. death. So I was like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So when you, depending upon the age, the system will default typically to $15,000 and then you start building from there. Now there's a heck of a lot more that goes into HB Pro than what I just showed you, right? What I'm showing you is the basics to follow the script. There is a lot more that goes on in there. Uh, and I can show you guys that, or I can take questions. It just depends on what you want to do. If somebody has a question or, or wants me to show them how to build a specific plan, I can do that right now. You're giving me a thumbs up, Tara, but that doesn't tell me anything. I don't know what you want me to do. Hey, Sam. Yes. Um. So if someone has children, we can add that writer if they choose to, or do we automatically just add the writer if they have children under the age of 18? Well, we're not talking about writers at all yet we're only talking about people with um you know two family members right to get to a family so let's kind of walk through that together okay. and see what that looks like so let me share my screen i was sitting down with the family right here <clears throat> we got sam no additional options i'm starting from scratch right so sam is married to jill and we'll put jill in there and we'll say that jill is uh 53 female and yes, they have children. Neither one of us are smokers, but we have children under the age of 18. So you're gonna click right there and now you can actually enter the children. And let's just say it's only gonna be one. His name is John. He has uh, same last name as whatever. His date of birth is gonna be 0201-2016. And he's a male, right? And I'm going to click save. So now the children's in there and I'm going to continue to go back to children in there. Yeah, still in there. Okay. And we're going to change that to the dollar a day. And what do we say for dollar a day? We're going to make it $5 since it's going to be for each one of them. Right. Now to Mary's question down here, these are additional products that we could sell. I haven't talked about these at all, but we could do that. However, in the veteran market, we specifically are focused on funeral and final expenses and anything that happens to you that's an accident where you survive. In the credit union market, we focus on funeral and final expenses and income protection and if you're in an accident and you survive. So in the credit union market, we add one more thing in called income protection. So we'll talk about that in a second, but for Mary's question, if we have children, I could add this child writer down here, I can click on it and add it. You can see it's $6.25 a month. Now, I haven't gone through all the policies and stuff yet. We can do that tomorrow. But basically, a child writer means that on my policy for me that I'm going to write, there will be a writer that says, if my child dies before the age of 21 and before I die, then I will get paid out $10,000. It is not a whole life policy. It is a writer on my policy, okay? So when that child turns 21, that policy writer goes away 
It has no value. You're not building any cash value. You're doing nothing other than paying $6.25 a month for every month <clears throat> until that child reaches a certain age uh, and they're no longer viable. They're no longer viable for the coverage, okay? I don't ever sell this policy. You can if you want. The reason I don't is because if I'm going to provide protection for the child, I'd much prefer to talk about the value of providing a whole life policy on that child that will stay with them for the rest of their life. And the cost of that policy will remain the same every month for the rest of their life. And that's going to be about seven or eight dollars. So I, for me, they're going to be very easy to convince a a parent, if they want coverage in the event of their child dies, we can sell a, a head start, basically a whole life policy on that child that's going to be very inexpensive because they're so young. Yes, Mark, how can I help you? I guess you don't have a question, Mark. Thomas, how can I help you? Or Tom? Yeah, I just want to make sure, Sam, that there's no conversion privileges on on the uh, on the child rider nope, and that's nope. why you're saying you'd rather go with the whole life absolutely since i can't convert that policy any worker in the lifetime it, it it doesn't help the family very much all no, it's really doing i think you're right yeah the, i, I agree thank that. you yep they have money to cover the funeral but it does nothing for that child so the child survive okay gotcha. yep so you could add that writer. So Mary, your question, do I, could you do it? Yes. Do I recommend that you do it? No. And who's showing me their screen? Who is this? Sorry, that's me, Kaylee Hobbs. Um, so I had a question about this right here, the coverage. This is what we want to check to be able to do like the gold, silver, bronze plan, right? We check there and then do this part, depending on what they want. Well, yeah, the very first thing you do is you name the plans in well, the yeah. plan. You haven't named I, the plan. I just didn't do that in this because I'm just kind of playing around with it. So then you would hit the down arrow under the A71 where you were at. And for the, uh, you're showing me the gold. So that would be the highest one as a family. Right. So, so would we would do quintuple. Quintuple family, not individual. Oh, oh, oh. Yep. Yep. There you go. Quintuple family. There you go. Okay. Yeah, that's all I had is just checking this to turn that on because originally I made the plans option one, two, three, and then uh, it wasn't checked. So I was just making sure we do do that. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Perfect. So that's the, uh, uh, what I was talking about before was the child writer. There's other products I want to talk about, uh, but you don't have to do that for your presentation rubric or your practice. The only thing we want you to focus on in the veteran market is the A71 and the whole life product. In the credit union market, you're focused on the A71, the whole life product, and then income protection. So I'll show you that a little bit later, what I want you to do there. Yes, Randy. Um, so for the quintuple uh, and all the other options, is that just uh, raising uh, the amount of money that the person gets if something were to happen. I'm a little, st I'm still a little confused about the single individual, double individual, triple individual. I know that you told us to start with triple individual, or if it's a couple, uh, you do a family. So uh, I'm just a right. little confused about the tiers of it. Yeah, no worries. So let me share my, you guys can see my screen still, right? Yes. Okay. So plan one. To, I'm not going to go through all the rest of it, but to answer your question specifically, this is a family. So if I do this at single family and I do this one at quintuple family, okay, no matter, and I'm not worried about fixing the price or anything like that, just the difference between the two. This is five times the base at 100. This is one time the base at 100, right? If I go to the benefit summary, the difference between the two plans is plan two is 50, 100, and 250 versus plan one, which is 10, 20, and 30. Right. So you're getting more, you're, you're getting more coverage basically yep. on, on which tier that you choose for them, but you want to start right. at. In the middle, 
right. because you're showing the five dollars a day for the family for each person, right? So the silver is in the middle, and then gold goes up and bronze goes down. Now notice here that I had children. Children don't get paid out the same way for an accident. They get paid out differently, right? So two, four, and six, as opposed to 10, 20, and 30. And then at the highest level, 10, 20, and 50 versus 50, 100, and 250. And that's simply because if you're not an adult, we're not expecting you to have as much of an impact. Emotionally, there's an impact, but not financially, okay? But they still get the exact same benefit if they're in the hospital overnight, or if they have to go to the emergency room, or if they're in the ICU. Randy, does that answer your question? For the most part, I mean, we if we were to write a plan, we would start at the triple, correct? Well, I wouldn't say when you write a plan, when you present, present a, a plan. Yeah, that's when you're going to start here because that's the way that we want you to learn how to do it. Once you get experienced, what you're probably going to find is you're not going to do a triple. You're just going to do an option close between one or two plans, and you're going to decide how much you want to set it at if that makes sense, right? So we teach you the process. And as you get more experienced, you're going to figure out what makes sense for you, how you like to sell. If you want to be more aggressive and offer a higher coverage at a higher amount versus a lower amount. Okay. Yep. All right. Yes. Yeah. Q Hobbs, what do you got for me? So are those a hospital benefits? Are those paid directly to the family or is that some kind of like health insurance where it gets paid to the doctor at the hospital? It gets paid directly to the person right here. It gets paid to him directly. So we okay. don't pay anybody else. We pay that money directly to that person right there. Man, I could have used this. Dang. All right. Yeah, I had a person <laughs> in class. I forget what she did. A phlebotomist, I think. Something like that. She was in an accident and broke both her ankles. And her doctor did not let her go back to work for over a year. So she, she was young, so she could have had this plan and she could have made $500 a day for 365 days. Yeah, I was looking at the child writer because my son, he has a um, heart condition. He was born with half of a heart. So at three days old, he had his first open heart surgery and he was in the ICU for a long time. So that would have been a couple grand right there. But oof, that would have been well, nice to know earlier <laughs> when I was young. Younger. So number one. Uh, is he okay now? I hope he's doing oh, right. 100% great. He's five. He, I was just brushing his teeth earlier. I don't know if you yeah. remember that. Yeah. Uh, he just got on the bus, went to school. He's super, super smart. He's like doing fourth grade math at five years old. He's awesome. Uh, to clarify though, and to make sure that we're all on the same page, your son would not have gotten paid out under the A71 because it wasn't an accident that caused him to be in the emergency room or in the hospital. True. Okay. Right. So just keep in mind that it has to be an accident. And, and the, keep it for those of you in the veteran market, the majority of your folks are going to be a little bit older. What are older people typically afraid of or what happens to them a lot? They fall. Oh, yeah. So for 100% of the time, I can sell the say 71 all day long because it's not that expensive as opposed to the value that they're going to get if they survive an accident. And most accidents that older people have aren't car accidents. The accidents they typically have are they fall down. So if I'm telling them, hey, if you fall down, I got you covered for as long as it takes you to rehab. Because, and I'll show you this when we talk about EAP, I had a recuperation writer that then says, you don't need to stay in the hospital overnight in order for me to pay you out. It is a beautiful thing for older folks. In the credit union market, uh, it's a standard A71, right? Uh, it, those folks aren't going to fall as much, but they could still be in an accident. They could fall off the front stoop, cut their knee, break their ankle, uh, break their arm. I mean, literally anything that causes them to have to stay in the hospital overnight, or if they use the recuperation rider, if you add that to it, as long as the doctor says they can't go back and do that which they were doing before until maybe rehab is done or whatever, we're going to pay out that money every single day. Yes, Bob, what can I do for you? Based on the needs analysis, is there a general rule of thumb of a percentage of their available income that you can in good conscience use as a, <laughs> like a base point, like 5% like of the available income to pay for Let's talk about that a little bit. What I, so 
I'll talk big picture and then bring it down. In the big picture, 8% is about average what people typically spend for insurance products to protect themselves. That's what we see in the insurance industry, anywhere between 6 and 8%, usually somewhere around there. Now, that's fine, but I want you to think of that in terms of that's the result of what's happened. That's not a precursor of what's going to happen with your client. If you watch me or Eddie Leon, some of you have him in your upline, we don't sell at this level because we really don't care how much money you say you have or what your budget is. That makes no difference to me because I have no idea what you value. Okay. So understand that I have no idea what you value, but I'm going to make the assumption that you value your family higher than you value anything else your kids, your wife, your husband, whoever it is, right? You're going to value that. That's what I'm going to sell to. So I'm going to put a plan in front of you that may cost $450 a month. And then I'm going to say, but this is what you get for that. Am I going to spend $450 a month on insurance? Maybe now, right? But when I was 35, probably not, because I had to buy diapers and all that other stuff, right? So it's a value proposition. However, I don't want any of you to make that assumption about how much money somebody's willing to spend for this product, because it doesn't matter how much you would spend. What matters is, did you present enough value to the client that the client then says, okay, that kind of makes sense, or maybe I can't spend this much, or maybe I do want to qualify for a comprehensive plan. The, the so reason I ask is that, that yesterday I was doing a ride along and one of the clients was on a fixed income and had very limited income. And like, we're talking like a thousand dollars a month or, you know, yep. it, and if it got above a certain percentage, would you say mm, no? So, well, what I do in those situations is I'm going to make a judgment call, not on the percentage of income that they're going to spend for the plan, but in my mind, the likelihood that that person will cancel the plan because it's too expensive. Right. And I don't know what too expensive means in terms of a percentage because I have no idea. I'm going to try to find out, hey, well, how much of a disposable income do you have? Right. One, yeah. do you believe in the value or do you understand the value of what I'm presenting to you? Yes, I do. I think it has value. Okay. It's $305. If you're only going to pay a thousand, is that going to take food off the table? And we'll talk about how to do all of that. But basically, if they're giving me an indication that, yeah, that would stretch me, I probably can't do it. I'm not going to want to sell that high because I think that that person is going to cancel out. I'd much rather sell lower, keep the policy for 10 years than sell somebody high and have the policy cancel out after 60 days. Thank you. Right? Yep, absolutely. L Lania. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so for that $5 on like your screen where it says like Sam $5, Jill $5, uh, for the silver yeah. plan for a family, will it always be five dollars? And then like gold, does it does it have to be eight dollars or ten dollars, or does it really matter as long as it's higher? Well, you want to show that, so there's two things you're trying to accomplish here. You want to show the value at the price point, okay? And you want to mm -hmm. leave yourself room that if you need to down close or lower the cost, that you're still gonna make some money. Okay. So now that's a really good question. Let's talk about that. So in plan one, in this example, it's at $5 a day, right? So let's just go ahead and adjust it. So I'm going to say that that's going to be the triple family. I'm going to allocate the remaining. I'm going to allocate that. And then I'm going to finish. So now $304 a day, $5, uh, $5 each for one of them is 304. Here's what gets interesting for someone like you. You're going to look at this and you're going to say, okay, how much money am I making on this sale? All of you are on a 50% plan of which you will then get advanced 75%. So on this plan, 1700 plus 1686. So somebody's going to do the math for me and that's going to be Kaylee Hobbs. On this plan, how much ALP am I going to get credit for, Kaylee? Kaylee? Bueller. Bueller. Sorry. Um, I was pulling out my calculator. <laughs> okay. 1708 plus 1686 is equal to what? 
34. Well, I thought it would be 50% of that, wouldn't it? No, no, no. I want you to tell me first how much credit am I going to get? I'm credited for this number plus that number. So 1708 plus 1686 is equal to what? Is 3,394. Okay, so 3,394. And then I, I get credit for that amount. I get paid on 50% of that. So how much is 50% times that number? Uh, 1,697. So $1,600, and then I'm going to get advanced 75% of that. So what's 75% of that number? All 72.75. How much? 1,272. $1, so $1,200 sale, which meets the goal that we had in the plan. We said $1,200 for new hires, right? So that's pretty respectable. Okay, so let's go back to Lania. If Lania, if I didn't do that, this plan, I didn't sell this one and I left myself room. Let's say I went down to three dollars a day. How and that much would be like the bronze? Yeah, let's say that's okay. the bronze dollars a day. I'm going to move this one down to the double. I'm going to allocate the remaining. And when I do that, now how much am I going to get paid? Uh, somebody, <laughs> Kaylee Hobbs, how much am I going to get paid on this plan? Uh, it's 1993 so 1993 well how much do i get paid though you gotta you gotta oh. do the math added it together multiply it times 0. 0.5 and then multiply that times 0. 0.75 right yeah and the answer is 747 dollars and 37 cents okay this is my fault kelly because you told me your son was really good at math i just assumed that that no. came from mm -mm. I taught him the math. I did teach him the math, but okay, no words. how much how much am I going to get paid? 74737. So okay, 750 so, bucks. Okay. So now going back to Lania, I'm going to get paid 747. I do get paid a little bit off that, but it's not that's not where I'm making my money. I'm making my money on the life insurance products, okay? So in this scenario, I get 747. If I had started with the 3 and now I need to downsell lower, Let's say I got to go to a buck a day, right? Because I didn't start off high. I started off at three. And now the person's telling me, well, I can't really afford that. Now, if I allocate everything, how much do I get paid in my pocket? Anybody? It's 278 plus 255. $200 and 21 cents. 200 and what? $200 and 21 cents. Okay, $200 and 21 cents. It's not that much money, and you're putting in the same amount of effort, right? Mm -hmm. What I want you to think, Linda, is okay, if I'm going to spend the time with a client anyway, I need to show them incredible value and we start the silver at five to give you room if you need to to go lower and still make money if we started low and then you had to go lower which happens with new hires they typically give away price because that's the easiest thing to do to overcome an objection just lower the price which is okay nothing wrong with that but if you started low you can only go so much lower now you just spent an hour and a half of the client and you only got paid 200 bucks Whereas if you start with the silver and you spend an hour and a half with the client and you show them value and they decide to go with that, you're getting paid a lot more money, right? Yeah. So could we like change like the gold? Like could we do like the gold as $8 or do we want to see that big of a difference in monthly cost for like to convince so that's them? A, that's a good question. You're, some uplines want you to show a huge difference. Some uplines are saying, no, just go up a little bit. I would tell you that you're ultimately going to decide how much you want to do. But for the purposes of this class, I want to see a difference. So if it's a married couple, I want you to start at five, go up to eight, go down to three. Okay. And all okay. your examples that you practice on and the rubric will always be a married couple. Okay. The single we show you so you know how to navigate with the single, but married couples should always be five, go up to eight for the gold or the comprehensive and go down to uh, the bronze, go down to three. Now, hopefully we get Eddie Leon to talk about closing. He will tell you that he starts at six, seven, or eight. 
And then he goes up even higher than that for the comprehensive because he's very aggressive in terms of providing a price point for the client. That's just how he, how he rolls. He's selling value at the highest level. That way, if he has to downsell, he's still getting paid really, really well. Most new hires, though, <laughs> don't start that high because the, what they are reluctant to do is show a high price point to a client. They're afraid the client's going to say no. When you're in this business for a while, you're going to find that you're going to naturally move up higher because you feel more confident in showing the value of various price points. Bob, do you have a question for me? No. Sorry. Kelly Mc... <laughs> Go ahead. What do you got for me? Yes. And along those lines, you know, we're in the beginning where they ask like how much money you made an hour. Like say you got somebody like that works for AIL in there that's making $250,000 a year or whatever. Can you hire the silver and gold sure. and bronze prices? Absolutely. You can put it at whatever you want. Right. The whole point, and I'm showing it on the screen, right? The whole point is to set a budget up here. If I'm talking to a higher net worth individual, I don't even care about that. I'm just going to throw a number in there I think makes sense that I think that they'll probably not bulk at, which will be a lot higher than $10 a day. It just depends who I'm talking to. But the majority of the folks in your market, if you're in the veteran market, we know, and the way our script talks about it, is that the uh, VSOs talk about anywhere from $1 to $10 a day. Most people start in the middle at $5 a day. So I'm going to show you that one, and then I'll show you a higher one, and then a lower one will be available. So it really depends on how you want to do it. When you do your presentation rubric, you need to show me three plans or whoever you're doing it with, you have to show me three plan options. Yes, Zuri, what can I do for you? Uh, hey, the uh, under product on the left-hand side, uh -huh. where it's I'm assuming whole life, WHL, whatever's mm -hmm. in parentheses I've noticed has changed uh, depending on where you're or I guess maybe it's the dollar a day approach or something like that or plans. I'm not sure, but what does that mean? I've seen like R and I think like EX or something like that. So that would tell me there's four bands of whole life. There's the base band of whole life. Then there's the next one. Then there's the next one and the next one. So what we did is when we first started years ago, we just had one whole life. Didn't matter how much coverage you wanted you'd be in a one band. And quickly we realized that we need to spend more time doing underwriting, maybe having somebody take a physical, if in fact they're getting a higher level of insurance. So what this is telling you is that it's in the base band because it's only $5,000, right? Okay. Uh, over to so now it's at 100,000. So now it's EX, which is executive. And if I wanted to make this 125,000, now it's going to be SL, which is Select Life. It's the highest band that we offer. You can sell any amount to somebody under the age of 60, but the rates go up and your commission percentage that you get slightly dips the higher up you go. So if you sell in base uh, whole life, you're going to get a certain commission amount. And if you move up a band, your commission amount goes down just a little bit because we have to pay for that expense. The other thing that no one talked about here, and Randy, I'll be right with you, is this option over here, the LPU 65. That's life paid up to 65. So what that means is we can accelerate your premium so that you will pay the entire thing off by the time you turn 65. So if I just do regular, which is $125,000, cost me $302.61 at the age of 50. If I want to pay this off by the time I'm 65, I actually have to spend $726 a month in order to do that. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for somebody 50, but it makes a lot of sense for somebody maybe in the teenager, in the early 20s. You want to get it paid off sooner. The rate's not going to be that much higher because you're so much younger. You have more time that you're making payments. And our commissions yep. would adjust accordingly for the AIP? Not, not on a LP, not on a life paid up. That's still oh. the same. thing that gets different is going to be the R over here or the EX or the uh, SL. Okay. Yes, Randy, to help you. Um, can you uh, just go through the math on, on how you um, establish like what your commission is based off of? Uh, 
the amount of money that you put in between like one and five dollars. So right now you're at one dollar. So right. So I'm starting off in the middle every single time, right? According to the script at five dollars for a family. Right. And the way that I want you to think of that is that if I start off at five dollars, then the budget's gonna be what is it, 304? Is that what it's gonna be? 30417. Okay. If I uh sorry, make that a whole life product and then I allocate that so that way I know that, that they're gonna pay exactly that amount, then I know that my cost over here, or not my cost, the ALP I get credit for is gonna be about three hundred and or three thousand four hundred and fifty-four dollars, right? If I started lower, let's say at two, then that naturally means they're paying less money for their premium. If they're paying less money for their premium, then I know that I'm making a lot less money, right? So now I'm getting credit for only twelve hundred and what sixty three dollars instead of the big number I had before. So that's why we have you start at five so that you're making the most possible because the goal on the ALP average for a new hire is 1200 bucks. And as you have more tenure, that number continues to go up. And, wow. and that's just a goal. It's not like a requirement. You don't have to sell a certain amount of money in order to stay with us. Well, my question okay? was, how do you calculate the commission? How, you did it earlier with it with somebody else in the group. And I oh, So what I did it, for the whole life commission, I took the ALP for this person I added it to the ALP for that person, which gives me the total credit of ALP that I get. For a new hire, your plan is 50%. So I'm going to multiply basically 1263 uh, times 50%, and then you get advanced 75% of that. So you know after every deal exactly how much money you're going to get paid. Was that your question? Yeah, pretty much. So, like, let's just say if I did this, you're at, what, uh, 24, 25, 33, right? No. Okay. Right. And then I take 75% of that. Is that how it's working? So you multiply that times 5, and then you multiply that times 0.75. So, you get $949.86. Okay. Okay. That's how much we'll get. If you wrote that policy today and it went through standard, right? There were no caveats. You didn't put it in as a trial. Everything went fine. You're going to get paid that money. Friday will be deposited into your checking account. Got you. All right, Andrew you. Phillips, what do you got for me? Yes, sir. Um, could you do me a favor and go through just kind of like a, a a step-by-step -step of, of creating a plan for a couple again, because I was just a little unclear about like the, the allocation uh, selection you made and all that. Right. So in HP Pro, <clears throat> well, actually, you're, are you talking about going through from the very beginning with a, with a presentation or just in this a, thing here? Pre -plan? Pre -planner. Yeah, a plan right. design. When you practice this, I want you to use the pre-plan as opposed to a presentation uh, for the purpose of doing this. So I'm going to put the name, uh, Sam, I'm going to say that I'm 55. I'm going to say that I'm a male. And I'm going to put here Jill, if I can type her name correctly. Jill, and she is 52, female. And I'm just going to pick a state. In this case, I'll just pick the very first one that pops up. So Alabama, right? Now it's ready to go. So the so first thing is their hourly income for each of them. No, 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 no. That, that's not what I'm doing here. Because okay. I did that in the needs analysis screen, and you said I didn't need to go through that. You just want me to build the plans, right? My apologies. Perfect. Yeah, let's do it that way. Build the plan. Yeah. Well, if I'm building the plans, I don't care about this right here. Oh, uh, okay. It's already been done. What I care about is do they use tobacco? In this case, neither one of them use tobacco. Do they have children? No, they don't have children. I'm going to make sure that the analysis approach from the veteran market is the dollar a day. If I'm in the credit union market, then I'm going to use the hour power philosophy. So I'll be the so, dollar a day. Yeah. Dollar a day. Uh, the first one I'm going to build out is in the middle. The silver plan is going to be at $5 a day. Right. So now it's at $5 a day. 
I'm going to then change this A71 product to the one in the middle. So that's going to be triple family, right? So the five is always the triple. That's where I want you to start. Yes. Start. Got it. Okay. So Which is leave. the middle tier plan though. Yes. Not the top. So Got it. Triple, quadruple, quintuple. Now, when you're released and you're doing your own thing, you're going to decide what you want to do. But in terms of learning the process and understanding how you want to present, you're going to start with the silver at the triple family, okay? Yep. Okay. The very next thing that I want you to do is I want you to allocate remaining. See, this is where I get mixed up. Let's see. Okay. Right, so I'm going to tell you. So right now, the budget is at $304.17. I'm only using $148.26, correct? Uh, I apologize in advance for being a little stupid on the math here, but how, how are those numbers generated? My apologies. So the 148.26, is that your question or the 304? Yes, either. So yeah, okay. we, the base is $5 a day for each one of those calculated, I think, on a 30 day month. The month. Oh, got it. Okay. So that gets me to three or four seventeen. Okay. The one forty eight twenty six is the sum of that number here for the monthly bank draft, that number, and that number, because I have nothing in here, right? But if I did, that number would then increase with a addition of those. But right now we're not talking about any of those. So if I add fifty four fifty eight seventy eight forty three and fifteen twenty three, I'm going to get to one forty eight twenty six. Beautiful. Then the red number here is the subtraction of 148 That's from 3417. Perfect. What this is telling me is that I have an additional $155 that I could increase in my plan in order to get the budget at 304. Right? Got it. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So now I want to allocate. Now, when I allocate, it only takes it out of the whole life product. So that means I need to do what? I need to increase the whole life product for both of them in order to get that 148.26 spent. So let's look here at 78.43 and 54.58. So 78 and 54. When I allocate both of them, now it goes up to 156 and 132. You add 15.25 to that, and now you're at 304.17. So remember, the whole point of doing this up here is to establish a budget for the client without asking them what their budget is. What that becomes at $5 a day is that's the recommendation from the VSO, right in the middle, between $1 to $10 a day. What most people do, we'll start at 5 That's perfect. And, yeah. right? and then the next thing you do is you start to add the plan options, which would be the gold and the bronze. Fair enough? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. This is why we're here in this extra time so we can get that. Andrew Phillips, what do you got for me? Oh, oh wait, that was, so that was I'm the same. Can, may I ask one other question? I guess since I have two hands and you called me on both of them. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, just the A71 uh, aspect of it. W when you do triple, is that the the 300 um, stand like those align with one another? Like any triple right is 300. Okay. If I move this quad quadruple, the coverage amount changes right there, right? To four. That's easy to follow. Okay, cool. Right. And then remember that the accidental death payouts will also increase should you pick 100 all the way up to 500. I showed you how they increase so that the value goes up, right? Can you do that plan preview real quick and then just reverse engineer when we get that red number of the payout if death? I mean, obviously, that's not if it's natural. So how do we explain this to the client, you know, based off of the, In the script. Yeah. Yeah, if you follow the script, it will explain it. It will okay. tell you what that says. What I was referring to is that most people will remember the big red number. So they're going to think that you're selling them uh, almost $200,000 of coverage for $304 a month. That's the natural tendency people pick. But then I explain to you, that these coverages down here will pay out less than 1% of the time. And the older you get, the lower that percentage is. Okay. Correct. But when something happens is very specific and not just, they'll say like, oh, if I die, I'll get one. My beneficiary is going to receive 191 when that's technically. No, in the script, we tell you, should anything, God forbid anything happens to you and you both pass away in an accident, 
$191,000 is going to go to who? Who's the beneficiary you want to get paid? Actually, benefit. got it. Okay. Right, so it we means. actually disclaim how that number is arrived at. A, a lot of time getting into the weeds on that because psychologically, most people are thinking of the big number. That's how much coverage they have. And for all of you, so you should know, we're going to sell this. And then there's going to be a whole nother group of people that will come by in a year. And they're going to tell them, hey, Sam, you've got, let's say, uh, $191,000 of coverage. Did you know that only $70,000 of that is guaranteed? And we're like, no, I didn't know that. I thought all it would pay out. Well, a lot of it is in a accidental death and dismemberment benefit. So the odds of that paying out are less than 1%. We're going to go out and fix that for you. Oh, how do I fix that? Well, we're going to give you another policy for the differential, and you'll pay a little bit more money. That is the POS market. I just made it a very, very simple. It's uh, much more nuanced than that. But what I'm making sure all of you are aware is that we build our own markets to sell into once somebody's bought something from us. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank you again. All right, Mark Sales, what do you got for me? Yeah, uh, Sam, so you, you had mentioned when you're building the plans that uh, it, it's always going to be for a married couple and the silver plan is going to be at $5 a day and the option would be triple family. What about for the gold? It's $8 a day and what would be the option? The highest level, so quintuple? Okay, Quint, family. Okay, and how about for the bronze? Uh, I would put that at three dollars a day, and I would move the A seven one down to double. Double family. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this you still have room to downsell if you need to do that. Thank you very much, Sam. Of course, absolutely. Uh, Crystal Davis, Crystal, what do you got? Can you show me an example of setting the plan up for the credit union? Setting, oh, for the credit union, sure. So if I come back over here, uh, are we talking about here and going through the needs analysis? No, the other page. All right, so here within the this plan, the difference is you're not going to use dollar a day. You're going to use the hour power philosophy. And then it becomes crucial to understand how much they do make an hour. Because in the hour power philosophy, we talk about, um, you know, the philosophy says you should set aside one to two dollars an hour. I'm sorry, one to two hours of your weekly paycheck should be set aside for insurance. If you look at the script for the credit union, we actually say that and we go through it. So everything remains the same, except the budget now is going to be at $50 a day uh, or $50 for a client, as opposed to the uh, dollar a day where we set it on five or five for each one of them. Does that make sense? So when Chris, I'm building the other plans, what numbers do I use? So I would double it. So in the, are, are you talking about in the script? Um, how do I make, when I'm making the additional plans, um, options like option A, option B, option C. So you're here, right, in the script and what it's telling you is members participate anywhere from one to $10 a day and that's because some are single, some are married, all the rest of it. I'm going to get to show you what you do. You can do it uh, $5 a day. So I'm going to I'm gonna bring that up and show you. you got to give me a couple of minutes to make sure what the exact language is for the credit union script okay. of what you're able to, okay? Because that's a very good question. What's the next question that we have from anybody? So can all of you actually feel comfortable enough to modify and show me how to build the options for the veteran market? So I'm going to call on somebody to share your screen and show me how to do it. So Mildred Oliveras, you are the next contestant. 
what I want you to do is do the homework and show me the very first one. Okay? What do you mean by the very first one? Like this, the first plan option? Well, in the in the homework, what I want you to show me, let me throw it on the screen here real quick. Okay. So there's the uh, homework, right? If I scroll down to the last part of this homework, That's sorry, last state, it will tell you scenario one is Jim and Carol. They have one child. I want you to show me the $5 a day plan. You weren't screen sharing. Oh, uh, you don't have the student handout open? The script? Sorry. Uh, this is the uh, new agent packet. Remember I said there's three things to have open all the time? There's the oh. veterans, the credit union script, and the new agent packet. So on mm -hmm. page 15, that's where it shows you the scenarios. So okay. I'll talk you scenario one. Okay, let me pull up the new agent packet. I had everything else open except for that. Uh -huh. Well, you I didn't can have the... I'm sorry? You can see it on my screen. Either way, so go ahead and there it is. So Jim, that's his birthday, one child, $5 a day plan, and Carol, that's her birthday. So okay. show me on the plan how you do that. Go ahead and share your screen and show us all how you would build that plan, okay? Can I write down those numbers for the birthday really quick? Yeah, the birthday for Jim is 311.87, and the birthday for Carol is 1224.84. Are you sharing your screen with us? Oh, no, I'm not. Yeah, go ahead and share your screen so we can kind of see what we have going on. Okay. The homework is uh, for anybody that passes in your uh, new agent packet, and it's on page 15. And you'd have to take a screenshot so I can see how you built the plan. So you, you don't need to show me the other plans. You just need to show me the one plan that's called out for. Oh, and you the, said veteran, so a dollar a day. Right. $3. It's, five, it's five dollars a day. That's the scenario. Okay. And here, well, you can allocate both. You can click on the where it says both all the way to the left. Oh, okay. You just click there and it does for both and then click allocate. So now you've used up all the money at 304.16. So go ahead and show us the plan. Um, just, for the pre-plan? No, no, don't use pre-plan. That's something if you were going to use it for an actual client. Scroll, put your cursor down to the bottom and display uh, benefit summary. Yeah, click right there. Now, 
Do you see a problem? Oh, uh, yeah. What is the problem that you see? There you go. You didn't have the family, but now you need to reallocate because your budget is off, right? You're at 311.29. So allocate remaining. There you go. So now you know how to yeah, click finish. Now you know exactly how to create a plan. And then you just modify, I guess in your case, the platinum and the bronze. Okay. okay. Sorry, that's just what my upline uses sometimes. So that's what came to no, mind. It's totally fine. Every upline, everybody can use whatever words they want. I have some folks who uh, only show one plan. They've been around a long time. They want to sell that one plan. I have people who do an option close. They'll show two plans. But we teach new hires three plans because we want to say the middle, the higher, and the lower to give you enough ammunition so that you can down close should you have to do that. Okay. Yeah, I will stop. start it a little different. I actually got trained first with the one option, and now they're starting me off with the three options now. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. no worries whatsoever. Uh, let me go back to Crystal really quick. Crystal, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Okay, awesome. Let me share my screen with you really quickly so I can show you this. This is in the script, okay? Uh, in the script, it says for the hour power. So here's what happens with a credit unit. Either they're working or they're retired, okay? If they're retired, then the dollar a day concept works exactly the same, okay? Because we don't want to make it too expensive for them. But if they're working, then we use the hour power concept. And according to this, the principal says the member should take the first one to two hours of their weekly wages and set it aside. So then we know what the weekly wages are because we asked that in the needs analysis screen. So then we would know what we're going to put up here for the hour power, right? If they get paid 25 bucks an hour, both of them, it's going to be $50 an hour. Right, and we're setting aside one to two dollars. So when you build a plan, you can build a plan at a hundred dollars in the middle. Fifty could be the lowest, and one fifty could be higher. It just depends on how you want to display that to the client. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Oh, awesome! I got it right. Yay! <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, who thinks they can? Tarina, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Serena Dozier. Oh, wow. I didn't just <laughs> no. get side. Wait, wait. I didn't get side eye. I got side hair. Like, no, because oh. <laughs> I was oh. trying to figure this out and I I did something funky because I was, I'm doing credit union. So um, okay. I was trying to. Say it again. You want to show me your screen? No, but I will. Hold on one second. Remember, this is exactly why I'm here. I'm here to help you out so that you don't have these moments with clients that end up costing you money. Yeah. Okay, so here we oh, are. Oh, we're right at the beginning. Okay, go ahead. Well, I clicked on something. I don't know. That's okay. Are they retired or are they working? Working. Okay, so they're working. All right, go ahead. So you're going to put a name in there for the primary and for the spouse. Mm -hmm. Anything? Dave, Dave's going to be 58 years old and his gender is male. He makes 25 bucks an hour and Mary is 57 and she makes, I guess, 25 bucks an hour. Okay. Uh, and what's Dave? Um, okay. Hold on. That's just... Come on, Terry. Okay. All right. So now it comes up. All right. So we'll, in the combined hour for the first one, according to the script, how much should you do the silver plan at? Mm. Remember, the recommendation is one to two hours of your pay. Right? That's what the script says. So, five each. Right? I didn't hear what you said. Five, wait, hold on. This is five each here. Yeah, but that's the, that, that, you, okay, hold on. Hour power. So it says 
in the second sentence there, or the second line, our powers of principle that says members should take the first one to two hours of their weekly wages. Right? So if you go back to the script, they make 25 bucks an hour. So mm -hmm. $50 an hour, right? So mm -hmm. how much should your first one be? Your, your silver plan, how much should that be? They're 50? Sure, you can make it 50, but that's kind of the minimal amount, right? That's one hour of their pay. So you remember, you want to go up. You don't you want to leave yourself some room to do the bronze. So you need to go up. So make it multiply that times two, and make it a hundred. You can't change that one because that's based on oh, the that, okay, y'all. I'm so sorry. Hold on. Okay. You can either change it there or make it a custom hourly. So let's just say 50. That gets you to 100. So now in the middle, you're starting at 433. Are you with me? No. Well, on the far left-hand side, it says monthly $433.30. Move your cursor down. Move your cursor down. Not that far. Go to the left. Go to Sorry, the left. Sorry, um, I was interrupted. What am I looking for? 433.30. Oh, this one. So that's the budget amount you're setting aside for the bronze plan. Right now, you're only spending $166.51. So we need to spend an additional $266.79. So now that you've set the budget, what's the first thing that you change? Can we allocate? No. The first thing you change is the A71 product. And it's a family, and you want to put it in the middle, so it should be what? Triple family. Triple family. Now, now we're going to we maybe. Sorry, this is a lot different, but I'm going to get That's okay. So now we're spending $433.30, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to make the gold and we need to make the bronze now. Do you know how to do that? Yeah, options. options. You're going to rename the first plan. Well, whatever it, you can name it silver just to make it consistent with the training the next plan is going to be the higher one so it's going to be the gold and the next plan is going to be the lowest one which is going to be the bronze you're going to put a check mark into the boxes on the left and then the bronze plan as well and now all three of those show up in the system all it did was copy all the information into those other plans so now okay. you're going to make a gold plan how much do you think that should be and triple. Oh, we're not there yet. You got to fix the budget. The budget oh, on silver was four thirty three at a hundred dollars, right? So why don't we triple that and make it, you know, just make it two hundred to make it easy for you, so you're not going crazy. You can change it there to two hundred. Mm -hmm. Two hundred. Okay, well that's not working. Hold on. So put a hundred in each one. And now <laughs> click now click on combined hour because it's not taking the yeah, click right there. So now your budget's 866.60. So you're showing a very, very high goal, which is fine. It's not the end of the <laughs> world. You can move it down or whatever. But now you want to change the A71. Yep, exactly where you're at. So quintuple. And you want to allocate the remaining so that you're spending all the money. And there you go. So now you've built the highest one. And now you need to build the bronze at the lowest one. So the concept for how you build the plans is exactly the same. You're just changing the analysis approach from a budgetary standpoint. That's all you're doing. Okay, so, and then this one you said just one under the silver plan or the first plan. Yeah, so then double and then go to allocate remaining and it will force it all down to the price point. So now you're doing 216. Wow. And so when you go to present this, you're going to present the silver plan and you're going to say, do you want to see if you can qualify for the comprehensive or the gold plan, right? And then that's an option close. And then depending upon what happens, we will then talk about how to down close. But now you know how to build the plan in the credit union space, okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Who's next?
No other questions whatsoever? <clears throat> okay, that's fine. Let me show you some other stuff. Can you guys see my screen? Okay, so here is a plan, right? There's other things available. So if I'm in the credit union, I wanna do income protection. And the way we do that is with a 10 year renewable and convertible term product, okay? So I can click on this and then that 10 year comes up and it's monthly income for one year. If I then show this plan, I'm not worried about the budget or how much you're spending. I'm just showing you by adding this in here, what ends up happening is, you not only have freedom of choice, accidental, you now have monthly income. And that means we're going to pay Jill, if I were to die, $4,333 a month for one year, which adds up to what I had originally put, which is 50, I think, 52. What did I put in here? $52,000, right? If I made that $100,000, and I did everything the same, price goes up, but what ends up happening is instead of paying out the simple 4,000, I'm paying out $8,333 a year. So this, what this is doing is protecting the income in the event of my death, in addition to paying out the freedom of choice, right? This term life product pays out no matter what, as long as the term has not expired. Now, there's some problems with, not problems, but there's some differences with a term life product, right? A freedom of choice or a whole life product pays out no matter how I die, no matter when I die, and the price does not increase at any point in time. A term life product only pays out if I die within the term, and then when the term is complete, if I'm still alive and it gets renewed, my price point will jump up significantly. It'll jump up every 10 years. Okay, that's just how it works. Ultimately, the cost for that term product will be higher than the whole life product. The other thing that happens with a term life product is what? There is no cash value. I'm not building anything into that. So I personally will never see the value of that policy ever. Whereas a whole life policy, I can build cash value, take a loan out against it. I can do a paid up option. I can cancel the policy and get my cash value paid back to me. I have more option, right? With a term life policy, I do not. The other thing on the term life policy and the way that we've set it up in here, in the credit union, we talk about protecting income. In the veteran market, we typically do not. And that's because the veteran market folks are usually older. So they don't need to protect their income generally. You can still do it if you want. You, you don't have to, but in the credit union market, they're usually younger. We want you to try to protect their income. I can do more than that. I can do their credit card debt if I wanted to, right? If I didn't want to do either one of those, I have another 10-year product where I can protect their house payment, final expense from credit card. I can do that too, Right, And I can do that for uh, the first person always has two different, it's the same product, but I'm using it for two different reasons. For the second person, uh, I can only use the one product and it's only gonna be for final expense, credit card or monthly income, okay? So the 10 year RNC is a 10 year renewable and convertible term life product. And I'll talk about products tomorrow. The other thing that's here is an accidental death benefit. So let's say that somebody's like, yeah, I'm worried if I die in an accident. Okay, I can give you up to $200,000 of an accidental death benefit and it only costs you $20.84. Ricardo Aguilar, why is that so cheap? Can't hear you, Ricardo. Nope, can't hear you. Anybody else know why that product is so cheap? Because it's very unlikely that it'll it'll pay out. Exactly, right? Less than one one percent. Yep, less, less than one percent. The older you get, the lower that goes. So we know that if you buy this product, we're pretty much getting $19 of profit every single time, right? Because we know we're never going to have to pay that out. 
So you could offer that to somebody if they wanted to get additional coverage, because when you do that and you offer it into them, that $200,000 goes right there and it shows up in each one because no matter what type of accident it is, that additional $200,000 will get paid out. And that makes that number jump through the roof. Now I got $391,000 of value, right? So you can definitely offer that if you wanted to in order to make the value proposition look higher. In the veteran market, we typically have you focus on funeral final expenses and the A71. We usually don't talk about adding additional death benefit because they're older and the likelihood they're gonna die by an accident is much lower as opposed to somebody in their 30s, right? They could die by an accident, their odds are higher. Still less than 1%, but much higher than an older person. Yes, Javis, what can I do for you? I'm able to, I finally able to log in, um, log in to Planet Al Algae and a HP Paul. Mr. Samuel? Yeah, you're, you're, are you asking me? No, I'm just saying I'm able to do it because I spoke to my upline about it mm -hmm. and, and they helped me do it. Like, I finally got it. That's awesome. Congratulations. And I'm kind of behind too. So, so you're going to put this on YouTube, right? Yes. What time do you think on YouTube this tomorrow this is going to be available? Tomorrow? Yeah. It'll be available when you wake up. When I wake up? Yeah. When you wake up, it'll be available. You'll have the email in your inbox. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely.